I was caught up in a hero summoning, Lane, 08. Dear Mom, Dad, it's been almost half a year since I was summoned to another world. Perhaps, because I have spent quite a few intense days in this world, I feel as if I have been living in this world for years already. And just as I was getting used to this world, I still find some things that seemed strange to me. For example, some things have different names from those in our world, such as our world's apples being called ripples, while others have the same name, such as oranges. If that was all there is to it, I would have attributed it as some kind of influence those who used to play the role of hero had in this world. But other than that, this world also has the sun, the moon, and the stars, a world that should be different from ours, yet somehow familiar. Is there a reason for this? Having such thoughts in mind, I closed the diary I was writing and looked out the window. The moon floating in the starry skies that can be described as unknown, somehow feels rather unfathomable. There is no great reason for it. If I had to describe one, I would say that the god of Kaito San's world and I are old acquaintances, and she gave me a lot of advice when I created this world, so there are some similarities between our worlds. Is what I was thinking, but the god who created this world personally told me the reason. S so that's how it is. Then, does that have something to do with the fact that people can go back and forth between worlds through the hero summoning and abilities like that? I suppose so. Because she and I have mutually gave each other permission, it's possible to travel between our worlds using magic. Of course. There are some conditions attached to it. I see. Rather, she, the god of my world, is also a woman like Shiro San. Ha! Huh? I am a little curious. Shiro San, what is the god of my world like? Dot an incomprehensible, crazy god, I suppose? Doesn't that make her sound dangerous? What's particularly dangerous is that she's on a level that that Shiro San described her as crazy. H. How outrageous of a person could she be? Let's see. She dotes on all life in the world she created calling them her child. She also says that humans have already left her hands, and she apparently doesn't intervene with that world anymore, but she continues to watch over it. Era, it doesn't sound like she's a strange god to me though. However, she loves her children too much. So when we were signing the contract about the hero summoning, we had quite a struggle. In the end, we came to the conclusion that even those who chose to emigrate to this world would have their souls returned to her after their death. Rather than having deep love, I guess she would be a god extremely brimming with motherliness. She probably loves the children of her world so deeply that she appears to be insane, so it may just be a matter of perspectives and all those sort of stuff. If that were the case, it really seems like she's a decent god. If I had the chance, I would like to meet her at least once. Dot I see. I'm slightly looking forward to the time your assessment of her changes. Eh? What's with that? Please don't say something that makes me uneasy. Well then, let's go back to our earlier topic. We're talking about our date, weren't we? Rather than going back to the topic, you've completely diverted it to a different dimension though. A, is this that? Does Shiro San feel like chatting with me for a while? The date's about to change now, so I was thinking of going to bed. I see, I understand. In that case, I'll rewind the world's time for an hour or so. Wait. Alright. I understand. I'll keep you company as long as you want, so please don't do anything that might make Kronos San cry again. The second day of the wind month. It was a sunny afternoon and I'm on top of Bell with a deck brush in hand. Bell is nearly 5 meters in size, so I need to use a deck brush to wash him. Hey, Bell, stay still. Cure. Adding more force on scrubbing Bell's back, she lets out a comfortable squeal. Yes. Yes, you look very cute and soothing, but don't twitch too much or I'll fall off. Kai Ue. Un. Thank you. Then, Lin, please take care of the area around her tail. Kayak. The one who came in with a small brush in her mouth is Lind Worm. Lin, the white dragon who joined the family on the third day of the Earth month. It looks like Lin wants to help me, so I asked her to wash Belle's body around her tail. Dot Fuan. Finally done. Gu Kai Ue. After I finished washing Belle's large body and drying it with a magic tool that produces warm air, Belle's fur became so fluffy and wonderful to touch. It's soft enough that even I can feel that her fur is really fine, and when I lean my body against it, her body is as comfortable as a futon. I lean my body against Belle, who is lying face down on the ground, with Lin on my chest and Belle's tail laid on top of me like a blanket staying like this feels so comfortable that it makes me want to take a nap. 
It's hard to wash Belle's body because of her size, but I feel like the fatigue is a necessary expense to experience this kind of fluffiness. Kaito san, good job. Here, a drink. Thank you, Siag san. No, no, I also brought some for Belle chan and Lin chan. Gu Kaya, while I'm taking a break. Siaksan comes in with a tray in one hand and a container that looks like it's about two meters long in her other hand. It seems like she has prepared a drink for me, so I thanked her and accepted it. The cold drink, which tastes almost like lemon juice, comfortably soaks into my tired body, and seeing Belle and Lynn drinking as well, I smiled. It's kind of relaxing and comfortable today. My confession of my feelings to Isis San, attending that evening party with Lilia San. Things have been quite hectic lately, so I feel relieved and at peace when I do this. Fufu, you look exhausted. I guess I am, huh? I wasn't aware of it, but I may have been a little tense. Even if you don't look at it, fatigue would still build up. After saying a few words of concern with a smile, Siag San looked at me and shifted her gaze. Un, ah, yes, go ahead. Since I had spoken with Siag San through exchanging eye contact and gestures before back when she couldn't speak. I immediately knew what she was thinking about. Can I sit with you? Or so it feels like she wants to ask, so I nodded and shifted my body to give her some space, and Siak San beautifully sat down, leaning against Belle as I did. Leisurely passing through time like this is kind of nice. That's right. Times like this are a luxury. Sitting side by side with Siak San, I stare at the clear blue sky. It certainly is as Siak San said. Times where we can be laid back like this feels like the most luxurious thing I've ever had. Before I knew it, Lin, who had finished her drink, moved back to my lap and curled herself, and I don't know if she's tired as well or she's feeling sleepy, as a little while later, I could hear her quiet breathing. Smiling at the sight, I abruptly asked the nearby Siak San a question. Speaking of which, I just overheard it before. But, Siak San. Are you really taking a few days off from the day after tomorrow? Yes, for about four days. I'm going to be in Rig Foshia to visit my parents. You're going to visit Resan and Fiasan? Yes, I've written to them in a letter that my voice has returned, but I haven't directly reported it to them yet. I see. It seems that the rumor I've heard from the servants was true. Siak San will be taking a few days off from the day after tomorrow to return to Rig Foshia. Siak San's voice certainly returned only after we returned from the Sacred Tree Festival, and I'm sure Esan and Fia San would like to hear their daughter's voice, especially since those two seem to dote on Siak San very much. And since I'm going back home, I thought I'd go visit various places. He, <laughs> that sounds fun. You think so? Yes. I quite like the green scenery of Rig Foshia. It should have only been about two months ago at most since we last visited, but I feel very nostalgic for Rig Foshia. Looking back, that was the first time I ever went to a place outside of the royal capital. Resan and Fia San were fun people, and I hoped to see them again. As I was thinking about this, I saw Siak San glancing at me. So I tilted my head. Thereupon, Siak San's cheeks slightly blushed, and in a reserved manner, she spoke. Daughter, Kaito san. This might be an impolite suggestion, but yes, what is it? I, if it's fine with you, Kaito san, would you like to come together with me? Eh, hey, me too? I was a little surprised by the unexpected words, but her suggestion itself was very appealing. Why, yes, um, father and mother also wanted to meet Kaito again. AA and I also thought it would be more fun than going back home alone. I see, oh, of course. That's only if it's fine with you, Kaito-san. Seeing Siak-san's cheeks blushing as she quietly muttered that, she looked very cute and my heart reflexively skipped a beat. Putting my hand to my chin to cover up the smile that's about to rise on my lips, I think about her suggestion for a bit. It's a tempting suggestion but, wouldn't I just be too intruding if I go with you too? Rather than be intruding, I think father and mother would be pleased. Instead, they mentioned wanting to meet Kaito-san again in their letters. I didn't have any particular plans anyway, and since I've been wanting to go back to Rig Foshia, so I might as well. I asked her if I wouldn't interfere too much with their family time, but it seems like Resan and Fiasan also want to meet me again as well. Dot well then, I'll take you up on your offer, so would it be alright if I go with you? Ugh, yes, since we're going anyway. Let's go invite Aoi Chan and Hina Chan as well. I think the two of them would like to go to Rig Foshia as well. Eh, hey, why yes, 
You're right. I guess you're right. Yes, I agree. I suggested since it would be more fun with more people anyway, but for some reason, Siaxan looked disappointed as her shoulders slumped down. Era, I thought she would like it if we were more boisterous though. Daughter, did I say something wrong? No, absolutely nothing. Let's invite the two of them to go with us. Let's go do that. When I asked her, Siaxan vigorously shook her head. Her face beat red as she stood up. R. Yes. What is this? I don't really know why. But did I say something wrong? After that, along with Siaxan, we tried inviting Aoi Chan and Hina Chan, but the two of them refused me as quickly as they could. However, for some reason, both of them said something incomprehensible while looking at Siaxan when they refused. Dot I'll have to refuse. I don't want to get kicked by a horse. I'm also going to refuse like Aoi Senpai. I don't want to receive a horse's kick. Dot a horse. Why? Dot Siaxan. Please do your best. I'm rooting for you. Kaito Senpai would probably be a tough nut to crack. I know exactly how you feel. Fighting. Dot thank you very much. I'll do my best. Be being kicked by a horse. Were they talking about that saying about how people who interfere with a person's love life are kicked by a horse? However, why are they bringing that up at a time like this? Then, it was as if Siaxan and I were. No, wait right there. Let's not get conceited here. Okay, just because I became the lover of Kuro and Isis-san, two of the most beautiful ladies I've ever seen in my life, it would be a mistake to think that I'm popular. I heard from TV that men who misunderstand things are the most hated of all. Asterisk 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 The fourth day of the wind month. The day has come for Siaxan and I to go out to rig Foshia for four days and three nights. If I could use teleportation magic, it would have only taken us an instant to get to rig Foshia, but unfortunately, I didn't register that place as a target location because I didn't get my teleportation magic tool until after the Sacred Tree Festival. So, since we aren't able to use teleportation, we're going to rig Foshia using the Flying Dragon services. Putting mine aside since I got it from Kuro, teleportation magic tools are absurdly expensive because it requires a difficult technique to make it and the high purity magic crystal needed for it. Even Lilia San, a duchess who used to be a princess, doesn't own one. Even so, it seems that Lilia San offered to ask the royal palace to arrange teleportation magic for us, but Siaxan refused saying that she would return with her own money since she was only in her hometown for personal reasons. It would have been nice if we could bring Belle and Lin along. Putting aside Lin Chan, Belle Chan can't get on the Flying Dragon services as gondolas, and if you only take one of them with you, they'll probably get into a fight, so it can't be helped. Belle and Lin are staying back at Lilia San's mansion, and I've asked some of the servants to take care of them while we're gone. Even though my relationship with them wasn't that good in the beginning, and I didn't have much interaction with the servants, but as a good amount of time passed, I developed a friendship with them, and I've been talking a lot with them recently. They're also willing to accept looking after Bell and Lynn as well, and I'm really grateful for that. And so, as we occasionally chat with each other on the way, Siaxan and I continued on our way to the Flying Dragon Services aviary that we went to before. When we arrived at the large ranch that is attached to the Dragon Flight Services aviary, Siaxan and I were stunned to see the scene in front of us. Daughter, this is. I didn't expect it would be this much. It certainly is a really vast ranch back when I came to visit it before. But the situation here drastically changed. The aviary was several times larger than before, dragons that seemed to be tens of meters long and there, and even the number of people who came to visit are astounding. Speaking of which, I completely put them away on my mind after receiving Lin. But this Flying Dragon Services has made a contract with Magnor El San where he would send his subordinates to work here. Un, how should I say this? They're all huge. Dot that's a high ancient dragon. I've never seen one before. Er, uh, that name kinda sounds awesome. Dot they have strength around the peerage holding demons. Dot I see. Apparently, there are several top tier dragons roaming around here that aren't supposed to be in the human realm. I guess that's why there are so many people here. All of them certainly look very fast and strong. However, this means we'll have to wait for quite a while, won't we? Most probably. Well, being able to ride the highest ranking dragons would certainly make them popular. I mean, I'm beginning to wonder if we could ride today. There was a line of people waiting in front of the aviary as if it were a popular amusement park attraction. 
and it doesn't seem likely that we would be able to ride immediately, but well, it can't be helped under these circumstances, so when I gave up and was about to line up with Siak San, I heard a familiar voice, if it isn't Mama San, welcome, ah, uh, hello, Mary San, as I was about to get in line, I was called out by driver San who I negotiated with and the manager of this flying dragon services, Mary San, she told me her name when I received Lin, and that's what I call her now, it has become quite a big deal, isn't it, yes, it's really all thanks to Mama San and Dragon King Sama, we're receiving reservations to ride with us every day, and in just a few days, we've slightly surpassed our monthly income so far, that's kind of amazing, yes, it makes me scream out in happiness, so, Mama San, how are you doing today, are you by any chance going to ride with us, R, yes, however, doesn't it look difficult today, having a light chat with Mary San, who spoke to me with a lively smile, I told her the purpose of our visit, Mary then nodded once in agreement, and then, she moved her hand, as if to encourage me to move over there, well then, please come this way, I'll prepare for your departure right away, A, H however, we don't have a reservation or anything like that, you don't need to make a reservation, for in our establishment, Mama San is our most important customer, I'll arrange for you to ride our best flight service right away, Mary is going to put me on a high priority flight even though I don't have a reservation, I'm feeling kind of apologetic since it was all thanks to Magnor El San but, I'm sure Siak San would want to see her parents as soon as possible, so I guess I'll take her up on her offer, thinking this, I turned to Siak San, who told me with her eyes that she's going to leave it up to me to decide. Dot well then, do you mind if I ask so? Yes, leave it to me. Well then, this way please. Yes, following Mary San, who was guiding us, Siak San and I left the long line and headed towards the aviary. Thereupon, one of the largest dragons in the vicinity of the aviary, a jet black dragon slowly moved in front of us and bowed its head towards me. It's been a while. Mama Dono. Dot her, if I remember correctly, you were there when I met Magnor El San. Yes, I'm Magnor El Sama subordinate. Fafner is my name. It's an honor to see your countenance once again. Dot her, the huge dragon. Fafner San, who must be over 100 meters long, spoke to me in a very polite tone. I was puzzled by his overly polite response, and as if he sensed it, Fafner San opened his huge mouth. All dragon kinds have received strict orders from Magnor El Sama to treat Mama Dono with utmost courtesy. I is that so? Yes, I've heard that Magnor El Sama owes you a great debt. And we were told that we should listen to Mama Dono's words as if they were equivalent to Magnor El Sama's words. If you need anything, we will be at your disposal. Her, why yes, owes a debt? Did Magnor El San have such debt towards me? Ugh. Could it be about Kuro? MHMMM, how should I say this? I don't know if I should be grateful. But I also can't compose myself. I feel complicated. When I was somewhat troubled on how to respond, the preparations seemed to quickly proceed and Fafner San agreed to take us on a ride to Rig Foshia, sitting next to each other in the spacious carriage with a luxurious interior that must have been several times larger than the one we rode in before. I felt quite uncomfortable since it was just the two of us in here. It seems that Fafner San is far faster than other dragons, and even if he were to adjust his speed so that our carriage doesn't shake or fly off, he said that we will reach Rig Foshia in less than half an hour. H how should I say this, I'm once again reminded of how amazing of a person Kaito San is. N no, I didn't expect this to happen either. It feels unsettling, isn't it? Yes, really. In a situation that could be called as a completely VIP treatment, both me and Siak San aren't used to it and have been strangely nervous. However, it's painful to keep on being nervous for 30 minutes, so I exchanged a few glances with Siak San, trying to have a conversation with her. I don't know if Siak San was thinking the same thing as I was, as even though she looked a little flustered, she took out her magic box. Kaito San, if you'd like, how about we have some tea? Tea thank you. Here, thank you for the tea. Receiving the tea that Siak San offered me and bringing it to my mouth, I drank it all at once. Perhaps, I was more thirsty than I thought I would be. Dot as I thought. The tea that Siak San brews is delicious. Really? It makes me happy to hear that. Do you have any tips to brew such great tea? Dot. Let's see. With a cup of tea and a breather, 
I felt a little more comfortable and naturally began to connect with the conversation. Hearing the question I told her, Siaxan cutely put her finger to her mouth. And after she glanced at me, she winked. Dot I guess you just have to brew it with the person you want to serve it to in mind. Dot A. R. Uh, er, uh, what is this? I don't know if I'm just at a loss for words or not. But for some reason, Siaxan's unexpected gesture made me feel so nervous that I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. Siaxan really is a really beautiful woman, and despite her cool appearance, she is an amazingly kind and cheerful person, and how should I say this? I think she's a very attractive woman. Asterisk 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 Riding behind Fafna San for 30 minutes, the streets of Rigfoshia finally came into view. It's only been a few months since my last visit, but I feel nostalgic. I guess the events that happened in the Sacred Tree Festival were that memorable. A lot of things have really happened when I visited before. I also met Siak San's parents Reginhard San and Sylvia San. The events that happened in Lilia San. Luna Maria San and Siag San's past, and in the midst of a city that was in turmoil due to the Black Bear's attack, I experienced a battle for the first time in my life. But that Black Bear, for her to change in appearance and become my important and cute follower, you can really never know what's going to happen in life. And then, I didn't really see for myself when Isis San beat the invading Black Bears, but looking back on that day, I guess it's that time. The first time I felt happy that Isis San earnestly feels love towards me, and after that, my encounter with the spirits at the Harvest Festival and Lilywood San, the World King. There really are lots of things that happened back at the Sacred Tree Festival. Come to think of it, was it after the Sacred Tree Festival ended? It was when Siak San started occasionally serving me her homemade meal to me. All of Siak San's dishes are home style and have a gentle flavor, just the way I like it and I was secretly looking forward to eating her homemade meal again. Dot un, is something the matter? No, it's just that it should have only been a few months since we visited Rig Foshia. But I'm kind of feeling nostalgic. Indeed, I agree. Since the day we came to the Sacred Tree Festival, Kaito-san and I have changed a lot. Eh? I changed? Dot yes, you have become much more reliable than you used to be. T thank you. Feeling a little embarrassed to hear her unsarcastic praise she said with a gentle smile on her face, I was somewhat flustered, so I shifted my gaze to the view that could be seen from the window. To be honest, I wondered how we were going to get off Fafna San, who had a body with a length of over 100 meters. I felt surprised as only the carriage part descended slowly through Fafna San's magic, and gently landed in front of the entrance of Rig Foshia. Well, I'm really glad that we weren't brought down like this in the middle of the city. I would have been too embarrassed to walk out of my house if I had been in a situation where I had been sent home by something like a luxurious helicopter. As I was thinking about this when I stepped out of the carriage with Siak San and thanked Fafna San for sending us here, Fafna San politely bowed his head in response before he returned. Watching his magnificent flap of wings glide through the air for a bit. We headed to the city of Rigfoshia once again. The wooden walls surrounding the city of Rigfoshia were much larger than when I had seen them before, and they had changed to the point where they could be described as wooden ramparts. And in front of the place that looks like an entrance, there's a gatekeeper dressed in heavy equipment. Exclamation mark if it isn't Marmasama. Hey, it's an honor to meet you. Er, uh, you know who I am? A woman, who held vigilance typical of a gatekeeper quickly got down on one knee and bowed her head when she saw me. Eh? What's going on here? I don't recognize her at all. To begin with, from looking at her ears, she looks like an elf, but who is she? I am one of World King Sama's followers. Ah, uh, I see. Yes, we have received word from World King Sama to be courteous to Mama Sama when you arrive. Dot. Era, what the heck is this? I think I saw this kind of development a few moments ago. World King Sama said that she felt gratitude for Mama San higher than words could ever express. We were told that Mama Sama's words take precedence over everything else. Ah, is that so? Dot Kaito San, isn't it about time you take over the world? Or perhaps, how about creating your country first? I'm not going to build any country, apparently. The members of the Six Kings really are thanking me for Kuro's situation, and they strictly ordered their own subordinates to treat me politely. How should I say this? I'm grateful for that but, 
didn't they think that something like this would make me feel very uncomfortable? Magnor El San, Lilywood San. Even Alice, from even before them, also issued strict orders for their subordinates to obey me. Seriously, what the heck am I supposed to do here? Even as we encountered all this tiring stuff right from the start, we finally managed to enter the city of Rig Foshia. But Siak San and I tilted our heads. Erech, Resan and Fiersan are supposed to be picking us up here, right? How strange. I made sure to tell them with a hummingbird. Yes, in fact, when it was decided that Fafna San would drop us off, we sent a hummingbird to Resan and Fiersan of our estimated arrival time. They replied that they would be waiting for us and were supposed to pick us up after we entered the gate but they weren't here. When I was about to wait with Siak San here for the two of them to arrive, thinking that perhaps they were late because we had arrived earlier than planned. I heard a familiar voice. WW what should we do? We still haven't prepared for an entrance. C they arrived too soon. What do we do? Fear. I guess we should just do the split cross here. That's no good. We've done that before. How about we do a side sway? No. But side sway isn't flashy. For us to surprise Mama Kun. It can't be helped. We have to release the ultimate scream. T that's no good. We still haven't succeeded in flawlessly making that entrance yet. Dot honestly, I'm feeling more speechless than ever before. I don't know what face I should have when I see this couple, who are probably much older than I am, hiding in the shadows of a building and seriously discussing how to make their entrance. Siak San's face flushed with embarrassment, and her shoulders were trembling at the sight of her parents. We won't make great strides if we're afraid of failing. I'm always going to be a challenger. Dot Ray. You're so dreamy, Fia. Will you be by my side? Yes, of course. Let's go together. Dot if you want to go that much, how about I send you to the realm of the dead right now? Dot A, looking at the continuous shameful behavior. Or rather, this farce of a skit that her family is doing made Siak San's patience run out, and she calmly called out to them, her fists tightly clenched beside her. Thereupon, Resan and Fia San slowly turned their heads. And when they saw Siag San's face, their faces turned pale. S. Siag, since when are you here? Dot you could have just shut up and watched. But you had to shame your own daughter in front of Kaito San over and over again. Even after I asked you to take this seriously. See calm down, Siag Chan. It's important to keep a good hold on it. S. S. She's right, Siag. Father and mother want to become adults who remember the purity in our hearts. Our hearts will always be young. Dot would that be your last words? A. Eh? Wait a mojaya a eh? Thereupon, Siak San, who had turned into a shura, attacked them, and their miserable screams rang out in the streets of Rig Foshia. Dot those two have quite a great relationship with each other. Polish them a bit more and they should shine. I'd rather if you don't go polishing them. Ugh. That's right, Kaito-san. If you're looking for a souvenir for Alice-chan, I'd recommend the local specialty fruit sticks here. Talking about souvenirs and all that stuff, can't you just buy it yourself? As I watched Resan and Fiersan get beaten up by Sig-san, Alice, who appeared before I knew it, told me that with her usual tone, to which I astoundedly replied, Well Tilda it's just that I went and blew it a little bit the other day. So I actually only have one R now ha? Huh? Oh no, dot come here for a bit. We need to talk. R, wait. K Kaito san, W wait, that just now was. Jin yo, ouch, ouch, you'll tear off my ears. It seems like there's also some stuff I need to do over here. At any rate, while the parents and child have their quarrel over there, let's just correct this idiot's distorted character while waiting until Siak San's one sided scolding ends. When I finished scolding Alice and made her hide again before a San and the others noticed her, it looked like Siak San had just finished scolding them too. Both Resan and Fia San are in a ragged state after getting her scolding while sitting on a Siaza. Geez, I can't believe you're going to do this just when I come back. Dot we're feeling ashamed. However, I don't think they've reflected at all. Un, I'm sure around that area, they will probably do the same thing next time. As I was thinking about this, Resan and Fiersan stood up and serenely smiled, unlike the ragged state they were in earlier. Dot anyway, welcome back, Siag. I'm relieved to see you look fine. Dot father. I was so excited to hear Siag Chan's voice. I'm really glad that you have regained your voice. Dot mother. As expected. Both of them were sincerely worried about Siak San, 
and they were really happy that Siaxan's voice had returned. As I felt the familial bond between them, it became a little difficult for me to talk to them, and that's when Rasan and Fiasan turned to me. It's been a long time, Mama Khan. It's good to see you again. Long time no see. Regarding Siak Chan. Thank you so much. No, um, I'm really happy for her. Rasan and Fiasan were slightly like my parents. They are usually cheerful and somewhat half a loose screw in their heads. But I can tell that they truly care about their child. Looking at them makes me smile from feeling the warmth of nostalgia. Oops, it would be great if we just end that topic right there. Dot by the way, Mama Khan, how far have you and Sia gotten? Exclamation mark. Jeez, that's no good, Ray. You shouldn't ask the youngsters something like that. Ha ha ha, I see. I guess you just do what you have to do. Dash yuck. A very heavy fist slammed into Resan's face. The atmosphere they had earlier is ruined. This is important, so I'll repeat it again. The atmosphere they had earlier is ruined. Good grief. I see you haven't learned your lesson yet. N no, wait, Siag. As your father, it is my duty to check on my daughter's situation. See calm down, Siag Chan. Red doesn't mean any harm. Then, once again. Resan was chastised by Siak San. After watching it for a while, it seemed to be finally over, and Resan stood up, holding his cheek. Resan's face, which was originally supposed to be quite the icon and just like what the face of an elf would have in anyone's imagination, was in a horrible situation to watch. But it soon returned to normal with recovery magic. Well, my daughter's love is quite heavy. By the way, Mama Khan. Yes. Dot, are you perhaps not interested in women? Dot, huh? Whether, not just a few minutes passed and he started making jokes again. No, this is an important matter, you know. You're in the company of my cute Siagand. You're not lusting after her. I was just wondering that perhaps, that male part of yours has some problem functioning. Dot, no, I, I mean, I already have a lover. What? What the heck does that mean? Wait, Arasan? When I told her that I already have a girlfriend to clear up his very disgraceful misunderstanding, Rasan turned stern and grabbed both of my shoulders, he violently shook me. H he's surprisingly strong too? Or perhaps, it was just me who was weak. For you to be in a relationship and disregard my cute Siag. Who the heck is that person that came out of nowhere? Dot father. Kaito San's lovers are the underworld King Sama and Death King Sama. Dot. Resan, who looked as one would expect from an overly doting parent, was gnashing his teeth, but when he heard what Siag San said, he stopped. And then, without any useless movements, he got down on his knees with his hands on the ground. Dot please accept my apologies. Dot. A really polished and no faltering dojeza. I don't really know who he was bowing for. No, I can somewhat guess who because Resan's shoulders are slightly shaking. Dot pp please don't tell Death King Sama about this. Dot I won't say anything, okay? As I thought, the one Resan was scared of was Isis San, as he looked pale and was shaking so much that he looked pitiful. Resan recovered from Isis San's fears and we finally started walking through the streets of Rig Foshia. I mean, Resan, Fear San, would it really be alright for me to stay for the night? Of course, we've already prepared a room for you. Yes, you don't have to be reserved, feel free to make yourself at home. Thank you, for the time I'm staying here, I'm going to be staying at Resan and Fear San's home. At first, Siak San was going to stay with her parents while I was going to stay at the inn but they recommended that I stay with them instead. Even so, the walls still look the same, but I feel like the whole rig Foshia has somehow become beautiful. It has actually become beautiful. Having the cooperation of World King Sama is quite a big deal. After all, when I murmured that, feeling that the landscape around us had become more beautiful, or rather, the overall scenery has been well arranged compared to before, where San mentioned that it was thanks to Lilywood San. Thereupon, Siak San looked around and slightly tilted her head, she spoke. Still, the change seems to be a bit significant. Not only does it look better, but even the magic power in the air seems to be crystal clear. Is it possible for this place to change so much in just a few months? Siak Chan's question is valid. Even I didn't expect this much change to happen. Yeah, I guess this too is also thanks to Mama Khan. Fear San and Re San answered Siak San's question with a smile that seemed to imply something. Then, they began to explain the question. In the beginning, the recovery wasn't that fast. Of course, thanks to the World King sending her dependents, 
the reconstruction was progressing much faster than usual. I think it was about 15 days ago, World King Sama visited Rigfoshia. She said that she owed a great debt of gratitude to Mama Kun and to apparently thank you even a little bit. She said she would put more effort into the restoration of Rigfoshia. From Resan and Fiasan's explanation, I guess that debt of gratitude Lilywood San mentioned would be about Kuro. I think Lilywood San understands my character very well. In fact, if Lilywood San had come to me with gold and silver treasures and offered them as thanks, I wouldn't have accepted them. I would have said that I just ended up saving Kuro, and that all I wanted was to convey my feelings for her. That's why, in an indirect way to express her gratitude, Lilywood San decided to put her efforts into assisting in the reconstruction of Rig Foshia. I see, Lilywood San did that. Yeah. World King Sama must have been really grateful to Mama Kun. I never expected that she would even send one of her executives to help us. Executives? D does that mean? One of the seven princesses is here? Siag San looked astonished at Resan's words, but I only slightly tilted my head at the unfamiliar name. I guess this seven princesses was the popularized name for the World King's executives? I think Mejdo San's camp had people called five generals or something like that. Thereupon. Perhaps sensing my question, Resan turned to me and explained. Mama Khan may not be familiar with the term, but the seven princesses is the alias for the seven count rank demons that are especially powerful among the world king's subordinates. They are also called the beautiful seven princesses. I see. Being executives of the six kings, I guess they would have nicknames like that huh? That's right. War King Sama's executives were called the five generals. Dragon King Sama's executives were called the four great demon dragons, consisting of high ancient dragons that rule heaven and earth. Phantasmal King Sama's executives were called the ten demons, terrifying demons that lurk in the darkness. Death King Sama doesn't have any subordinates, and Underworld King Sama herself calls them her family. It can't be said that she has subordinates, much less executives. Those were quite the awesome nicknames they have there. As a guy. I think having those heavenly king-like positions was cool. So, father, who among the seven princesses is here? I guess it would be Big Tree Princess Jushia Samak, huh? Ugh, that's what you'd normally think. I actually thought that would be the case too. The elves worship Jushia Sama as the great spirit of the spirit tree, so she already has a close relationship with ourselves after all. Dot which means, another one arrived? Dot it was Lily Sama. L Lily Sama? W World King Sama is going that far. Er, uh, who's this Lily San? It seemed that she was quite an amazing person, as Siak San looked very surprised. However, I didn't know what kind of person this Lily San was, so I asked her, and she answered me with a bit of excitement in her voice. The World King's head a subordinate, Magic Flower Princess Lily Sama. In other words, she's the World King camp's number two. She's World King Sama's trusted retainer. For World King Sama to send Lily Sama, I think she's truly grateful to Kaito-san. I I see, she's someone amazing huh? World King Camps number 2, I guess she's in the same position as the Phantasmal King Camps Pandora-san. I guess she certainly must have a great position. The elves seem to have a close relationship with Lilywood-san, so they probably also admire these executives. In fact, Siak-san had a happy expression on her face, as she looked really happy while talking about them. W would it be alright? If I ask for her autograph, hey, I've already asked her myself. I met her when I was treating the mentally injured guards. T that's not fair, father. I want one too. Those were unusual words for Siak San. It seems like Lily San is really like an idol Siak San admires. However, that being the case, I am a little curious about her too. I hope I can at least see her during the four days I'm here. The conversation has settled down to some extent. And as we walked through the streets of Rigfoshia to Siak San's parents' house once again, strange things began to happen. Ugh, see could you be Mama Sama? A. R. Yes, you're finally back. Ugh, if you'd like, here's some fruits on the house. A. Er, uh, T. Thank you. The owner of a shopkeeper selling fruit talked to me and, for some reason, gave me some fruits. Kawa, uh, it's Mama Sama. A. Really? Ugh, Mama Sama. A. R. Uh, we're Mama Sama's fans. See can I please shake your hands? Fan? For some reason, young elven women asked me to shake their hands. If it isn't Mama Sama, welcome back to Rig Foshia. Uh, I it's been a while. If you have some time, 
please visit us elders as well. Everyone would be delighted. R. Why yes, the elderly elf I had met back at the harvest festival reverently greeted me, and everyone I met looked at me very favorably, dot um, what in the world is, ugh, Mamakun is just very popular in Rig Foshia, dot why, why, that's obviously because you had set an unprecedented record at the harvest festival and asked world king Sama for the restoration of Rig Foshia, thanks to that, the wall surrounding the city has become stronger, the spirits have become more friendly to us, and moreover, and even Lily Sama was dispatched here. You're almost like a hero for the populace. Dot. I felt dumbfounded from what Ray San told me. N no, no, I mean, it was Lilywood San who fixed the city, and my record at the Harvest Festival was all thanks to her. I didn't even know about the arrival of this Lily San here until now. The way Ray San is saying it sounds like I'm the one who made it all happen. Ugh, by the way, among most of the residents, what they know is that Mama Kun was the one who got rid of the black bears. How come? Moreover, there are also books and plays based on Mama Kun's exploits. Books? Plays? Apparently, it had turned more terrifying than I thought it would be. I mean, I had passed out when the black bears were attacking though. However, what Resan and Fiasan were saying are true. The people I met on the streets are all very friendly as if they've met their idol. It feels kind of unsettling to be enshrined as a hero without my own knowledge. Hearing about it is starting to give me headaches, but with it spreading so widely, I don't think there's anything I could do about it. Should I ask Alice to clear up their misunderstanding? No, it might turn for the worse instead since they'll find out that I'm interacting with not only the World King, but the Phantasmal King as well. Dot come to think of it. It seems that the Death King Sama came to buy a book about Mama Kun, and she seems to be praising it well. So they've decided to publish a sequel. Dot. Isis San. What the heck are you doing? Rather, doesn't that mean it was Isis San who demanded for the continuation of those books? Geez, seriously. How the heck did this happen? Asterisk 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 asterisk. After I felt unsettled from being treated as some kind of hero, we finally reached Rhea-san and Fia-san's house. How should I say this? I think I now understand a little bit about how Nun-san, who was the former hero and was regarded as a great person, feels. This feels embarrassing. It took us a lot more time to go home than I expected. I guess it's time to get ready for dinner. I guess. I'll do it. Rhea, you go show Mama Kunt to his room. Yeah, I'm on it. We should have arrived in the early afternoon. But it turned out to be a long day for some reason, and it's already almost evening. Fia San goes straight to the dining room, while Rhea San brings me and Siak San upstairs. Dot um, father, un, what is it? Dot did we have that many rooms in our home? Where will Kaito San be going to stay? Just as Siak San said, Rhea San and Fia San's home isn't that big. It's big enough for the three of them to live together, but it doesn't have many rooms. And it doesn't seem like they have anything like a guest room. Dot yes, that's okay, I'll have Mama Kun stay here. Dot um, father, what is it? Dot this is my old room though. And the room that Rhea San led me to is. To my surprise, it seems to be Siak San's room. Siak San currently lives in the Symphonia Kingdom, but Rhea San is currently living in Rig Foshia before he became a court mage, so it's not strange if he had a vacant room like this. But, a, I will be staying here. What about Siak San? Um, Rasan. If I'm staying here, what about Siak San? A, what are you talking about? Siak would obviously be in this room too. Well, wow. when I timidly asked him, Rasan replied to my words, as if it was obvious that Siak San would be staying in this room too. W, what are you talking about? Father. No, you see, we don't have a lot of rooms. Ah, don't worry. I properly changed the bed to a double size. Wow tt that's not the point, ff for me to stay in the same room as kkk kaito san. Do your best, Siag. Father is rooting for you. How come the conversation turned towards that? When he told us that Siag san and I would be staying in the same room, Siag san's face turned red as she flusteredly drew near to him, but unfortunately, Resan wasn't listening at all. Um, Resan, as expected. I'll just go stay in the inn. Dot Fia and I were looking forward to having Mama Kun staying with us. Please don't say such a sad thing. A. R. Yes. Sorry. Kaito san. Could you not get swept along with them? A. Ugh. Uh. Siag too. You won't say something horrible like kicking Mama Kun out of the house, 
right? TT that is, N no, but, I don't know if it's as to be expected from Resan or not, but it seems like he really knows which areas I'm weak at. It's impossible to say no when he looked so sad, as for Siaxan, I kind of feel like she would end up getting caught up by Resan's tune. To begin with, you're just going to stay in the same room, right? It's not like I'm asking you to do anything, or perhaps, would there be some kind of mistake that would be made if you stay in the same room? TT that won't happen. Then, there shouldn't be any problem. Eh, uh, ah, no, that doesn't mean. It's already completely going at Resan's pace. It's starting to become difficult to refuse him now. Well, as long as I sleep on the floor, it should be alright. Let's just give up on saying no and try to find a way to bother Siaxan as little as possible. Ah, uh, that's right, Mamakun. Yes, rest assured. The room is soundproof to the max. You should know what to do next, right? Also, Siaxan's underwear are in the drawer on the right, third shelf. The state preservation magic is designed to be unlocked when you open the drawer. You can take at least one of them home with you, Gafuyu Tilda. Her iron fist is again, shot into Resan's face just as he made a thumbs up. Why does this further even know where his daughter's underwear are stored? No. Let's not suck on me here. As I watched Resan being beaten up by Siaxan again, I suddenly remembered. Erach, it kind of feels like Siaxan's attention was drawn away from the topic of whether I'm going to stay here or not. After a while, Siaxan's scolding towards Resan ended, and just as I was descending the stairs with the two of them, the view around me suddenly changed. Dot, huh? Eh? I was supposed to be descending the stairs, but before I knew it, I found myself under the warm light within a forest, sitting on a wooden chair. I was confused by the sudden situation when I suddenly heard a beautiful voice from right beside me, resounding like a bell. Good evening, Mama Kaito-san. I apologize for the sudden greeting. Dot a ah, you are? As if guided by the voice, I turned around and before I knew it, there was a woman sitting next to me with a beauty that took my breath away. She had long golden hair that shimmered in the sunlight, eyes that remained closed a large red flower on either side of her head, and her clothing was designed to look somewhat like Lilywood San. She was about 160 centimeters tall, has well-balanced proportions and a beautiful face that gives a gentle impression. It makes me feel as if she's some princess from somewhere. Nice to meet you. My name is Lily. I have the honor of being the World King's head subordinate, and I'm known as the Magic Flower Princess. Eh? Uh, ah, so you are. Ah, uh, it's nice to meet you. I'm Mama Kaito. Thank you for your courteousness. You may call me whatever you like. I understand that it's polite to visit you in person, so my apologies for greeting you in this way. I was told of your presence by my subordinates who were guarding the gate, but I'm currently a bit busy, so I took this opportunity to at least exchange a few words with you. Saying that, Lily San bowed her head with her eyes still closed, but more importantly, a new question had arisen in my mind. Lily San said it was polite to visit me in person, but since she was busy, she wasn't able to do so. However, I feel like she's contradicting herself since I'm sitting right next to Lily San right now. Furthermore, I still don't know why I'm suddenly sitting on a chair in this forest when I was supposed to be at Siak San's home. I see, that's indeed a fair question. My apologies, I should have explained that one to you first. Dot a. First of all. Our current situation is that we are now conversing through our magic power. The conversation is based on the mutual perception of the other's magic power. Let's see, you can think of it as having a conversation in a dream. Although my appearance here should be the same as my real body, the scenery you see now is probably a reflection of your image of me that you have conjured up by perceiving my magic power. Lily San is explaining my question to me. But I haven't said anything. Have I? Perhaps. Could Lily San read minds like Shiro San? To be precise, I'm just reading your surface thoughts from your magic power. The principle behind it is the same as the way you usually sense other people's emotions. I was just reading deeper than you. Eh? Does that mean Lily San can also use sympathy magic? Number. It's true that our abilities are similar in many ways, but there are some differences. I just have a better ability to sense magic power than anyone else. I don't have the ability to adapt to magic power like you do. No, at least to my knowledge, there has never been anyone capable of such an ability other than you. This sympathy magic is your talent. Perhaps, it may be an ability unique only to you. Saying this, 
Lily San smiled gently. How should I say this? I could understand that Lily San is a very kind person just by talking to her for a little while. The only thing I'm wondering about now is that Lily San's eyes have been closed since a few minutes ago. Is there a reason for this? There isn't that big of a reason behind it. Putting it simply, I was born blind, so I keep them closed. I could open them, but it wouldn't be pleasant to look at. Ugh, I I'm sorry. No. Don't worry about it. I am the spirit of a flower called the magic flower, which is found only in the demon realm, deep in caves where light does not reach. So, perhaps my blindness is caused by my origins being that of a magic flower. Besides, even though I am blind, I possess perception magic that is superior to others. I can sense even the faintest magic power in the air, so to be honest, it's almost the same as being able to see. I see, perhaps because she was originally born from a flower that blooms in a place where light can't reach. Having the same characteristic as this flower, her eyes also don't reflect light. Lily San doesn't seem to be bothered by the fact that she's blind though, and if her perception magic was enough for her to read the surface thoughts of others, I suppose it really would be no different than being able to see. As I was thinking about this, Lily San smiled and muttered. Dot I've originally been wanting to meet you. Me? Yes. Since you visited Rig Foshia this time, we were able to meet earlier than I had expected. But even if we hadn't met here, I was planning to go visit Symphonia's royal capital after I finished helping with the reconstruction. Those were words I hadn't expected. The only connection I can think of between Lily San and I was our connection with Lily Void San and our magic that was somewhat similar. Would that really be a reason for her to come all the way from the demon realm to see me? It's probable that she was curious about me, who has similar abilities to her, and decided to meet me on her way to human realm. Certainly. My curiosity in you was one of the reasons. However, there's another reason why I volunteered to help with the reconstruction effort that Jushia was originally supposed to be going to. What does that? No, it's not that big of a deal. I just wanted to ask you a question. Pausing for a moment after saying those words, Lily San turned to me and quietly spoke. Dot isn't it difficult? Dot a, you have the ability to comprehend the emotions of others. However, that isn't always a good thing. Being able to feel even the malice of others, isn't it difficult? Dot. This is probably based on Lily San's experience. In fact, I would be lying if I said I didn't have an idea of what she was talking about. Bluntly speaking, when I first came to this world, I felt incredibly uncomfortable around Lily San's mansion. Somehow, being in that place makes me feel that I was an irregular existence. Thinking about it again. I believe it was probably because of my sympathy magic and was unconsciously feeling the emotions of the people around me. I remember that there were some people I found easy to talk to and others I do not. I certainly have had those experiences. There were times I found it difficult. In the beginning, there were only a few people in Lilia San's mansion who were friendly to me. Lilia San, Luna Maria San, Siak San, and then, Ilna San. Just the four of them. However, that's really only at the beginning. As I spent time in the mansion and exchanged words with many people, the inside of the mansion gradually became a place I'm comfortable with. However, I was blessed by my surroundings. There were at least a number of people who certainly welcomed me wholeheartedly. So, it isn't difficult now. In fact, I feel very happy. Dot I see. After hearing my response, Lily San smiled somewhat happily before speaking again. Dot if you were feeling uncomfortable because of your ability, I was going to suggest that you move to Yggfrisis, the city ruled by Lilywood Sama. I thought that with us having similar abilities, I would understand your distress and be there to help you but, Fufu, I suppose my help wouldn't be needed huh? No, thank you for your concern. It's only a guess, but I guess Lily San has had bad experiences in the past due to her abilities. Perhaps, that's why she was worried about me, who have a similar ability as her and based on my situation was trying to help me. Dot now then, I don't think we can just talk here too long. Let's leave the greetings at that. I will come by tomorrow to say my greetings again. Yes. Ugh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude, but at that time, uh, may I ask for your autograph? Autograph? You're asking for mine. Ugh, I see. You are going to give it to your friend. Understood. Well then, I will have it prepared at that time. Thank you. Remembering that Siak-san had wanted Lily-san's autograph. I asked her just in case.
but Lily Zan readily agreed and promised to give it to us when she comes to visit tomorrow. After thanking her several times, our conversation ended and the scenery around me returned to Siak San's house. Thereupon, I saw Siak San and Re San looking at me curiously. Kaito San, is something the matter? You suddenly stopped walking. Eh? Er, uh, how long have I been in a daze right now? Hearing Siak San's words of concern, a question popped in my head. I had been talking a lot with Lily San just a while ago, but that would mean that I was standing still this whole time. Thereupon, Siak San curiously tilted her head, while Re San, seemingly wondering why I asked that, responded. You just stood there for about five seconds. Is something the matter? Five seconds? N no, actually. As I was feeling puzzled by the fact that I had been talking to Lily San for so long but had apparently only stood still five seconds. I explained to them what had just happened. Even though they were surprised, both of them listened to my story until the end. After they finished listening to me, Rezan muttered something, looking like he was thinking about something. Dot with Lily Sama's capabilities, she would be able to easily use space-time magic, so there's no question about the time discrepancy. But going all the way to greet Mama Kun, I guess that's how much of an important person Mama Kun is to World King Samaha. T that aside, father. Lily Sama's coming to visit, does that mean she's going to come here? The fact that Lily San is coming to visit really seems to be a big deal, as the two of them started talking about her visit. They began talking about cleaning and welcoming her, but Fear San's call brought them back to their senses, and we headed downstairs to have a meal. When I arrived at the dining room, I saw Fear San laying out lots of food, and looking somewhat happy, Resan spoke. Oi ah, it seems like we're having a feast today. Yes. Siak Chan's voice came back and Mama Kun came to visit. I have to show him my skills. Dot they look delicious. Mother is the one who taught me how to cook, so she's pretty good at it. The food lined up on the dining table, had a homely atmosphere, looked very tasty, and I could tell that Fia San was a good cook just by looking at it. Then, Fia San and Siak San took their seats, while Fia San smiled towards me, pointing to an empty chair. Come now, Mama Kun, sit down. Dot. The moment I heard those words, a nostalgic scene flashed in my mind. Come on, Kaito, sit down, mom worked really hard today. Dd doesn't this look a little extravagant? I mean, it's Kaito's birthday. I even baked a cake, that was a really nostalgic memory. A memory of my childhood, filled with happiness and love that I had taken for granted. Mom, isn't this cake crushed flat? You got tea that was because it couldn't carry my love. It would be great if those words can cover that. You said something, dear. Sorry. Thinking about it now, that cake was quite a terribly made one. It was messed up with cream here and there. The sponge was a bit burnt. But, it tasted great. Dot Mama Kun. Ah, I'm sorry. Excuse me. In a way, this is the first time I've seen the scene of a family sitting together in harmony since I came to this world, and it seemed to remind me of the past making me freeze. After Re San called out to me, I sat down and a little flustered, I clasped my hands together. Thank you for the food. Whoa, Fia, you really stepped up your game today, huh? Delicious. As expected, I still can't compete with mother. Thanks, I'm Siak Chan's mother after all. You won't surpass my cooking skills that easily. As I listened to their joy-filled voices, I brought the food into my mouth. I see. Fia San's cooking certainly is very good. Its taste is homely yet simple, but it's so warm and inviting. How should I say this? It's like the taste of a mother's home cooking. The flavor isn't so thick, but it's so delicious that it slowly seeps into my body. It was just the way I liked it. Mama Kun, what do you think? Yes, it tastes really great. That's good, dash Mama Kun. Dot a, a era. I responded to Fia San's question with a gentle smile on my face, but for some reason, Fia San looked at me with a startled expression on her face. I also noticed from her reaction, that before I knew it, tears were running down my cheeks. I am sorry, did it not taste good? Kaito San, are you okay? Could it be that you aren't feeling well? Ah, no, that's not it. This is, uh, somehow, my ear glands seemed to have loosened up when I remembered mom and dad. Hurriedly wiping my tears with my hand, I shook my head at Fia San and Siag San who are concernedly asking me, while Re San looked at me with equally concerned eyes. It's just that I was slightly reminded of my parents. No, 
It's not surprising. It can't be helped if you remember your parents back in your world. Don't know, my parents. They passed away back when I was a young child. Don't I see, I'm sorry. No, it was a really long time ago, and I've already sorted out my feelings. Dot I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel lonely without my parents. I still remember mom and dad well. However, I've already got my answers about my parents' deaths in my own way. My parents probably wouldn't feel relieved if I just stood still and grieved. Thanks to Kuro, I'm able to think that way. Dot it's just that, er, uh, how should I say this? I slightly remembered when we were all together for dinner as a family. Kaito-san's parents must have been very kind people. Yes, uh. They were slightly like Resan and Fiersan, my parents were cheerful people. Un, Resan and Fiersan really are a lot like mom and dad. Dad was usually very cheerful, and he would sometimes say a few unnecessary words that made mom mad at him, but he was a great father who was very kind and dependable. Mom was always cheerful and smiling, and even though she was very clumsy and not very good at housework, she was always positive and cheerful. Dot mama kun, another helping? A. R. Yes, that would be great. Un, then, I'll get you some more. Thank you. As if to brush away the mood that had become a bit gloomy, Fear San cheerfully said that and gave me another helping. Mama Kun, just like Fear said on the way here, you can always think of our place as your home. R, yes. Thank you. Of course, you can consider me as family. If you and Saya get married, you will actually be one anyway. So, you can just directly call me father in law. Jeez, you're really incorrigible. Ah ha ha ha. Their gentle concern naturally brought a smile to my face. I guess you could say that it was unfortunate that I lost my parents early. However, I feel really fortunate for the bonds I have today. I have people who care about me. I have people who comfort me when I'm down. I think that is truly, miraculously, a blessing. Dear mom, dad I would be lying if I said I completely got over your deaths. However, you don't have to worry about me. I'm fine here, and I'm feeling happy from the bottom of my heart. I may need a long time before I can become a full-fledged adult, but even today I'm still smiling. After dinner, we continued chatting for a while, and after taking a bath, I was thinking that the only thing left to do was to go to bed. When Siak-san suddenly called out to me, Dot Kaito-san, do you mind if we go take a stroll around? A stroll? Yes, I felt like getting some night breeze. So if it's fine with you, would you mind accompanying me? Alright, let's go. I had no reason to refuse, so I accepted her invitation and walked out of the house with Siak-san. The city of Rigfoshia at night is very quiet, the stars shining in the sky are beautiful, and the comfortable night breeze somehow makes me feel peaceful. Siak-san and I began to walk together, not having any particular destination in mind. We rarely exchanged words, and although our stroll was silent, by no means does it feel uncomfortable at all. Strangely enough, I felt peace of mind. Then, we continued on for a while, but when we arrived in the plaza, I was suddenly gently hugged from behind. Dot A. Dot e -R -S -S -A, -X -A, a soft, warm embrace, and the good scent faintly wafting after a bath. I felt my heart loudly beating as I flustredly called Siaxan's name, and after a moment of silence, still hugging me from behind. Siak-san spoke. Kaito-san is a very strong person, always straightforwardly doing your best. I really respect you. N no, it's not like I'm that great of a person. Even if you think so, you are a man I can truly respect. I always get courage and energy from the hard-working Kaito-san. So, I sometimes want to return what I felt to you too. Doctor, I appreciate that but, W what's with our situation? Dot strong and admirable. And yet, by no means are you an invincible person. I want to hug such a Kaito-san right now but is that no good? And no? Dot that's great. Well then, let's just stay like this for a bit longer. What is this? This feeling. I was supposed to be very nervous, but I felt truly reassured instead. Siak-san is a mature woman who is always kind, calm and dependable. Just like a dependable older sister. I was an only child, but if I had an older sister, would she be like this? Do I think of Siak-san as an older sister? Dot no, but what about the pounding I'm feeling in my chest right now? I don't think I'm going to have any answers right away. But it isn't making me feel uncomfortable. I don't know why, but the tears which should have already stopped, started flowing again. After my stroll with Siak-san, 
We came back to Ray San and Fear San's home. I was feeling a bit gloomy, but that was resolved after my stroll with Siak San, and I thought all I had to do now was get a good night's sleep and get ready for tomorrow. But at that moment, a troubling situation arose. Kaito san, how many times do I have to tell you to make you understand? That's my line. Dot, you're really stubborn, aren't you? Dot, I return those words back to you. Dot, Siak san and I were currently having what you would call an argument for the first time since we met. However, it isn't that we're speaking ill of each other or that we're displeased. It's simply because we held opinions that clashed with each other. Dot, like I said. I'll go sleep on the floor, Siak san, you go sleep on the bed. That's no good. Kaito san is our guest. I'll be sleeping on the floor. If you're saying it like that, there's no way I would let a woman sleep on the floor either. I won't budge on this one. Yes, Siak san and I are arguing about the one and only bed. Even though two people could sleep on it if they wanted to because of its size, Siak san wouldn't want to sleep with a man like me on the same futon. So I told her that I was originally planning to sleep on the floor. But Siak San just wouldn't stop insisting that she couldn't let me, as her guest, sleep on the floor. And now, we are arguing about giving each other the bed. I'm stronger than you. I used to sleep outdoors a lot, so I'm fine on the floor. In the world where I was in, it was common to sleep on the floor with a futon laid out on the floor. It's fine if I just sleep on the floor. Dot. Dot. Lilia San once described me and Siak San as being similar to each other, and I think that might actually be true. Anyway, I have my pride as a man too. I can't let a woman sleep on the floor. You don't have to treat me like a woman. I'm not sexy or feminine at all. That's not true. Siak San is a very charming, lovely woman. Hwe t t t thank you. Eh? Ah, no. I just reflexively said something outrageous, hearing the words I shouted at her. Siak San's face turns red as she looks down. I can't continue to speak anymore either. Unable to speak to each other, seeing Siak San looking down and fidgeting made me feel embarrassed and I looked away. However, the conversation wouldn't go on if we just stayed silent like this. So after a moment of silence, I slowly opened my mouth. Dot be but, you see, if the both of us won't budge at all, we'll have no choice but to sleep in the same bed though. Dot I it's not. L like I. Mind it that much anyway. Dot hey, if we both won't allow the other person to sleep on the floor, we'll have to sleep together in the same bed. When I told her that, to my surprise, Siak San said she was fine with it. I know she's just looking out for me but. Dot hey, are you really sure you're okay with that? Dot yes. I I guess Kaito San really wouldn't want to be in the same bed as a tall girl like me, right? And no, I don't think of such things at all. Also, Siak San is a really lovely woman. Your height is also part of your charm, Tilda. Siak San is about the same height. Or maybe a bit taller than me, and she seems to be pretty conscious about that. She has already asked it multiple times before, to which I told her I wasn't intimidated by her features. It's true that Siak San is tall, and with her extremely beautiful face, at first glance, she gave cool impression. But after talking with her, I realized she's very gentle and her height, coupled with her slender figure and beautiful proportions, is just one of the things that makes her so attractive. P please don't flatter too much. I it's making me feel embarrassed. Ah, I am sorry. Back then, Siak San couldn't speak, so even now, I know what she wants to say even if she doesn't say much, and in fact, the opposite was also true. And she seems to know what I'm thinking to a certain extent too. She could tell that I found Siak San attractive, and as she tried hiding her long ears that had turned red, she looked very cute. And thinking about what's about to come, I felt my nervousness tremendously rise. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Dot it's quiet. Too quiet. The ticking of the clock is extremely loud. And I'm currently keeping my eyelids shut, surrounded by a crystal clear silence in the darkness of the night. My body was considerably tired. I took a long trip on the Flying Dragon services, a lot of things have happened since we got here, and I took a night stroll. But even with all the things I've done and how tired my body is, I don't feel like I can sleep at all. I'm lying on my side on the edge of the bed, and behind me is Siak San who lying down and should be facing the opposite direction. Kaito san, are you still awake? As I'm savoring the feeling of time slipping away without feeling like I can sleep at all, 
I heard a small voice call out from behind me. Dot yes. Dot don't you think we're wasting a little too much space? Dot I was also thinking the same thing. Currently, Siaxan and I are lying back to back, as far away from each other as possible. However, although it's bigger than a normal bed, it's not as big as a king size bed. When we are laying down while trying to keep some distance away from each other, we can't help but be at the edge of the bed. This may be partly due to our personalities, but at any rate, the space in the middle of us is quite empty. Dot should we get a bit closer? Dot yes. I had been thinking about it, but I couldn't just carelessly say it as it might be impolite, but thanks to Siaxan opening up that topic herself, despite my nervousness, I was able to agree to it. Wriggling my body to avoid looking back at her, I slightly moved towards the center of the bed. I can hear the sound of clothing rubbing with clothes from her side. It seems like Siaxan is moving in the same way as mine. Exclamation mark. However, there is no way we can make fine adjustments by moving with just our senses without looking back, and after I feel Siaxan's back touching mine, both of us simultaneously flinch. I felt my senses being awfully keen because I'm nervous, and my back feels hot even though we only slightly touched each other. I could hear my own heart thumping loudly, and I was about to speak to distract myself from the nervousness that it was boiling my body. Before I could speak though. Siaxan spoke. Kaito san, can I ask you something weird? Dot something weird? Why, yes, I don't mind. Hearing Siaxan ask me in a slightly raised voice, I nodded my head and replied that I don't mind. Thereupon, Siaxan stayed silent for a moment before she slowly spoke. Dot today, you were talking about it with father. Um, about my underwear. Eh, ah, no, that it was just Dressan's joke. Okay, foo foo, I know. No that it was probably just the usual outbursts. Un hearing Siaxan suddenly saying something outrageous, I was so flustered that I had explained myself, even though I had done nothing wrong. After chuckling at my excessive reaction, Siaxan spoke more outrageous words. I don't really understand though. For example, would Kaito-san want to see me while I'm just wearing my underwear? Wow, SS Siaxan, WW what the heck are you saying? No, I was just simply wondering. What would you feel when you see a woman whose chest is small and doesn't have any glamour? And you see, I've heard that men like women with big breasts. Dot. Eh? What's with these questions? Um, do I have to respond to this? I'm feeling so embarrassed just hearing about this. H. It's just my guess, but I think based on what she usually says and does, I think Siaxan doesn't have a lot of confidence in herself as a woman. So, being a man. She wanted to hear my opinion. If that's the case, then I should properly answer her. Dot don't every person have their own preferences? Of course, there are a certain number of people who like women with large breasts but I personally think they are attractive enough even without them being large. Dot for instance, what do you think about me? If Kaito-san saw me only wearing that, W would you, um, be aroused? Dot I definitely would be. I've said this many times. Siaxan is an incredibly attractive woman and, to be honest, I'm still very nervous even now. My face was burning hot, but I honestly told her my thoughts. Dot is that the truth? Thereupon, Siaxan tried confirming it again, sounding a bit anxious. Yes, I think Siaxan should have more confidence in herself. Dot being told that I have a low estimation of myself, I don't want to be told that by Kaito-san. Yuk, that's a very strong counter to the point that I even let out a groan. I certainly don't have that much confidence in myself either. How should I say this? I guess you could say I'm a cowardly person at heart, and that every time people think highly of me, I'm afraid that such compliments aren't fitting for someone like me. This is the only thing that I feel isn't going to change anytime soon. Foo foo foo. But thank you. I got a bit more confident in myself. I is that so? That's good to hear, Dr. K. But. Please don't steal my underwear. I won't steal it. I strongly refuted the words that she teasingly said. I mean, even though I know she's just joking, I didn't expect that she would really warn me of that. What kind of person do I look like in Siaxan's mind? Dot I think you're a man more fantastic than any others. A R R T thank you. The words were spoken as if she could see through the thoughts in my mind, and I felt the heat that was supposed to have cooled down suddenly returned back to my face. Un, as expected, 
I don't think I'll be able to sleep today. Asterisk casterus 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 casterisk. Walking through the beautiful forest, I squinted my eyes as light shone through the trees. I feel quite heavy since I couldn't sleep at all last night, but looking at the beautiful scenery around me, I naturally felt energized. Siaxan is walking a little distance in front of me, and she would occasionally move her gaze at me with a smile. Kaito san, are you alright? Yes, the air feels great. I'm currently walking through the forest with Siaxan, which is simply put, a walk in the woods. It's the second day since I arrived in Rig Foshia, and Siaxan suggested that she would show me the forest around Rig Foshia that I couldn't see during the Sacred Tree Festival. Other than the city itself and the Spirits Forest, I certainly hadn't seen much of Rig Foshia, and since I wanted to see more of the vast forests, I gratefully accepted her invitation. The place Siaxan brought me to is the forest where the hunting competition of the previous Sacred Tree Festival was held and it seems to be a place where many animals live. Since it's also a place where the elves hunt, the road from the city of Rigfoshia is well maintained, and it's somehow pretty easy to walk around. All of the trees are thriving and the air feels very refreshing, as well as the beautiful scenery, and just as she explained to me beforehand, I can see small animals here and there. Having lots of animals obviously means that there are lots of monsters in the area. I wouldn't have been able to come by myself to this place. But since Siaxan is with me, and I can also say that if the need arises, Alice, who would likely be around here somewhere, will be here to help me. As Siaxan and I made our way through the vibrant forest, I felt like we were currently hiking. From time to time, Siaxan will stop and give me a brief explanation about the plants and animals. I guess I should have expected it since we're in a different world as there are many plants and animals that I have never seen in my previous world. Siaxan's careful explanation though, was very easy to understand and fun to listen to. Dot we don't see that many monsters, isn't it? Ah, no, as far as I'm concerned, I'm grateful for that but. The black bears were wiped out by the Death King before. Also, due to the influence of World King Sama's barrier magic, it seems that there are even fewer monsters approaching the city than before. I don't know if I should say it's to be expected from Isis San or it's to be expected from Lilywood San. But it seems like it has become much safer around Rig Foshia. I wondered if that would reduce the amount of prey they could get from hunting, but the elves didn't seem to like meat very much to begin with, so they seem to be rather grateful to have more places to safely grow fruits. Well, either way, thanks to that. I'm grateful to that since I am now able to enjoy a leisurely stroll around here. As I was enjoying a leisurely stroll with Siaxan, time had passed before I knew it, and the sun seemed to be quite high in the sky. Dot I guess it's about time for lunch huh? Yes, since we're going to the forest, I prepared a bento for us. I hope you like it. When I called out to see what we'll have for lunch, Siaxan pulled out a bento containing our lunch with a smile on her face. Honestly. I was looking forward to it. Thank you. The food Siaxan makes is delicious, so I'm looking forward to it. Foo fa foo, you won't get anything even if you flatter me. Searching for an open area in the vicinity, I then laid out a large cloth as a sheet and sat down with Siaxan. After that, Siaxan places what appears to be a small magic tool on all sides of the cloth that I had laid down. Siaxan, what's that? Ugh. It's a magic tool that deploys a weak barrier around us. It would be troubling if a monster interrupts us while we're eating. I see, so it's a monster barrier huh? We certainly are pretty vulnerable while eating, so it's a relief to have something like that. When she finished putting all of them down, Siaxan once again placed the bento in front of me. I'm still not as good as mother but that's not the case. Siaxan's food is really good and I like it a lot. Tea thank you. With a slightly bashful smile, Siaxan spreads out the delicious looking bento. Mini hamburger steaks, egg salad, and simple sandwiches. All of them look delicious. Or rather, all of the food lined up were my favorites, so embarrassing it may be. I felt excited. How should I say this? Bento boxes have a strange excitement to them, and being within their boxes strangely makes them look so much better than when they're normally on the plate. Thank you for the food. Yes, enjoy your meal. Pressed on by her gentle smile, I took a sandwich and brought it to my mouth first. Ham and lettuce? It was seasoned with a tangy and slightly spicy seasoning to make the salty taste of the dish more appetizing. Continuing on, I brought the egg salad 
served with a small wooden fork, to my mouth, which was also really carefully unwrapped with a soft and gentle tassel, along with a refreshing vegetable flavor that spread in my mouth. Siag San's cooking really had a gentle taste and was very delicious, or rather, it seems like every time I eat it, it's getting more and more to my liking. I have prepared lots of them, so you can take your time and eat. Ah, I also brought some tea here. Thank you. I wonder why? How should I say this? Spending time like this feels kind of nice. Eating lunch with Siag San, who would serenely smile in the midst of the greenery filled nature. It somehow makes me feel very warm, or rather, it makes me feel very calm. Feeling relaxed and happy. We proceeded with our meal and finished all of the bentos, which should have been quite large. Just as my stomach swelled up, Siag San quietly prepared a cup of hot tea, and after I thanked her again, I brought it to my mouth. Fuah, Kaito San? Ah, uh, I am sorry. Dot could it be that you haven't been able to sleep much last night? Dot er, uh, I actually only slept for a bit. I don't know if it's because I felt relaxed after a good meal, but I unintentionally leaked out a yawn. Dot Kaito San. How about you get some sleep for a bit, eh? No, but you don't have to be that reserved, go get some sleep. As she said this, Siag San took a large cloth from her magic box and rolled it around, she turned it into a pillow. It's true that after I filled up my stomach, I'm feeling quite sleepy. So her suggestion that I can sleep sounds very appealing. Moreover, since Siag San was so concerned about me, it's kind of difficult for me to say number. T then. I'll sleep for a bit. Yes. Deciding to take Siag San's suggestion and sleeping for a little while, I laid down on the pillow that Siag San had prepared for me. Thereupon, Siag San took out a thin blanket and gently draped it over me. Daughter, then, please wake me up after a while. I understand. Laying down quickly makes me feel sleepy, and when I called out to Siag San as I felt my eyelids getting heavier, she gave me a gentle, reassuring smile. Then, she slowly approached me, and as I felt my hair being gently stroked, I heard her beautiful voice. Dot a song? Yes, it doesn't have any lyrics but it's often sung in lullabies. If it's unpleasant, should I stop? No, you can keep going if you want. Yes, Tilda. The gentle, beautiful melody comfortably echoes in my ears and slowly lulls me to sleep. So Siag San is a good singer too. She really seems like a mature woman who can do everything a really lovely person. As I was thinking about this, my consciousness slowly faded away. I thought I heard her soft voice mixed in with the song. Kaito San. While you sleep, I'm going to prepare myself. When you wake up, please let me convey these feelings of mine. Before I could get a firm grasp on her words, my eyelids completely dropped, and my consciousness sank into slumber. Asterisk 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 Smelling something good, I slowly opened my eyelids to see Siag San brewing tea with a magic tool that looks like a portable stove. When I raised my body and lightly shook the sleepiness out of me, Siag San noticed me and smiled. Good morning, Kaito San. Good morning, um. How long have I been sleeping? Around two hours. T that long. You could have woken me up though. You were sleeping so comfortably earlier so. Ugh. Please wait for a moment. I'm preparing tea. Apparently. I've slept longer than I thought I would. And even though I'm feeling a little apologetic for making her wait that long. I accepted the tea that Siag San offered me. The taste of the warm tea seeped into my sleepy body and I felt my consciousness slowly wake up. Kaito San. Eat this with your tea. Dot what's this? It's called a fruit stick. It's a popular snack among the elves. Siag San prepared a long, thin pastry the size of my palm. It kind of looks like a spring roll. Fruit stick. Speaking of which, didn't Alice mention this when she asked me to buy her a souvenir? I see, it's a famous sweet here in Rig Foshiaha. When I picked one up and ate it, it seemed to have jam inside the sticky crust and the natural sweetness of the fruit and the soft crunchy texture was very delicious. It doesn't seem to be like jam bread, or rather, bread at all, though it isn't as hard as a scone. The jam also contains large pieces of fruit, which change in texture from time to time, making it a wonderful product. Dot it's really delicious, I really like this. I'm happy that you like it. Somehow, 
It kind of reminded me of the jam cookies I bought the first time I went out with Siaxan. The shop we bought those jam cookies by their fruits from Rig Fossier after all. While lightly chatting with Siaxan, we had a nice cup of tea and fruit sticks. The fact that I slept for two hours after lunch means that it's just about tea time, so drinking tea now felt just right. It's just that, Kaito-san. There's something wrong with what you said. The first time I followed Kaito-san as your escort wasn't that day. Eh? Is that so? Yes, in case you hadn't noticed. I was actually your guard from the first day Kaito-san came to this world. I've been relieved of my duties now that Phantasmal King Sama is here now though. My impression is that the first time I met with Siak-san was when we were shopping together, but in fact, I just didn't realize that Siak-san was always guarding from a distance whenever I went out. I see. So that was why when I was attacked by Etu and Theta, Siak-san was the first one to show up. I wasn't aware of that. So I've been under Siak-san's care for a long time already huh? Dot I'm a useless guard who lost track of Kaito-san on the first day though. No, that is. Err, uh, once again, thank you. Dot the one saying thanks should be me instead. Dot A, she has been protecting me all these days without my knowledge. When I thanked her for that fact. Siak-san slowly shook her head and her blue eyes directly looked at me. At first, I thought Kaito-san was an ordinary, somewhat unreliable person. Just letting the situation go with the flow, a bewildered person who doesn't have a definite purpose. I thought you were just one of the many people you can find anywhere. Ahaha, I think I really was like that. No. I just had such an impression because I think my eyes were blinded. You were a much stronger and better person than I was. And no, I'm not that exaggerated of a person. With a gentle tone, Siak-san began praising me, and scratching my head. I felt embarrassed to reply, but Siak-san just looked at me with eyes that carried no hesitation. The emotions that are being conveyed in those eyes. Affection? Respect? Anyway, it's something favorable and powerful. Dot I have always been watching you. Kaito-san, coming to an unknown world unprepared, surrounded by many people stronger than you, and many of them aren't so friendly to you. I can't even estimate how anxious you were, feeling such pressure at that time. Dot I've just been fortunate enough to have many people helping me out. It's certainly as Siak-san said, even though I am quite energetic now. I was very anxious when I came to this world in the beginning. In a world where my own common sense doesn't work and I have no choice but to rely on some strangers. It's hard not to feel anxious. However, I was fortunate enough to have a chance to meet with all these people. I'm really enjoying my life now because of that. I think being blessed with connections is a great talent. But most of all, I think it's because of your personality that so many people have come around you. Siak-san. You're a strong, straightforward person who is strong and kind thinking of others above all else. You've also given me lots of courage. Dot courage? A calm voice, but I can definitely feel the firmness within it. I think what Siak-san will be talking about is probably something very important for her. Because I felt that, I also looked straight at Siak-san when I replied to her with a serious expression on my face. Yes, you have been a dazzling presence to me while I was stuck in a situation where I wanted to change things but was afraid I would make the situation worse. And then, Kaito-san has changed what I couldn't change over the years, with ease. Dot. My relationship with Lily, the guilt in her heart, and my lost voice. Kaito-san has done so many miracles for me. What I wanted, what was once broken. You picked up all of the pieces, and presented it to me. Dot. I didn't really mean to do anything that exaggerated though. If things have changed for the better for Siak-san, it isn't because of me. It's because of Siak-san's efforts. The reason why Lilia-san and Siak-san's relationship was repaired is because they had firm feelings for each other. I think what I did was just a little bit of a catalyst. The guilt in Lilia-san's heart loosened because she herself had a strong chest and firmly looked ahead. And the reason why Siak-san's voice has returned is because of Lilywood-san. Of course, I may have helped them out a bit, but above all. Siak-san's own efforts are the most important factor why they achieved all that. When I replied to her with these words, Siak-san gently smiled, as if she knew I was going to reply this to her. Yes, I thought Kaito-san would say that. You were the gentle of a person after all, and I. Siak-san. Even if you feel that way, I can't express the gratitude I have for you in my heart enough, Kaito-san. Once again, thank you very much. Ah, no. Why you're welcome? Saying that, 
Siaxan deeply bowed her head to thank me, and after she raised her face, she looked straight into my eyes again before speaking. Kaito san, you're like the sun to me, dazzling and big, yet so warm and reassuringly guides me, and that's why such a fantastic person like you. S. Siaxan, I am but a weak elf, I haven't had the courage to do this for a long time, but finally, I have the courage to tell you these thoughts I've been holding. I want to keep looking at you for the rest of my life, closer than ever before. Dot. I wonder why? My heart is beating absurdly fast. Each word she spoke in a serious voice echoes loud and clear in my ears. Although I was confused why, I couldn't take my eyes off Siaxan. No, I don't think I should look away from her. Siaxan was silent for a moment, and then, filled with her very strong thoughts. She spoke. Kaito san, I love you. As someone of the opposite gender. Exclamation mark. Receiving her words, which were filled with a flood of emotions, my thought process completely stiffened. I totally didn't expect it. Isn't the case at all. I was aware that Siak san was directing her favorable feelings toward me. However, I just assumed that it was something close to affection. But it seems I was mistaken, and today, Siak san confessed to me. The words Siaxan suddenly said, were a confession about how she likes me as someone of the opposite sex. To be honest, I was quite dumbfounded and my head wasn't able to catch up with the situation at all. I felt like I should be saying something, but my mouth doesn't move as if something was keeping them shut, and my thoughts won't completely settle. The seriousness in Siaxan's eyes, the look of determination on her face that doesn't look away from me. I don't feel any doubt that she's serious about her words just now. Seeing me frozen, unable to say anything, Siaxan's expression faltered a bit before she wryly smiled. Dot I know. I know that until now, Kaito-san wasn't recognizing me as a target of affection. So I understand why you're confused. Dot ah, no, er, uh, it certainly is Siaxan said. I've never seen Siaxan as a target of romantic interest. It's not that Siaxan is unattractive or anything, it's just that, to me, Siaxan is. Her existence is like a woman I admire. She is a kind, dependable, mature woman. She's a high-ranked woman, or something like that, I guess. I think that's how I looked at her. S. Since. When did it start? Shameful it may be, the words that leaked out of my mouth is a question to stretch out the conversation. In response to me, who hasn't been able to wrap my head around it at all, Siaxan gave me a reassuring smile and spoke. It wasn't until the Sacred Tree Festival that I became clearly aware of it. I it's been that long. Yes. However, it took me a long time to find the courage to express my feelings. How should I answer her? I don't know. I can't think of a good response at all. Siaxan is amazing. She's calmly smiling in a situation like this, while I was just, dot it was just troubling. Wasn't it, dot a? Hearing the words she said in a slightly sad tone, my vision, which had been confused and narrowed before, opened up at once, dot Siaxan's hand. They're trembling? I'm sorry, I know that it would confuse you if I suddenly told you about it. But I really wanted to share my feeling with you. Siaxan. You don't have to respond now. I won't rush you for your response. However, it would be nice if you could remember it. Even in the corner of your mind. Siaxan's face, as she said that with a smile, looked like she was about to start crying. Thereupon, Siaxan moved her gaze from me, and reached out to put away the magic tools she had placed around us. It's about time for us to head back eh? P please wait. Before I knew it, I was holding Siaxan's outstretched hand. I wasn't conscious of anything. My head is still a mess. But I clearly knew that I couldn't just let this happen. Just a bit, please give me a bit more time to think. I will give my reply to you right here. Exclamation mark why yes. Siaxan confessed her feelings to me. Siaxan knew that I hadn't seen her that way but she still built up the courage to tell me her feelings. I've also confessed my feelings to Kuro and Isis-san before. With Kuro, I was so preoccupied with all the stuff that was happening that I didn't have the time to think about what was about to come. When it was with Isis-san though, I was aware that she already has affection towards me. But still, I felt terribly uneasy when I confessed until she answered. I'm sure Siaxan is more anxious now than I was at that time. Confessing even though she doesn't know how I felt, 
and even having no expectation of a response, how much courage did she need to have to do that? If I were to indulge Siaxan's kindness and withhold my answer here, I would definitely end up dragging it out and would ambiguously stall it. If that happens, Siaxan would end up having to carry her anxiety all the time. That's why, I knew I had to respond, or at least, make sure I had the thoughts on my mind right now. In front of Siaxan, who had turned back towards me, I slowly closed my eyes and let my thoughts wander. How do I feel about Siaxan? How do I want to interact with her in the future? First of all, I must stop seeing Siaxan as just a mature woman I respect, or that she's a high-level woman. I must only see Siaxan as the woman she is. As for whether I like her or not, I obviously like her, even now. I'm really happy that she confessed to me and that she liked me. When I first met Siaxan, I had the impression that she was a cool person with a slender body with a beautiful face. But when I talked to her, I found her to be a gentle person who paid attention to every detail, good at brewing tea and cooking, and had such family-oriented interests. Back when I had just come to Lilia San's mansion, where everyone didn't look at me too favorably. She connected with me without looking at me with strange eyes. Because I felt happy about that, we began to talk a lot. After we got back from the Sacred Tree Festival, she would sometimes give me her home-cooked meals. And even when she had little time on her hands, she taught me how to cook. When I was attacked by e and Theta, she was the first to come running and risked her life, fighting for me. After we got Bell, even though I had no experience with animals, she taught me how to take care of him in many ways and she often came to help me when she had some spare time out of her work. I must be an idiot. Looking back on it like this, I can see Siaxan's affection was evident in her behavior, but I didn't notice it at all and just took advantage of her kindness. How insensitive am I? Slowly opening my eyes, I stare into those beautiful blue eyes, remembering each and every one of the memories I had with Siaxan, the words I exchanged with her and her thoughts. Siaxan. Why yes? To be honest, I didn't really understand. Siaxan, you're right, I've been oblivious to Siaxan's affection for me until now, and even though I'm thinking about it right at this moment, I haven't been able to firmly put it all together. I think it isn't unreasonable. As I said earlier, I'm in no hurry. However, interrupting what Siaxan is saying as she looked slightly sad, I wrapped both of her hands in mine, and continued to speak. If you ask me if I like or dislike Siaxan, I will answer without hesitation. I like Siaxan! Exclamation mark. Yes, I couldn't come up with a smart answer. I also couldn't come up with a cool reply. However, even if I removed all the filters I had selfishly attached to my perception of Siaxan, I still had the feeling that I like her. I'm aware that it's a very selfish thing for me to say. Dot. However, from this moment on, if I were to see and treat Siaxan as someone of the opposite sex, as a love interest, I can assure you that I may like you more than I do now, but I can't possibly hate you! Exclamation mark. Yes, seriously thinking about it, that much was certain. If I were to walk with Siaxan from now on, I would probably like her even more than I do now. And there's no way I'm going to hate her. I'm glad that Siaxan confessed to me and I want to know her better than ever. I want to like her even more. That would mean, I've already thought of one clear answer. That's why, uh, that's why. From now on, as a lover, I want to know more about Siaxan. Please let me understand more. Please let me like you even more than I already do. Dot why yes, that's the answer I chose. I want to be lovers with Siaxan from now on, and I want to know a lot of things with her, see a lot of things with her. When Siaxan heard my answer, she vigorously nodded her head and then, large drops of tears spilled out of her eyes. A, A era, e, even though I'm feeling so happy. Why? Siaxan. Ah, uh, as Siaxan wiped away her overflowing tears with a happy smile on her face, I gently brought her into my embrace. Um, I may be an insensitive, stupid and unreliable man but, I look forward to being with you from now on. Yes, it was me instead who's timid and unreliable but, I will be in your care from now on. I continued to hug the crying Siaxan as I felt the distance between our hearts have crossed a single boundary. As if we had somehow come one step closer to each other than ever before. I may be slow and stupid, and I'm only just starting to make progress, so I think I have to do my best from now on. But now, 
For sure I think our relationship has become deeper and closer than we've ever been before. After Siaxan's confession, we officially became lovers. However, that doesn't mean that the way we treat each other is going to abruptly change, as after we drank our tea and continued chatting, we got up to resume our walk in the forest. It isn't that interesting of a story, but I want to tell you a little about me. After saying this, Siaxan began to talk with a small smile on her face. Have you noticed it? When we arrived in Rigfoshia, until we arrived home, there were many elves who talked to Kaito-san, but not a single elf talked to me. Come to think of it. Now that she mentioned it, I certainly don't remember anyone calling out to Siaxan, and I think that's strange. After all, Rigfoshia is Siaxan's hometown. If I remember correctly, Siaxan moved to the royal capital more than a decade ago. Um, this might be a rude question to ask. But Siaxan is now. I'm 34 years old. The elves are a long-lived species though, so my appearance will stay the same for another 200 years or so. Siaxan is 34 years old. This means that she must have lived in Rigfoshia for at least 20 years. And yet, not only this time, but even during the Sacred Tree Festival, I had never seen Siaxan with any elf other than her parents. Dot I'm a dim-witted elf after all. A, B but Siaxan is. If I remember correctly, Siaxan is among the five most powerful people in the country, so I can't think how the word dim-witted can be applied to her. I'm not sure if she understood my doubts or not, but Siaxan chuckled a bit before answering. I guess that was a bad way to say it. I guess it's more correct to say I'm dim-witted as an elf. Dot can I ask why? Yes. Though I say that, the reason is quite simple. The elves are a race that lives with nature. So, regardless of their talent, any member of the elves has an aptitude for nature magic or spirit magic, either wind attributed or earth attributed. However, even though it was extremely seldom, there are those who don't have such talents that should be natural for elves. And Siaxan was one of them? I understood what Siaxan said. I certainly have never seen her use win or earth attribute magic. What she always used was fire attribute magic. Yes, I am one of the extremely rare elves with absolutely no aptitude for either nature or spirit magic. Moreover, my greatest aptitude was for the flames. The element that burns the forest. That's the reason why. Dot. Especially since my mother was a spirit mage that the head spirit mage called her rival, and my father was a mage so highly skilled that the king bowed down to invite him. Being their daughter, the people around us had high expectations of me. But unfortunately, I have an aptitude that you can't exactly call elf-like. Siaxan says it like it's nothing, but I think this is a very heavy subject. She was unable to do what the elves of her age around her can do as a matter of course. She must have been in a terribly difficult situation. Well, that didn't mean I was persecuted or anything like that, you know? Both father and mother were outspoken within the elven tribe, and although I didn't have an aptitude for nature or spirit magic, I fortunately do have the talent. Well, that's why people used to say if only you were a proper elf. But that was a long time ago. Siaxan, perhaps, that might be why. I admired you who, despite your difficult circumstances, looked straight ahead and tried to change. I would be lying if I said I don't care about it at all now, but I think the situation is fine. After all, you see, it was because I didn't want to go back to Rig Foshia so much and tried to stay with Lilai after I was injured that I was able to meet Kaito-san. When I think about it that way, strange it may sound, but I'm glad I didn't have an aptitude for nature magic, I suppose. I can't say I completely understand Siaxan's suffering. But even so, I'm glad to have learned one thing new about Siaxan. I felt it was somehow wrong to offer words of comfort when Siaxan herself was so convinced. So, I told her that I was glad to know more about her now that we had become lovers. Hearing my words, Siaxan happily smiled. Kaito-san really is a wonderful man. I felt that Siaxan's expression was dazzlingly bright as she told me this. After chatting with Siaxan for a while, we resumed our stroll. Earlier, Siaxan was walking in front of me, while I followed behind her, but this time, we started walking next to each other. Maybe it's because we're now so close, but I can smell a nice citrusy scent wafting from Siaxan. Is it perfume? It's typical for Siaxan to have a fresh, gentle scent. And since I'm starting to think of Siaxan as a woman, smelling her scent is kind of making me very nervous now. As we continued walking for a while, 
Xiaxan's hand unexpectedly touched mine and slowly held my hand. A s something like this. I is the least lovers can do. Why yes. Her surprisingly soft hands. I don't know if it's because my temperature is higher than her, but her hand is cooler than mine. Her little hand that fits perfectly in mine was lovely, making me feel that Siaxan was a woman. It kind of feels nice, isn't it? Walking like this. Are you talking about us holding hands? There's also that but. The fact that I'm walking next to you like this. Makes me feel like I'm closer to you, Kaito-san. Siaxan. Hearing Siaxan's words with a happy look on her face, I tightened my grip on her hand a little more. It seems that my feelings were firmly conveyed as Siaxan also squeezed back my hand. At the same time as my tension gradually raised my body temperature, not the kind of tension where my body just burned hot, the happiness of being with Siaxan in this way also grew stronger with each step forward. As I walked leisurely through the forest, holding hands with Siaxan, I suddenly felt a strange sensation. I don't know how to describe it. But I feel like there's someone ahead of us, in a place I can't see. Kaito-san? Is something the matter? Ah, uh, uh, I have this strange feeling that there's someone over there, pointing in the direction of an area within the forest, Siaxan curiously tilted her head. Dot, I can't feel anyone's presence though. Eh, hey, I could tell there was someone there, but I can't tell who it is, is it because of Kaito-san's sympathy magic? I think so too, but this is the first time I've felt this. Yes. I have never experienced this feeling from my sympathy magic before. It even feels as if I'm being called. Should we check it out? I'm sorry for suddenly saying something strange. Don't worry about it. Besides, if we just left like this, we'll both remain curious about it. Since we're here, let's check it out. Yes. Nodding at Siaxan's kind offer, we both started walking towards the presence I had sensed. As we walked for a while, the presence gradually became clearer and clearer and I found out who was there. Siaxan, I understand now. I know who's up ahead. Who is it? Dot, it's Lily-san. A. L. Lily-sama? Yes, that clears up why I felt that. I think this strange feeling I had is a resonance between my sympathy magic and Lily-san's perception magic, abilities which are rather similar, perhaps. No, I'm sure Lily-san had also noticed us. Hearing my words. Siaxan looked a little flustered and started checking her appearance. It seems like she admires her, so I guess she must be nervous when she meets her. As I was thinking about this, we arrived at an open area. That looked like a plaza, with no trees growing in it. Casually moving my gauze, I saw Lily-san kneeling on both knees in the prayer. When I approached her, a little puzzled by her appearance, which seemed somewhat sacred, she slowly stood up and turned to me. Hello. Mama Kaito-san, even though we greeted each other yesterday, this would technically be the first time we have met face to face. Unexpectedly it may be, I'm glad to have encountered you here. Hello, Lily-san. After Lily-san greeted me in a polite tone of voice, I slightly bowed her head towards her. Oi ah, I believe this is the first time we've met, yes, my name is Lily. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. R, why why yes, I, I am. You are Siglin-san. Yes, I'm very happy to have met you. Please make yourself comfortable. Why yes, it seems that Siaxan is more nervous than I expected. Even though she admires her, it feels like she doesn't know what to say when she actually met her. Although with Lily-san, the other party doesn't really have to talk for her thoughts to get through. Dot an autograph, is it? Yes, of course, I don't mind. Ugh, that's not. Am my apologies. Please forgive my rudeness. She probably thought in her head that she wanted an autograph. Hearing Lily-san's response to that, Siaxan turned pale. Er, uh, Lily-san. Actually, my request yesterday is. I see, so the autograph is for her. Yes, that being the case, since you have a connection with Mama Kaito-san, I will prepare something a little special for you. After Lily-san said this, she took a petal from a red flower that grew on either side of her head, wrote her signature on it and then presented it to Siaxan. How about this? A wah wah wah. W would it be alright for me to receive something like this? Of course. T thank you very much. Siaxan stiffened when the petal was held out to her, but she still accepted it and carefully put it away in her magic box. After watching her act like that, Lily-san spoke again. By the way, are you friends? Er, uh, how should I say this? Oi ah, uh, I see that you have become lovers. Congratulations. 
I give you my sincerest blessings. Thank you. Before I could think of how to explain it, Lily San, who had read my surface thoughts, smiled and gave me her blessing. How should I say this? Talking with Lily San, who could read my surface thoughts. The conversation proceeds quickly. She immediately understood what we wanted to say, and the story's tempo is first. I feel an ease of talking with her unlike when I'm talking with Kuro and Alice. If I had to describe it, it's almost like I'm talking with Shiro-san. Lily-san? No, I think that was a strange way of thinking. People would normally be creeped out by this. But I guess you were quite accepting her. It's true that being able to read minds may make others avoid her. But Lily-san is only reading people's surface thoughts. Since she doesn't really read deep into your mind, I think she's rather easy to talk to. Seeing me like this, Lily-san smiled somewhat happily, then turning to Siak-san, she spoke. By the way, is that distress I'm feeling? It seems like there's something stuck in your mind! Exclamation mark. Meeting you here must be fate. If you're alright with me, you can consult with me, you know? The expression on Siak-san's face looked as if Lily-san got it right. Then, after a short pause, she spoke. Dot I can't exactly say I'm distressed about it, but I would like to become stronger than I am now. Recently, I have had many opportunities to realize that I am not strong enough. The opportunities Siak-san was talking about when she felt that she wasn't strong enough was probably about that incident with Mejdo-san. Although Siak-san defeated Ita, she may have felt inadequate at her battle against Sigma and Bacchus-san after that. However, she didn't seem to be that seriously troubled about it, which was a bit of a relief. After hearing Siak-san's words, Lily-san thought for a moment before speaking with a cheerful voice. That being the case, how about you train your nature magic or spirit magic? Magic that borrows power from its surroundings is capable of demonstrating power beyond its user's own limits, you know? Dot. Oir. Now this is quite a troubling situation. I guess Lily-san normally gives that advice to elves, but unfortunately, Siak-san is. Dot my apologies, Lily-sama. I have no aptitude for either nature magic or spirit magic, and am unable to use it. Ah, is that so? Please excuse my rudeness. However, for a high elf like you to be unable to use nature magic, that's as strange as hearing a mermaid who can't swim. Indeed, the high elves, the special individual of the elves who are said to evolve because they were loved by nature. Being unable to use nature magic is, a eh? As if time had stopped, silence fell around us. Then, after a few moments, Siak-san spoke, looking somewhat puzzled. You am, um, Lily-sama. I'm not a high elf, I'm just a normal elf though. When Siak-san told her this, Lily-san dubiously looked at her. A normal elf? No. You're definitely a high elf though. As a spirit, there's no way I would mistake the magic power of an elf for that of a high elf. Dot a, a. It seems that Lily-san is convinced that Siak-san is a special individual of the elves, but Siak-san doesn't seem to have any idea what she's talking about at all. Thereupon, Lily-san put her hand on her chin and pondered for a moment, and seemingly having come up with something, she spoke. Dot by some chance, have you eaten the fruit of the world tree? A, R. Yes, I have eaten one of them. The fruit of the world tree in which Lilywood Summer's power resides is a cluster of nature magic power. It's just my conjecture, but eating it may have caused your body to possess a large amount of nature magic power and you evolved into a high elf. H. Hugh, I see. That means, I'm now that you are in fact able to use nature magic and spirit magic without any problems. Rather, I certainly would like to see a high elf that can't use it. You you you. Hearing Lily-san's words, Siak-san looked somewhat shocked and yet, she also seemed to be overcome with emotions. I guess it isn't that strange. Although Siak-san spoke about it as if it was nothing, the fact that she couldn't use nature magic and spirit magic that other elves could use as a matter of course was surely weighing heavily on her shoulders. I'm sure she had wondered not just once or twice what it was like if she was able to use them. If so, as for what I should say to such a Siak-san, that should be given already. Dot I'm happy for you, Siak-san. Yes, it's thanks. To Kaito-san. As Siak-san clung to me, tears spilling down her face, I hugged Siak-san as gently as I could. Although this was unexpected, this was truly a joyous occasion. With this in mind, I continued to stroke Siak-san's head as she cried. After a while, when Siak-san stopped crying, as if she had been waiting for that moment, Lily-san spoke. As I recall, 
Your name is Siglin San, yes, why yes, if you like, how about I teach you how to fight a bit. A, Siak San looked stunned, as if she couldn't believe what Lily San said. I guess it's not unreasonable. Lily San is the world king's head of subordinate, and her position as well as her abilities must be among the top within the count ranks. She must be feeling humbled when such a Lily San offered to give her her teachings. If you're in the middle of a date, we can do it on another day. But I think it must be faith that we've become acquainted like this. If you want to be stronger, I can at least give you some simple advice. Siak San glanced at me as she listened to Lily San's words. Siak San, since we're at it, how about accepting her guidance? Ah, is that alright? Yes, since there's a great opportunity, accept it. I'll be observing you. Siak San seemed like she would be receiving guidance from Lily San, and since we can have as many dates as we want again in the future, I suggested that she receive the guidance now. After thinking about it for a moment, Siak San deeply bowed to me, before she turned to Lily San and spoke. Lily Sama, I'd appreciate it very much. Yes, well then, let's start with the basics of how to use nature magic. With that, Lily San beckoned Siak San over and began instructing her in the center of the open space. Watching them from a little distance, I called out to the guy behind me. Reliable commentator. Come here. Transcendental beauty. Reliable transcendental beauty commentator, come here. Yes, yes. She's kinda spouting her annoyingness again, but Alice is really dependable in this kind of situation. I would be very grateful for a commentary here, because as usual, when Siak San and Lily San were having a bout, I won't be able to see what's happening, so it would be very nice to have her commentary. Lily San is the world king's head of subordinate. So I guess she would be very strong huh? She's strong. Compared to Funf San, who Kaito San met before. She's stronger. That's quite outrageous. Though I say that, Lily San basically fights defensively. She almost never initiates attacks on her own. What's troublesome is her flower haven and illusion tree. As usual, I tilted my head when I heard unfamiliar terms that sounded like their special techniques, and Alice smiled and explained them to me in turn. First. Flower Haven is a counter technique. It's an omnidirectional defense that makes use of her world's top level perception magic. With it, whether the attack is magical or physical, she would reverse it and amplify it with the law of causality, reflecting their attacks with five times the power. To break it, you must at least have the power to interfere with the law of causality. Just from hearing about it, that sounds like an outrageous cheaty technique. And then, the illusion tree is a technique that makes it so that a phenomenon that happened to you looks like it didn't occur, kind of like an olification ability that postpones the damage she received for later. As long as she has this, even if one breaks the flower haven, they can't inflict any damage on Lily San. Well, I suppose it's actually more correct to say that even if they do inflict damage to her, it would be as if that never happened. Doesn't that make her invincible? As expected of a peak count rank, they are invincible. She's like one of those enemies that appear in the events you're set to lose in RPGs. Well, putting aside the six kings and the supreme gods, you can count on one hand those who are able to get through Lily San's defenses. Of course, Alice Chan here can handle her quite easily. Well, it would still take me about 40 seconds to beat her. So you're saying that Lily San, Alice needing 40 seconds to defeat, was a good thing? Of course, she may not be as strong as the six kings. But she definitely has their strength that exceeds human intellect. Rather, Alice can defeat Lily San who has such unreasonable defensive abilities in just 40 seconds huh? Seriously, how strong is this guy? Dot in this world, how strong is Alice? Let's see. The only people I can say for sure that I can't beat are Kuro San and Shallow Vernal Sama. That makes you the third strongest person in the world. That's outrageous. Well, I think that Kaito San who interacts with not just the third strongest person in the world, but the world's ten strongest people in the world, is more outrageous. You're blessed with connections, or rather, with this level, I think you're cursed with your connections. I can't deny that. While I was chatting with Alice like that, I saw Siak San and Lily San stand up and after taking a distance from each other, they turned towards each other. It seems that they're going to have some light spa. Uh, would Siak San be alright? With that reflection ability of hers. No, as expected, I don't think she'll use her flower haven at a time like this. Just as Alice said those words, 
Seok-san kicked off the ground and instantly swung her sword towards Lily-san. From my eyes though, it looked as if Seok-san performed an instant transmission. Hey, that was one of the nature magics. It's a magic that gathers that magic power in one's surroundings and adds them to your own. For someone who used it for the first time, she did it quite well. I, I see. That's why Seok-san was so fast. Wait, Era, Lily-san hasn't moved, has she? Then. Why don't Siak-san's attacks hit her? Ahead of my gaze, Siak-san was swinging her twin swords with such speed that after images remained, but even when Lily-san hadn't moved a single step, Siak-san's swords were slipping past her. No, she's avoiding her attacks. Eh? No, it just looks like she's not moving because she's dodging with minimal movement before instantly returning to her original location. Although it still depends on the individuals, it takes a human 0.1 second to confirm something by sight. Therefore, if an object moves at a higher speed than that, your eyes wouldn't be able to become aware of it. I, I see. Well, this is only the case without using magic power. It will be different if one's visual perception is strengthened and reflexes are sharpened by magic power. For example, in the case of Lilia San, whose ability is broken among the humans, her visual perception speed would be about 1 200 million seconds and her reaction time is about 1 100,000 seconds. To put it plainly, there would be a slight delay before she could react from attacks that are at the speed of light. A. Eh? Lilia San is that outrageous? T slash N. Speed of light is 299,792,458 meters per second. There would be a slight delay before she could react from attacks that are at a speed of light. In other words, she can react to the speed of light. Once again, I realized that Lilia Sam is outrageous. I had heard from Anima that she was so powerful that she was so powerful that she could be called a special individual of the humans, but for her to be that powerful, well. You could say she's some sort of bug character whose talent alone is the best in the world. If we compare it to an RPG, which Kaito-san is familiar with, a normal person's status board increases by 3 to 5 points per level up, whereas Lilia-san's status board grows by 101000 points per level up. If she continues to grow steadily like that, after about 5000 years, she may become the first human to be strong enough to compete with the Six Kings and the Supreme Gods. Even if you say 5,000 years, Lilia-san is a human, so she can't live that long. At Hilda well, I guess that might be the case. Anyway, even though Siak-san is inferior to Lilia-san, she has enough ability to cope with the speed of sound, and I think she can see some of Lilia-san's movements as well. But Lilia-san was the slowest among the Six Kings executives. Dot. Lily-san, who to my eyes doesn't seem to be moving a single step, is actually quite the slow one among the six kings. Seriously, the Count Rank is a group made up of monsters. Asterisk 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 As she swung her sword incessantly at Lily, Sieglind shuddered. Amazing. Even with all my attacks, none of them managed to hit her. It's as if my attacks were being read. Yes, wow, being told her thoughts within her mind. No, what she was currently thinking within her mind, Sieglind looks astonished. Your swordsmanship, backed by solid training, is superb. Your sense and intuition aren't bad either. However, if it takes you a hundredth of a second from thought to attack, it's like you're asking me to avoid you. With a slight smile on her face, along with her praises, Lily-san pointed out she still had considerable leeway, with your ability. You should be able to compete with Viscount Tranks, but your overall fighting ability at the moment is only slightly less than a Viscount Trank. Accelerate your thinking. A. Let the compressed magic power travel at ultra high speed in your mind, and raise your thinking speed to a higher dimension. Think of a hundred moves in 0.1 seconds. Be able to move to a thousand different attacks in one second. Have you ever heard that when you are in an extreme situation? The scenery around you appears to slow down. That is essentially something your physical body is capable of reproducing. Take that concept and bring it to a higher dimension with more magic power. Don't worry, the you right now is naturally loved by magic power. Deeply grasp the magic power that travels inside and outside your body. And bring that to a higher level. Dot yes. Hearing Lily San's teachings, Sieglind promptly followed her. The magic power traveling inside her body the magic power that overflows outside her body. Their flow, size, 
density. Taking in all of these details, she took the magic power overflowing outside her body. The magic power floating in the air into her body. The moment they flooded the body without gaps and began to travel at high speed through all of her organs, including her brain. The scenery reflected in her eyes changed. She could see Lily's movements, which had only seemed blurry earlier, and as she swung her sword in time with her, Lily used her hands for the first time to deflect the sword's trajectory. Seems like you were able to do it. Don't forget that feeling. That is the most basic form. And from here on out is the application. I will teach you a technique. Dot technique? Yes, read through this carefully. Exclamation mark. At that moment, Sieglin's head was filled with a thought sent to her by Lily. It's a technique, a high elf technique. Your race. High Elf. Lily would summer's magic power resides in the fruit of the world tree. And your thirst for strength. You should meet all the requirements. Now, use it, the ability of spiritization. Yes, here I go. It's the High Elf's greatest and most powerful trump card, allowing the user to transcend the limits of their physical body as a human and temporarily transforming their body into that of a spirit. A High Elf who has become a nature spirit is capable of explosively enhancing their power. Sieglin's body was enveloped in a pale green light, and her green eyes emitted a strong light. You have great magic power. The amount should be around low to mid count rank. The amount of magic power is directly connected to one's physical ability. Now, let's see your power that exceeds the limit. Dot. Sieglind nodded silently at Lily's words, approaching Lily at a speed far faster than before. At a speed which would no longer be an exaggeration to describe as having reached a step before the speed of light, she swung her sword with all her might. The strike, which was overwhelmingly enhanced by the spiritization, hit Lily who had neither evaded nor defended herself. Stopped without cutting even a thin layer of her skin. Dot you have great swords. I am a little surprised that it didn't break when it hit me. Dot as I thought, even in this state. My swords won't reach her. Sieglind wasn't surprised to find that her full body strike was easily deflected. Rather, she looked somewhat refreshed, as if such a thing happening was a matter of course. Let's see. The you right now should be strong enough to compete with the low count ranks, but that's still not enough for me to use my skills. Dot yes. However, it was a splendid strike, and I could see your potential in it. If you continue to diligently train. Let's see. We might have a good match after about 8,000 years or so. Yes, 8,000 years. That was a greater distance than words could describe. However, those were words that recognized her latents that would eventually allow her to step into the domain of the strong, in the same place as the being that seemed absolute before her. Such words bring a great joy for Sieglind, who had been feeling inadequate. Now, Slowly release your spiritization. Calmly diffuse your magic power. Ka. Transforming one's body into another can be taxing. From now on, you should train yourself so you can be familiar with its power. You must last at least a few dozen hours to be able to fight against a count rank. Dot another distant peak. Ha. Fu fu fu. For the record, I'm not that much better than the other six kings executives in terms of combat power. For example, the pinnacle for the count ranks. Pandora is on a whole other level. Calmly smiling as she said this, Lily looked at Sieglin's growth, as if she was enjoying herself. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Listening to the conversation between Lily San and Sieglin San, I asked the nearby Alice a question. Dot hey, Alice, is Pandora San really that great? Well, strong enough to be called the strongest count rank. Pausing after she said those words. Alice turned towards me and spoke, dot there's a reason why she's called that. Pandora is the strongest count rank. That doesn't just mean her overall strength. A. Eh? Offensive power, defensive power, speed, amount of magic power, magic power operation techniques, etc. She is the top of the count ranks among all of those aspects, which is why she's called the strongest count rank. Pandora San is apparently even more amazing than I thought. In other words, Pandora San is the greatest in all of her abilities. Which means even her defensive power is superior to Lily San's. Well, she may have a difficult personality, but she's extremely excellent. That's why I can't be too unkind to her. Moreover, she's even one of the youngest among my executives. Eh? Is that so? Yes, she's nearly 20,000 years old already, but it can be said that she's young among the peak count ranks. Well, 
There are geniuses who are overwhelmingly younger and have made a name for themselves among the peak count ranks. Are they someone I know? When I asked Alice who the person that even she calls a genius, she pointed towards Lily San before speaking. Lily San's colleague. One of the seven princesses, the Cherry Blossom Princess, Blossom San. As you can imagine from her name, Blossom San is the spirit of a flower from Kaito San's world. The spirit of the cherry blossom. She was from a tree that Lilywood San made based on a story she heard from someone who plays the role of hero. Well, to put it simply, she's the only one among the six king's executives who is less than 1,000 years old, a genius who had gained the title of Beak Count Rank. That sounds like she's an extraordinary person. Well, she's still nothing compared to Lilia's genius. Once again, Lilia San sure is amazing. With Lilia San's current ability, she'd be at the level of a low count rank. But that woman is only 22 years old, you know? In just her 20s, she's stepping in a realm that other demons have taken thousands, or even tens of thousands of years to reach, as if it's a matter of course, she definitely is quite outrageous. I see, now that she mentioned it, indeed. Even though she looked older among the young looking people around me, it's easy to forget but Lilia San is only 22 years old. Putting aside my three Kuhais, the Oichan and her group, she's the youngest among my acquaintances. I mean, it's kind of amazing how a 22 year old woman is the youngest person I know who lives in this world. Now then, it looks like the two of them are coming back, so I'll take my leave here. Yeah, thanks. A little later after Alice disappeared. Siag San and Lily San returned. Kaito San. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. No, don't worry about it. When I responded to Siag San's apologetic words, Lily San also spoke to me, lightly bowing her head. My apologies for taking so long. However, I have imparted to her what needs to be imparted. I can't interrupt the two of you any longer, so I will take my leave. I will see you again later. Let's see, I will come and say my greetings around the time dinner is over. Lily Sama. Thank you very much. Please don't mind it. I look forward to seeing your progress in the future. After saying this with a gentle smile, Lily San lowered her head in our direction several times, before leaving with steps so light that I couldn't believe she was blind. After seeing her off, Siag San and I both held hands and started walking again. Kaito San, there's a place I want us to go. I don't really mind, but would we have enough time to go there? Yes. It's just around the corner. I understand. In that case, let's go. I will not ask where it is or what kind of place it is. I trust Siag San. As we continued walking through the forest under the setting sun, we saw a large tree. A tree that really fits the word big tree to a T, and it was the second largest tree I had ever seen. Incidentally, the largest tree I have ever seen was the world tree that pierces the skies in the forest city, Gfreses. That tree which is also Lilywood San's main body, was extremely large, exceeding even Magnor El San in height alone. It's a very big tree, isn't it? Yes, the biggest tree in Rig Foshia. How nostalgic. I used to come and play here when I was a kid. I see, so this is a place you hold fond memories in. Yes, the word alone is probably added to the word play, but I don't dare ask her about it. I just quietly looked at Siak San's side profile who had an expression of nostalgia on her face. Siag San looked up at the large tree for a few moments, then letting go of my hand, she began looking around the ground. Er, uh, I think it's around here. Is there something there? Yes, back then. Ah, uh, here it is. Perhaps. Having found the location she was looking for, Siag San smiled and held her hand over the base of the tree. Thereupon, a magic circle appeared on the ground, and the soil at the base of the tree was hollowed out in a circular shape floating in the air. The hole that opened up then contained a small box. A little over ten years ago, before I moved to Symphonia's royal capital, I buried the items that had a special place in my heart in this box. What's in the box? I see. It seems that this box is some sort of time capsule. They're not that great. There's an unusual stone, a hair ornament I used to wear. And one more thing. A ring made of wood? Yes. When was it again? I think I made it myself when I was about seven or eight years old. Looking at it again, it looks unattractive and unshapely. It was a slightly distorted wooden ring that would have been too big even for my finger, let alone Siak San's. Siak San said that she made it when she was a child, and from there. Look on her face now, I could sense that she held quite an emotional attachment to it. When I was little, 
but even when I didn't understand what it meant properly, I wanted to get married. Dot. I thought, without any basis to it, that if I married someone, we would get as close to each other as father and mother did. I heard that in the other world, people use rings to get married, so I made it. Dot as I thought. Yes, I think I was lonely. Tired of playing alone. Perhaps, I wanted to put my trust in the information from the other world, a place unknown to me, to deal with a matter that I couldn't control, regardless if they had the power to do that or not. I crouched down next to Siaxan, who was staring at the rings. Somehow, I wanted to be by her side as much as possible at this moment. Why are you showing me this? Dot I think I just want to boast. I wanted to tell the old me that I now have someone like you next to me. Dot I see. Hearing this, I gently picked up the wooden ring in Siaxan's hand. Siaxan didn't resist either and the ring was handed to me. Kaito-san? After smiling at Siaxan, who tilted her head while curiously looking at me, I put the ring on her finger. The ring was fitted on the little finger of her left hand. This was something I had read about in a book before, that a ring fitted on this finger means to make your wish come true. Ah, uh, eh, eh, I can't change the past, but it would be alright. Just as Siaxan said, you aren't alone anymore. There certainly was Lilia San and Luna Maria San. But I'm also here with you. It wasn't like I had anything in particular in mind, it was just something I said to Siaxan, hoping she would smile. But for some reason, her face turned red and she looked downward. Dot I, I, I have heard about it. T that in the other world, P putting the ring in the finger of your partner. I in other words, this is. Apropos. I it's not. As expected, no matter how you look at it, it's still too early to propose. E er, proposals, are made by putting a ring on the ring finger of the left hand, and um. Putting a ring on the little finger of the left hand meant to make your wish come true. I is that so? You are. This is bad. It feels like I'm blushing like crazy. Indeed, it can't be helped if she misunderstood my actions. However, er, uh, doesn't seem like Siaxan dislikes the thought of being proposed, huh? Eh no, wait, let's not think about this any further. Dot um, you saying it's too early. Means that you'll eventually do it? You um. Siaxan. Let's end this topic here. I I don't think it's something we need to be in a hurry about. Why yes. Why why you're right. In the end, we were both so embarrassed afterwards that we couldn't help but blush while looking away from each other, but still, holding hands with each other, we sat under the big tree for a while and chatted with each other. Asterisk 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 asterisk. With me sleeping in the middle of our stroll. Siaxan's confession, and running into Lily-san, more time had passed than I had expected, and when it began to dim, I was surprised that it was already this late. I had some regrets about leaving and would have liked to enjoy walking with Siaxan if possible. But we decided to go home because the night forest was getting less visible and there was a danger of me tripping, plus we were also expecting a visit from Lily-san. When Siaxan and I returned to the city of Rigfoshia, both of us let go of our held hands in embarrassment, and when we reached Resan and Fiasan's home, it looked like they were just getting ready for dinner. Resan and Fiasan looked at us when he came back with a smile on their faces and welcomed us back. Is it just my imagination that they look so happy right now? Since it was going to take a little while to prepare dinner, I told them that Lily San would be visiting after dinner, and then, we were told to take a bath to get rid of the dirt first. As usual, Siaxan punched Resan who strongly suggested that Siaxan and I bathe together, and since Siaxan suggested that I take a bath first since I am their guest, she let me bathe first. The bath at Rasan and Fiasan's home is like a Japanese cypress bath, with a pleasant woodsy scent that soothes my tired body. The large, luxurious baths in Lilia-san's home are good, but taking a bath in a familiar-sized bath like this is good too. After I got mine, Siaxan took a bath as well. And then, we gathered in the dining room to have our dinner. Fiasan prepared a beautiful dish, decorated like a big flower, and looking closely, it's made of vegetables and thinly sliced meat, just like carpaccio. However, the size of the dish is very large, and there seems to be a variety of vegetables and meat used in the dish, so it kind of looks luxurious. Dot it's a really beautiful dish. This, you see, it's called the Rig Foshia's flower, a local specialty of our city. Dot wa wa Siaxan Fiasan tells me that the dish is called the Rig Foshia's flower, 
and as I was admiring how beautiful it looks, for some reason though, Siaxan blushed and looks as if she's seen something unbelievable. Calling out her name, I tilted my head at her strange reaction, but it seemed that she was too surprised that she didn't hear me. Siaxan just moved her gaze towards Fiasan and muttered, dot w -Y -W -N -A, when she asked, isn't it amusing, Ray? Yeah, how many years do you think we've been Siaxan's parents? I knew it the moment. The both of you came home and saw your face, Tilda. In response to Siaxan's dumbfounded words, Resan and Fiasan looked astonished when they replied to her, dot er, is something the matter? Ugh. I see. Mama Khan doesn't know about this. This rig foshia flower is a dish that is eaten during certain celebrations in this city. See celebrations? Yes, it's a celebration for Siag and Mama Khan. Wow, I didn't understand the situation and asked, but Fia San and Ray San smiled at me and replied, Eh, wait a moment. Does that mean they already know that Siag San and I are now lovers? I isn't that too fast. I, I mean, it happened just a few hours ago and we also let go of each other's hands before we went into the town. I, I guess it's to be as expected from Siaxan's parents, they immediately knew if Siaxan had changed. After they told me that they had clearly seen through it all, I can feel my face flushing red, while Siaxan's shoulders are trembling, and even her ears turned bright red. Dot that's why. This food is a dish to be eaten for a wedding celebration. Eww. Hearing Siaxan's words, as she shouted with a bright red face, I couldn't help but let out a yell as well. Err, uh, when they say a certain celebration, they meant a wedding celebration? No, no, no matter how you look at it, isn't that too fast? It's really making me embarrassed here. Also, it kind of reminds me of that conversation I had with Siaxan earlier. Un, does that really matter? You're eventually going to be married. Right? Well, R, T that is, or perhaps, does Siak Chan think that there's a chance you will break up with Mama Khan? That is, um, you unlikely. But, then, it's all good. Dot you 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 are hearing what the two of them said with smiles on their faces, Siak San blushed so red that it feels like she's going to start releasing steam on her ears, and she sits down, covering her face with her hands. Un, um, I have no intention of breaking up with Siak San either. But still, I can understand why Siaxan is that bashful. I mean, if your own parents are that openly delighted, I would obviously be embarrassed. Un, so pull yourself together, me. Stop thinking that Siaxan who had turned bright red is cute. Then, after a Sam looked at Siaxan, who had sat down on her seat, he then turns to me and gave me a serious look. Dot Mama Khan. A. R. Yes, Dot Siak is our very precious daughter. I know she'll be fine with you by her side but please give her happiness. Dot yes, um, I might still be inexperienced and unreliable yet but I'm going to do my best, and not just let Siak San support me. I want to be there for Siak San as well, Tilda. While being exposed to his gaze extremely filled with his fatherly thoughts, I still firmly looked back into Resan's eyes and replied to his words. I am a man. It's times like this when I have to be able to say something strong and reliable. I hope that in the future, I will be someone that is worthy of being by Siaxan's side, and a person with whom Resan and Fiasan can leave Siaxan at ease. I will do my best. Un. I really am glad that you've become Siak's partner. Hearing my words. Resan suddenly released a serious expression on his face and calmly smiled at me. Come already, enough with that man-to-man -man talk. Let's go eat. I'm really confident with what I made today. Perhaps, sensing that our conversation had ended, Fiasan cheerfully suggested that we sit down, and we followed her suggestion. Siaxan, even with her face still red, stood up and took the seat next to me. Dot putting that aside. Mama Khan, eh? Yes. Dot I may be repeating myself, but the room is completely soundproofed. Also, the replacement sheets are in the drawer next to the bed. Also, I'll make sure that the bathtub is properly adjusted to work late at night, so you can use it to your heart's content. Fui -e Dot can you please go die one time? The fatherly expression Resan had on his face just a moment ago disappeared, turning into the face of a perverted old man, and hearing what he said. Siaxan punched Resan with a tremendous force. A vein could literally be seen popping out of her forehead, and her eyes are completely set. It seems that she's angrier than ever before. W wait right there, Siag. Why are you pulling out your sword? Wait, wait a moment. Wa, dash jaya awa. Thereupon, 
In the late night of Rig Foshia, Resan's loud screams echoed. After we finished our meal, I helped clean up a bit. After we finished dealing with the chores, as if in anticipation of it, a knock came at the door, and Resan and Fiasan's backs straightened up. As expected, Resan timidly opened the door, and just as expected, there was Lily San. I'm sorry to disturb you at this time of night. I heard that Mama Kaito San has come to visit, and I have come to give my greetings. Is what I had planned to say, but I had a chance meeting with him just a while ago. The reason for my visit has disappeared, but I was a little curious about the dwellings of the elves, so I decided to continue with my visit. R, yes. W, welcome to our abode. You are Edgen Hot San, yes. And the person next to you is. I see. The lady of the household, Sylvia San, was it? It's my pleasure to meet you. Why yes. We're very pleased to meet you. Whereas Lily San was smiling calmly, both of them clearly looked nervous. Thereupon, Fia San seemed to have realized something, but Lily San spoke first. No, thank you for your consideration. I'm a flower spirit, so I basically don't eat or drink. Besides, I don't want to disturb you by staying here too long. Eh? Ah, uh, no. Yes, perhaps, Fia San thought of preparing some tea, but Lily San read her surface thoughts and turned her down before she could do so. Once again, my name is Lily, bearing the position of the World King, Lily Witsama's head subordinate. This time, through my faithful connection with Mama Kaito San and Sieglin San, I have come to express my greetings. Though I say that, as troubling as it may be, I still have a lot of work at hand. So please forgive me for leaving shortly after. Ah, N no. Please don't mind it. It seems like Fia San's nervousness was at its peak. If it's Lilia San, she probably would have fainted by now, but it seems like Fia San doesn't faint like her. Dot in fact, I have one other reason for my visit here besides expressing my greetings. No, I suppose it would be better to say that I got another reason for my visit. It's about your daughter, Sieglind San. Huh? Yes, Siag Chan. This was news to Siag San and me too, so we both exchanged glances and tilted our heads in curiosity. Thereupon, Lilia San slowly walked in front of Siag San, and announced in a gentle and calm voice, Sieglind San, would you be willing to become my subordinate? Dot what? Your talent and ambition are astounding. With the kind of person you are, I would be happy to have you as my direct subordinate and I believe you have the qualities to eventually become the 8 executive. I will give you full consideration in terms of treatment, so how about it? Saying this, Lily San held out one hand towards Siag San. Re San and Fia San were stunned by the sudden scouting, and I was also at a loss for words due to the suddenness of the situation. However, only Siag San was the first to retract her agitation and staring straight at Lily San, she spoke. I'm very grateful for your kind words. But the only lord I serve would be Duchess Lilia Albert. I will never have the intention of changing that. I see. That's a good answer, holding no hesitations. Lily San wasn't surprised by Siak San's words, as if she had already expected her to say that. Then, smiling gently, she continued, Dot I knew you would answer that way. Would you be offended if I told you I actually had no intention of accepting you as a subordinate even if you had nodded your head? No. It was a test with me in mind. Thank you. I think I have found the answer to what I should be doing in the future. Seeing Siak San's expression holding no hesitation, Lily San nodded once before turning to Re San and Fia San. I see. Regin Hot San, Sylvia San, your daughter is wonderful. She's an exemplar elf. Exhibiting propriety and honorable loyalty. Thank you for your kind words. We are very proud of her. When the both of them bowed our heads at Lily San's words. Lily San turned her attention to me. She's a wonderful lover, isn't she? Mama Kaito San. Dot yes. I wonder what this is. This happiness I'm feeling. I guess it's probably because I'm happy that Siak San has been recognized by someone renowned in the world. I'm happy that my lover is praised. While I was feeling this way, Lily San placed her hand on top of Siak San's head. Dot if it's you, I wouldn't mind teaching you this technique. T this is. This technique is, it's not one to be used carelessly. You could regard it as a secret technique. When you feel your strength isn't enough in the battle to protect the ones you truly care about, use this. Dot yes, after teaching Siak San something, probably a technique that can be used as a trump card, Lily San took her hand off Siak San's head and opened her closed eyes, her pure white eyes that held no pupil, reflecting nothing.
with them directed towards Siak San, Lily San spoke, Fufu, -fu, I remember when I taught Blossom, I look forward to seeing your future, even though it may be temporary, you have been under my guidance, see Glint San, dot yes, you are like my apprentice, well, to put it simply, I like you, if you need help, come visit me at Ekphrasis, I promise to help you, dot it would be my honor, after nodding at Siak San's reply, Lily San closed her eyes and leaked out a rather mischievous smile. Well, apart from that, I would also be happy if you come visit and go sightseeing in our place. In that case, we're really looking forward to your visit, Mama Kaito San. R. Yes, someday, definitely. However, if Lily Wood Sama finds out that Mama Kaito San is coming, she would probably guide you herself, and then, I wouldn't be able to guide you. I also like Mama Kaito san very much. That being the case, Fufu, you could come visit us while keeping it from Lilywood Sama, you know? Eh ah ha ha, I'll think about it. I could tell from the atmosphere around Lily san that she was just joking, so I just dryly smiled and responded. It's kind of surprising though, for Lily san to make such jokes. I thought she might be the overly serious type like Lilia san. Come to think of it. Lilywood San also wasn't quite what I had expected. She calls Mejdo San a muslerid, and she was sometimes quite aggressive, so perhaps, Lily San is similar to Lilywood San. Now then, it might have been a short time, but I will be excusing myself. Mama Kaito San, Sieglin San, Reginhot San, and Sylvia San. If fate allows it, let's meet again. With that, Lily San thanked us with a beautiful, picturesque gesture and left. How should I say this? She's a really kind person. I mean, I feel like I liked Lily San just as much as Lily San liked us. After the rowdy meal and Lily San's visit, Re San and Fear San, who had completely returned to how they usually are, said something along the lines of I'll leave the rest to the two youngsters, as if they were chaperones who sent us on an arranged date, and went to their room. I've already finished bathing, and since it was still too early to go to bed, Siak San suggested that we drink some alcohol. Hey, I didn't know there was a place like this in this house. Yes, my father had a friend who was once invited to play the role of hero and permanently lived in this world, and seeing the porch that he had in his house, father liked it and built the same thing in this house. I see, it certainly is a porch. Behind the house where Siak San guided me, there was a Japanese style porch, though there doesn't seem to be a garden of any kind outside. But still, I don't know if I should say it's because it isn't perfectly identical with the porches we had in our world, but the feeling is somewhat different. Siak San laid out a large cloth, that seems to act as a leisure seat, on the edge before sitting down. When I was prompted to sit down too, I found the entire city of Rigfoshia decorated with trees, and they have an elegant feel around them. Are you okay with alcoholic fruit juice? Ah, yes. Then, here you go. Kaito san. Thank you. Sitting down on the edge of the porch and accepting the glass Siak san held out to me, Siak san gently smiled before pouring some alcoholic fruit juice into my glass. The color of the fruit juice is light brown, so I thought it was plum wine for a moment, but the faint aroma wafting through the air is fruity. It's an alcohol made from ripple fruit, called Rivel. Hey, it smells good, isn't it? I see, Ripple. Apple liquor, huh? What do they call this back there? Was it Calvados or Calvados? I don't really remember which one it is, but it's my first time drinking one, so I'm looking forward to it. After Siak San poured me a glass of Rivel, I also poured some on the glass Siak San held in her hand, and lightly clinked our glasses together, making a toast. Taking a sip, the aroma of aged and elegant Ripple spreads with the alcohol and the refreshing acidity and natural sweetness are very delicious. The bitterness of beer and the taste of sake are delicious too, but this kind of elegant alcohol is also good. Well, be that as it may, it would have been an interesting sight seeing someone sitting on a carpeted porch, drinking alcoholic fruit juice in one hand but, though I say it like that, I don't think too much about it since I was drinking coffee on a tatami mat on the balcony on my first day in this world. Kaito san here, some dried fruits, thanks, thank you for the food, as I'm savoring the taste of the rival, Siak San gently offered a plate of dried fruits, I've heard before that people eat chocolate or dried fruit with brandy as a snack, so trying it out, I felt the pleasant crunchiness of the fruits, and they have the right amount of sweetness that helps mellow the taste of the rival, come to think of it, Siak San, are you a strong drinker, me, so so, 
I guess that sounds like something a hard drinker would say. No, no, my alcohol capacity really is normal. Of the three of us, Lilia, Luna, and I, Luna is the best at drinking. At least, I've never seen her be drunk before. Hey, it seems that Luna Maria San is a strong drinker. She certainly has such an image. On the other hand, Lilia San seems to be quite the weak drinker, though it might just be me assuming that. While I was thinking about that, Siaxan seemed to have read my thoughts, giving me a gentle, wry smile. Just as Kaito-san imagined, Lilia is weak to alcohol. She's exactly the type who gets a dead dunk after a few cups. Ahaha, I don't mean to be rude, but I guess she's exactly what I thought. Incidentally, I don't like ale or beer and I prefer wine or alcoholic fruit juice. Erech, beer also exists in this world. To my surprise, I heard there's beer in this world too. No, I certainly remember seeing mayonnaise and chocolate as well, so I guess it wouldn't be strange for beer to spread out her. Huh? In that case, there might be some Japanese sake somewhere too. Perhaps, Nansan might already have it. Yes, it's very popular in the Symphonia and Hydra Kingdom but it's not very popular in the Archlesia Empire. It isn't popular in the Archlesia Empire? Ugh, could it be because there are many dwarfs living there? That's exactly the reason. Dwarfs like strong drinks, so they don't seem to like beer very much. I see. Are elves not too keen on beer too? No, many of the elves prefer beer. I'm simply not a fan of it. But, let's see. The most popular would have to be wine. As we continued chatting peacefully like that, tipping our glasses and enjoying a leisurely and comfortable time, my gaze was suddenly caught by Siaxan's side profile, illuminated by the moonlight and the pale light of the illumination magic tool. I couldn't help but gaze at her reddish face, looking slightly tipsy from the alcohol, and even added a somewhat glossy look to her originally beautiful face. Thereupon, Siaxan seemed to have noticed my gaze a little later tilting her head with a gentle smile on her face. Dot are you curious about my ears? Eh, eh, er, uh, let's see. I guess I'm curious since they're the defining characteristics of the elves. It seems that she thought I was looking at her ears instead of her face, and Siaxan pointed to her ear. To her long, thin ears peculiar to elves. I can't really say I was captivated after looking at her face so I just agreed with what Siaxan said. I wondered if it would hurt if you were sleeping while laying on your side or something like that. Ugh, I see. However, it's alright. The ears of ourselves are much softer than those of humans. I, I see. Seeing Siaxan's gesture of lightly touching her own ear after saying that, I'm starting to feel like I really want to touch her ears. I'm not sure how to describe this feeling. It might be a little different from the desire to touch a cat's toe bins or feeling someone's breasts but as a human. No, perhaps, it was my desire as a man to touch the soft parts that a man doesn't have. Dot wait, what the heck are these idiotic thoughts on my mind right now? Even if we're lovers, I can't just be insensitive and ask her if I could touch her ears. Dot do you want to touch them? Gfleh, Kaito san. Dot Kerhem, Kerhem, are you alright? Her statement, which seemed to completely see through my heart's desire, made the alcohol come into my trachea from surprise choking me out of the air. I am sorry. I'm alright. So, um, er, uh, does that mean it's alright for me to touch them? Eh? Yes. I would love to touch her long, soft ears, but I'll make sure to ask her again. Since Siaxan is a kind person, it's possible that she only agreed because she cares about me, and that she actually doesn't want to, so I'll strengthen the detection capabilities of my sympathy magic and try asking Siaxan's response. I, I wouldn't like it if it were other people. B but if it's Kaito-san, I'm fine with it. W we love us anyway! Exclamation mark. When I heard Siaxan's reply, I immediately regretted making my sympathy magic stronger. The burst of affection gushing from Siaxan, along with her bashful fidgety gesture, feels as if a giant hammer had just struck my brain. S she's too cute. I, I feel like my reasoning just received damage from a direction I didn't expect. Feeling my heart beat at a considerable rate. I almost unconsciously reached out my hand to Siaxan who was slightly hiding her face. Dot T then, if you'll excuse me. Ah, wait a mo hi I ran! Exclamation mark I I'm sorry? D did I put in too much strength? I thought of touching her ear since she gave me permission, but in the middle of the process, Siaxan tried to stop me, but it was already too late and my hand was already touching Siaxan's ear. Just as Siaxan said, her ears were so soft and good to touch. 
just as if I'm touching marshmallows but. Immediately afterwards, Siaxan loudly yelped and I hurriedly withdrew my hand. N no, er, uh, the ears of ourselves can even read the wind. So, um, they're sensitive. So, please, be gentle. Why yes, I'm sorry. T then, once again. It seems that the ears of elves are very sensitive, so I need to touch them gently. After apologizing for touching her ears too fast, I reached out to Siaxan's ears again and gently touched them. Yes, HNNN. Fewer. They're really soft. I is that so? Nhyu or u. Hyuah. They're smooth and soft, yet elastic enough, and it feels as if they're sucking my hand, making them comfortable to touch. This could turn into a habit, and it seems that she really is very sensitive, as every time my hand moves over her ear, Siaxan makes a small, erotic moan. Somehow, it's kinda making my heart beat really fast though. Eh? Hey? I'm just touching her ears now, right? H however, because of the alcohol, Siaxan strangely looks erotic. T this is dangerous, any more than this. T thank you. Ha <laughs> why yes. Err, uh, um, somehow, I'm sorry. N no, dot, dot, error. Uh, I thought we were talking normally earlier. But I'm so nervous now that I can't look at Siaxan's face. A somewhat awkward silence dominated the place where Siaxan and I stared at each other in silence for a while, before both of us sat back down on the porch, and as if to shake off the awkward atmosphere, I once again brought my glass to my mouth. Sitting at a slightly closer distance than we had earlier. Asterisk 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 asterisk. It's my second night in Rig Foshia. I've been enjoying some alcohol earlier with Siaxan and returning to my room in a good mood. I was looking forward to tomorrow but that mood was immediately blown away. Now, Siaxan and I are in an odd position, sitting on a sea on the edge of the bed, facing each other. I don't need to think that much about why we're like this, for the cause was that we're still sleeping on a single bed. You um, Siaxan. Why 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 yes? Without a second thought, I tried calling out to her, and in response, Siaxan's flinched. Her face turning red, feeling my heart jump seeing her reaction, I continued to speak. I, I guess I should really go sleep on the floor, right? T that's no good. H however, if I don't. Or you 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 The kind Siaxan still won't let me sleep on the floor, but unfortunately, the situation we are in now is very different than it was yesterday. We're now lovers. To describe it in words. The nervousness we're feeling now is incomparable from yesterday. I was very worried, especially in terms of my reasoning, so I thought of talking her into somehow letting me sleep on the floor, but with an embarrassed expression on her face, Siaxan softly spoke. H. However, when you think about it, unlike yesterday, there shouldn't be any obstacles stopping us from sleeping together now. Um, we're lovers. Anyway. Why yes? No, rather than not having anything. The obstacle stopping me now is a much higher wall than yesterday. It's just the two of us. The room is completely soundproofed, and we're lovers. A perfect battle formation developed to obliterate my reasoning. T that's right. We're lovers anyway, so there's no problem with sleeping together. T that's right. No, rather, it's a big problem. I'm begging you here, please. Have some sense of security. I'm a guy too. So shouldn't you not know what I may do? Doing such an act immediately after dating. Even if Siaxan may accept me or even if Siaxan isn't thinking about such a thing at all. As far as I'm concerned, I want to make sure that our relationship is deeper before we proceed towards that. So I'm not going to let my desires get the best of me here. That said, I understand after yesterday that she won't agree with me sleeping on the floor. And I definitely don't want to let Siaxan sleep on the floor. In that case, I don't have any choice but to endure it. I have to hold on to my reasoning and fight through this phase of what could be called a complete siege. At that moment, it was decided that the second night would be another all-nighter. Just like last night, Siaxan and I were together on the same futon. The only difference is that we're not sleeping back to back now, but lying face to face. And Siaxan, who was wearing her sleepwear, is mercilessly damaging my sense of reason. But it's still bearable. If we are sleeping back to back here, and if I were to feel surprised from touching each other's back, I felt like the small thread of reasoning I'm holding onto would snap. Yes, 
This is a kind of battle, a decisive battle against my desire. I would only be at a disadvantage if I were caught by surprise from behind, but if I were to face her in front and stand firm, as long as there are no unforeseen circumstances. Um, Kaito-san. Can I get a little closer? Exclamation mark. The unforeseen circumstances immediately swooped upon me. W wait a moment, you're going even closer than this. No, no. Wouldn't that make our bodies touch with each other? T this is bad, I should somehow try to avoid this. Dot is that no good? N no, it's alright. Go ahead. Dot if she immediately uses that technique, I would definitely fail in avoiding this. The battlefield really is ruthless. Unfortunately, I didn't seem to have the protagonist's status correction. No, was it because I had the protagonist's status correction that she was approaching me? Or rather, what the heck am I thinking about? As I felt my thoughts getting confused, I saw the blanket move, and Sayaksan moved closer to me. Wait, aren't you too close? Isn't that almost zero distance already? I am telling you, that's dangerous. Ugh, she smells good and I could feel her breath on my skin. No, not yet. Endure it, free myself from obstructive thoughts. Feeling my heart beating fast when Sayaksan moved so close to me that our skin was almost touching. Siaxan puts her hand lightly on the center of my chest and smiles, dot I guess it was because you're really a man huh? Kaito-san feels robust, eh? N no, rather than that, I'm quite weak. Isn't Siaxan stronger than me? It was a compliment I've never been told in my life, so even though I was surprised, a little calmly, I asked back. I've been running with Hina-chan recently, but I've never really exercised that much. So I think I'm still considered non-combatant compared to people of my generation. Certainly, I'm probably better than you when it comes to combat ability. But when it comes to muscle strength alone, Kaito-san is better than me. Ah is that so? I have more muscle strength than Siak-san. It's true that Siak-san appears to have little or no muscle mass from how she looks like. But since I've seen her punch Lilia-san and Rhea-san flying, even though I know it's due to body strengthening magic. I don't really think what she said have any meaning. Yes, the elves find it difficult to build up muscle to begin with. We have lots of magic power though, so we make up for it with body strengthening magic. I see, so it's a racial trait huh? Yes, maybe that's why. When I touch you like this, I thought that you really are a man. Err, uh, is that a compliment? Yes, you look manly and cool. With a gentle smile on her face, Siaxan sweetly whispered. I'm not used to being told that, so to be honest. I'm very happy to hear her say I'm manly, though when she said that with her bewitching beautiful voice, I felt my head turning giddy, even though I didn't get more than a little tipsy thanks to Shiro-san's voice, I was still feeling hot. Perhaps due to the influence of alcohol. D do your best. Do your best, me. You should still be able to hold on, right? As I'm desperately trying to calm my overheating head and trying to endure my situation, but unfortunately, Siaxan doesn't seem to be aware of my situation. Slowly, her hand moved towards my back. Siaxan closely sticks to my body. S. Siaxan. Kaito san. Could I be spoiled? For a bit? Exclamation mark. Eh, right here? Right at this time? A Gapmo attack from the usually dependable, mature woman, asking me to let her fawn towards me with her fleeting voice. Stop. Please stop. It's going to break. The final thread of my reasoning will break. Dot why yes. Dot thank you, Kaito-san. A. H. N. 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 Tilda. I moved my face when my name was called, but at that moment, Siak-san's head also moved. And her lips lightly touched mine. It was really just a simple lips-to-lips -lips contact, but it was unmistakably a kiss, and my head felt so hot as if I had been plunged into boiling water. Dot I'm really happy to have met you, and to be your lover, ugh, uh, uh Kaito-san, I love you, I hope you'll continue to be with me even in the future, dot why yes, after announcing it with a happy smile, with a faint blush on her cheeks, Siak-san closed her eyes and tightly hugged me, I I'm already at my L limit, N no, I can still hold on, not yet, I can still hold on a bit more, be a hero, let's exceed our limits, a little later, I heard Siak-san's peaceful breathing, making me know that she had fallen asleep but, unfortunately, I guess I really won't be getting any sleep today. With a soft, warm feeling of Siak-san's body all over my body, I continued to pinch my hands until morning, desperately trying to keep it from moving. It's often said that the greatest enemy is oneself, and today, 
the battle between my desire and reason unfolded. It seems that my reason has somehow won again this time, but seriously, someday, I feel like I won't be able to bear it anymore. Asterisk 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 asterisk. It was the morning of my fourth day in Rig Foshia. I'm now standing in the kitchen with Siaxan by my side. Dot what do you think about this, Siaxan? Yes, it's skillfully made. However, you could have let it fry a bit more. I see. With Siaxan giving advice beside me, I'm making breakfast. What I'm currently making are sunny side up eggs. However, the egg I'm frying now is somewhat different from normal. The eggs are so big. It's almost like I'm frying ostrich eggs. The fact that Siaxan and I are currently cooking is like a thank you to Resan and Fiersan. To be honest, my cooking skills are really amateurish, and I don't think I can compare to Fiersan's cooking skills, but Resan and Fiersan were really happy when I suggested that I make them breakfast. Well, it seems like they're acting the same as usual as the two of them teased us by saying that what we're making is a married couple collaboration breakfast, and Siaxan scolded them for it. It was supposed to have only been four days, but a lot of things have happened. Just like that time with the Sacred Tree Festival, I feel like my day is intense when I come to Rig Foshia. The first day I was here, as I'd become famous in Rig Foshia, I was surprised at how welcoming the atmosphere really was. I later heard that the elite of the elves had planned to hold a big party for the whole town the night I arrived, but, Resan and Fiersan refused for me. I'm really grateful for that. On the second day, the most memorable memory I have on that day would be that I have made great progress with my relationship with Siaxan, and we became lovers. I wasn't sure how to answer her back then, but now, here I am cooking side by side with Siaxan. I feel peaceful and happy. I really think I'm a lucky person to have a lovely woman like Siaxan as my lover. Let's also not forget the meeting with Lily San, whom I spoke to on the first day through sympathy magic, and her teaching Siaxan. After that, Siaxan seemed to have been broken through her doubts and was determined to be able to inflict damage to Lily San someday. On the third day, generally speaking, Resan and Fiersan were causing a great ruckus. The fact that Siaxan and I are now lovers, I guess that's what brought the two of them out of control. But they were trying to make us wear pair tires, trying to show off our relationship to the whole city, deliberately trying to get Siaxan and I to be alone, and were trying to get me to take a bath with her, they were getting very aggressive. Well, for the great ruckus they caused. They received Siaxan's iron fist and scolding but I don't think those two are going to learn their lesson. The past four days has been really intense, and the thought of going home today makes me feel kind of sad. Ugh, they look great. They really look good. Thanks to Siaxan's help more than half the time. The breakfast somehow came out looking great, and Resan and Fiasan happily smiled as we laid them out on the table. And then, the four of us took our seats at the table and started eating our breakfast. Un, I think I did an okay job. Hey, Mama Kun is skillful at cooking too, huh? No, I don't think I would have been able to make them this great without Siaxan's help. That's not true. Kaito-san is skillful already, and after you practice more, you should be able to steadily improve. Thank you. Thanking Fiasan and Siaxan for their gentle praise, we then went on to eat breakfast while chatting. Dot speaking of which, when are you two going to return to the royal capital? Er, uh, we plan to return by noon. But since we're going to return with my teleportation magic item, the time we return is rather adjustable. Eh, Mama Kun, you have a teleportation magic tool? That's amazing. If you're going to use a teleportation magic tool that could transfer you from here to the royal capital, I guess it would be about 10 white gold coins. It would fluctuate depending on if it's reusable and the time needed to reuse it but the price wouldn't be below 1,200,000 R. But beyond that, the techniques used for the teleportation magic tool would be complicated and difficult to acquire. It would be very hard to get a hold of it without costing a fortune, so it would be very valuable. It seems that teleportation magic tools really are very expensive, and the ones that can go back and forth between Rig Fossia and the royal capital are at least 120 million yen. I wonder how much this one on my arm would cost. Err. Uh, this was made for me by someone I know. Someone you know? Kuro. Underworld King, I mean. Pfft. When I explained that my teleportation magic tool was something that Kuro gave me, Resan and Fiersan looked astonished, their eyes wide open. Although they stiffened for a while, 
they started moving a little later. W well tilde as expected of Mama Kun, for Underworld King Sama herself to make you a magic tool. T that's right. I've heard that you're close. Lovers with the Underworld King Sama. But I'm surprised again. Incidentally, father, mother. The bracelet Kaito-san is wearing on his left arm right. Now is that magic tool. Dot a? No, what are you talking about? Siag. No matter how great, clean and wonderful Underworld King Sama's technique is. Teleportation magic consumes a great deal of magic power, so there's no way a small magic crystal like that could. I can understand Resan's thoughts when he said he couldn't believe it. Because, as I recall, the magic crystal used on my magic tool is a substance with a completely new property compared to ordinary magic crystals. Resan's reaction is normal. It's just that Shiro-san is beyond the norm. By the way, that magic crystal was a gift to Kaito-san from creator god Sama. Huh? N no. W what kind of absurdity are you? H he's right, Seag chan The creator god Sama giving something to anyone, I've never heard of anything like that before. I can understand why you think it's unbelievable. Dot seriously? Yes. It's unusual for the creator god Shiro-san to give something to a human being. Or perhaps, it's even unprecedented in the past. When I saw them looking so surprised, I realized once again what an amazing person she is. It's kind of hard to think like that though, as my image of her is an amazing person who's a bit of an airhead. I'll have some fruit sticks as a souvenir too. Why did you just say that now? You know that I went shopping for souvenirs yesterday, right? Why didn't you just tell me that yesterday? I don't know. Dot let me correct that. She's an amazing person who's one heck of an airhead. Things got busy at the breakfast table, explaining things and such, and before I knew it, it was getting close to the time we were scheduled to leave. Well then, there San, fear San, thank you for looking after me for the past few days. Yeah. We also had fun while you're here. Yes, come visit us again anytime you want. Dot you and Siag are now officially together anyway, so we consider you family. Don't be shy, feel free to visit us. Dot yes, thank you. There are some aspects where they would joke around and they would cause a ruckus, but I still think that both Resan and Fiasan are great people. Feeling the corners of my eyes heat up a bit at the warm words echoing in my ears. I deeply bowed my head and said my thanks. Then, following us on the front door while Seag San and I left the house. They saw us off while greatly waving their hands. Incidentally, I decided to buy a souvenir for Shiro San before we left. In some ways or another, I've always been in her care, so if the person in question wants it, there's no reason for me to not buy it. It's just, how do I give these to her? Leave it to me. I'll pick you up tomorrow. No, no leaving things to you without even hearing about how you're going to do it makes me really anxious. After all, it's already been established that Shiro-san is an airhead. Leave it to me. No, like I said, leave it to me. Dot I understand. Please do it the proper way. The eighth day of the wind month, in the Forbidden Lands, in the center of the Demon Realm, a meeting between the Six Kings, which had recently increased in frequency was being held. The agenda for the meeting was to discuss the details of the Six Kings Festival, which was previously decided to be held, and since it was the first time that this festival would be held in history, it was necessary to compare and adjust the basic aspects of the festival. However, just as usual, only five of the kings were participating in the meeting as usual, while the War King Medjdo was drinking alcohol and leaving the decision to cure Muina. So. The festival that each of us will be producing will have a total of six days of festivities, and at the end, we'll have the seventh day of festivities that will be like a big banquet for all of us to get together, making the festival a total of seven days. I see, I don't disagree with it but, there's something I've been worried about since this agenda came up. What about the location of this festival? Putting the five of us aside, if Magnor Elsan is going to be there, we're going to need a pretty open space, right? Fumo. Indeed, my subordinates also had big statues. Dot is this place no good? Wouldn't it be difficult? This place is feared as the forbidden lands for the people of the demon realm because this is the place used for our battles. The residual magic power left around this area is too dense and the species that are sensitive to magic power will be afraid of coming. The Six Kings are currently discussing where to hold the Six Kings festival. Since Magnor L will be the a place of an ordinary size would be impossible, and there isn't much time left before the end of the fire month, 
which is when they were planning to conduct the festival. They prefer a place where the festival can be held immediately, close to a teleportation gate, and large enough for large dragon species, including Magnor L, to participate. Even the six kings who were familiar with the demon realm couldn't immediately think of a place that met such conditions. However, Ashantir, Magnor L, Isis, and Lilywood are discussing this matter with troubled expressions on their faces. Kuramuina, the one who had initiated this matter, opened her mouth with a confident look on her face. As for the location, it's all right already. I've already taken care of it. Kuramuina did. Un. Well, the additional seventh day was added as a requirement to get that place ready though. Come to think of it, you originally said it would be only for six days. As for the place that Isis and the others couldn't think of. It seems that Kuramuina had found a possible location, and as a condition for securing that place, the Six Kings festival that was originally scheduled to be in six days had gained an additional seventh day. Well, it's better to see rather than just explaining it. Let's move towards that place. Saying that, Kuramuina conjured a teleportation magic circle so huge that it enveloped Magnor L and transferred the six kings to her desired location. Kurosan. Can I ask you one thing? Un. What is it? Dot where is this place? Was there ever an island in the demon realm that was so absurdly large and scenic, and even had a gate? Un. This place certainly fits all the criteria. But even I don't know where we are. The place they arrived at with Kuramuina's teleportation magic is a very large island, and the grasslands are spread out without any obstacles all over the place. And for some reason, there are even several gates that the other members of the Six Kings have never seen before. Frankly speaking, this place is perfect, but it's hard to believe that such a large and well-located island exists untouched. This island is located in the furthest east, around the eastern edge of the Demon Realm. If I remember correctly, this area is supposed to just have seas, and I don't think there was an island like this one in that place. Un this island wasn't here until yesterday. Dot what do? You mean? I got this from our sponsor. Dot were there, is it just my imagination? I just had a horrible feeling about this. Specifically, she isn't supposed to be someone who would get involved with this sort of thing, but I feel like a certain top ranked person is getting involved here. By Kira Muina's words, this is an island that didn't exist until yesterday and it appeared today, and it's a place with the best conditions for the Six Kings and before they knew it, there were even multiple gates built here. Just hearing the word sponsor. The other members of the Six Kings had an idea of who the being who could do something as nonsensical as that possible, completely ignoring common sense. Dot could it be, that sponsor is, un, it's Shiro, dot what are you doing, top of the god realm, as they had expected, it seems that the one who created this island in one night is the god of creation, Shallow Vernal and realizing that it is indeed the truth. The six kings, excluding Kuramuina and Mejdo, have stunned expressions on their faces. It's true that Shallow Vernal could easily make an island like that without any difficulty. However, she originally doesn't have that kind of personality. That would help with the six kings festival, an event in the demon realm. However, I'm just glad that the creator god is cooperating with us. I thought she wouldn't care about this matter. Ah. Un. The reason why the festival would be held for seven days, the condition why she would help us out is that she would be going around with Kaito Kun on the seventh day. Well, of course, I made sure to tell Shiro to ask permission from Kaito Kun first. Dot as expected. Of Kaito. Amazing. No, Isis. I know that you like Kaito san, but you just agreed on that reasoning too fast. Although Kaito actually did not do anything, there's already an equation in Isis' mind where thanks to Kaito, Shallow Vernal cooperated with them, though it isn't really wrong in some ways, and thinking about Kaito, Isis has a happy smile on her face. As she glanced at such an Isis, Kura Muina recalled the conversation she had with Shallow Vernal not long ago. Asterisk 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 Sanctuary, God Realm, in the place where the two of them usually drink tea together, Kuramuina and Shallow Vernal were facing each other. Dot so, Shiro. That's why I'd like you to help us prepare a place. I don't mind, but I have a condition. You agreed very quickly. Even though I thought you'd say you aren't interested, I'm kind of nervous about that condition. I want to have a festival date with Kaito-san too. Dot un. Kuramuina, 
wondering what kind of impossible task she would be asked to do, tilted her head upon the words she hadn't expected, deciding that Kuram Yuina may not have heard what she said, Shallow Vernal repeated her words again. I want to have a festival date with Kaito-san too. Dot then, why do you just do it? The Six Kings festival has six days. No, of course, that's if Kaito-san is alright with it. I want to go on a date with Kaito-san for all six days. Dot no. Kira Muina thought her condition was fine, but Shallow Vernal went way beyond her expectations. If Shallow Vernal goes on a date with Kaito for all those six days, her purpose for which she wanted to hold the Six Kings Festival will not be fulfilled, so Kira Muina naturally rejected her. Thereupon, Shallow Vernal opened her mouth again. Dot in that case, you should make it so that we'll be able to enjoy all the factors related to those six days. You mean, make a seventh day and collect all the attractions that were popular during the six days leading up to it? It's not that it can't be done but no. It doesn't matter if it's an unpopular attraction. Please assemble all the attractions that Kaito-san visited during all those six days. Dot I'll ask just in case. Why? It's not fair that other people can enjoy something that Kaito-san and I couldn't together. At worst, it's fine if it was just other people. But make sure to include all the attractions that Kuro and Kaito-san visited. Just Kuro is unfair. Dot. Seeing Shallow Vernal speaking in such a way that doesn't seem to give her any margin, Kira Muina was stunned. Even though Kira Muina had known her for a long time, this was the first time she had ever seen Shallow Vernal act selfishly. H. I understand. That's fine with me, but make sure you get Kaito Kun's approval, okay? If Kaito Kun doesn't want it, you can't do that. Why are you telling me that? You're the one making plans to go on a date without his permission. I'm his lover. So it's fine. Always just Kuro is unfair. N no, saying that's unfair. What's the matter, Shiro? You're kinda feeling strangely snappy. I mean, you're acting strange, you know? Dot no, it's nothing. Under these conditions, I will cooperate. Not wanting the subject to be touched any further, Shallow Vernal cut off the conversation short and removed her gaze away from Kuramuina. Kuramuina herself doesn't intend to pursue this matter further and after discussing the details about their cooperation, she left the sanctuary. Asterisk 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 Somehow, lately, Shiro was sometimes being coercive, or rather, it kinda feels like she's dissatisfied with something. I wonder what's the matter with her? Recalling her conversation with Sholo Vernal, such a question popped into her mind, but she couldn't find the answer. Shaking those thoughts away. Kura Muina spoke. Well, that's why, if we have any trouble regarding the Six Kings Festival, Shiro will help us. Dot shouldn't we just leave everything for Shallow Vernal Sama to do then? It's just when we're really troubled about something, okay? If it's something basic, we should handle that ourselves. Dot Roger that. After receiving Kura Muina's explanation, Shaltia was also convinced, although she couldn't hide her surprise, and the Six Kings, with the exception of Mejdo, began the meeting again. So, regarding the invitations, have you all decided how much you give out? Dot I'll send. To Kaito. To a certain extent. That's also the case for me. Me too. What about you, Mejdo-san? Ah, ah, I let Bakus handle it. Dot I guess that's the right decision. As this is the first time that the Six Kings Festival is held, it was decided that the Six Kings Festival would be held by invitations only. It seems that everyone has already decided who they're going to send their invitations to, other than Mejdo, who wasn't good at thinking about such details and left it up to his subordinates, so that would mean that preparations are in order. Then, assuming that we would send it so that it arrives during the wind month as we planned. As for those invitations, could we leave making them to you, Shantia? Yes, it's no problem with me. I'm counting on you with that then. Then, Lilywood, I'll leave the construction of the establishments to you. Please leave it to me. Magnor L. Develop a transportation means. To help the invited guests who live in an area far from the gates. Um, I'll remember that. I'll let Mejdo pick the guards for the duration of the event, so make sure you pick out the strong and serious children. Yeah. Kuramuina gave instructions one by one, but the last remaining member of the Six Kings. Looking at Isis, she has a slightly troubled look on her face. Isis is better at destroying things than creating them, 
and her magic power of death makes it impossible for her to negotiate with others. But if she doesn't do anything, she would get depressed. After thinking for a moment, Kira Muina glanced at Lilywood, and with an apologetic look, she spoke. Isis. Er, uh, Isis. You go help Lilywood. Wait, Kira Muina. Dot un. All right, I'll help her. Dot. Lilywood, who understood what Kira Muina was trying to say, had a look of despair on her face, but she couldn't say anything to Isis, who was clenching her small fist looking so motivated, and with a resigned look on her face, she hung her head down. After returning from Rig Foshia, I went to sleep in my room. When I found myself in a familiar flower garden. Good morning, Kaito-san. I would like to receive my souvenir. Um, Shiro-san, I have a lot of things I want to throw at Sakomi at. But what time is it now? It's been a minute since the date changed. Well, it certainly is the next day, huh? I did tell her she could receive it tomorrow. But this is just too unexpected. No, well, it's Shiro-san after all, so I guess there's no point in getting into it too deeply. Er, uh, here it is. My souvenir, fruit sticks. Thank you. I'm very happy. However, it's a bit too much. I may not be able to eat it all by myself. Ugh, if only someone would eat it with me. She started to perform some kind of shit. Moreover, the fact that she's sneaking glances at me, together with her usual inflectionless voice, was quite surreal. Rather, this is definitely that, right? Dot Shiro-san, I'll ask this just in case. But is there no option where I can go home without eating with you? None. Dot I see. Well, if Shiro-san is fine with it, would you like to eat with me? Let's do that. Well, guess I'll just think of it as a little evening snack. In fact, I'm somewhat hungry, so I guess this is just right. With that in mind, I gave my consent, and with a light wave of her finger, Shiro-san prepared a table, chairs and some tea. Taking my seat as prompted, the late night tea party went underway. Um, Shiro-san, is something the matter? What are you talking about? No, it's fine if it's just my imagination. But somehow, the atmosphere was different than usual, or rather, I feel like you're a little tense. Dot. I can't perfectly read Shiro-san's emotions, and my sympathy magic doesn't work on her either. That's why. This was just my hunch. However, it seems that Shiro-san had an idea about what I was talking about, as she stopped drinking her tea for a bit and fell silent. Dot I'm sorry for calling you at this hour today. No, don't worry about it. However, you somehow feel different from usual. Even though it was this time of the day, since it was always daytime in the God Realm, I don't think I would have known if Shiro-san hadn't told me the time. However, Shiro-san slightly bowed her head and apologized. Dot why, I wonder? I myself don't really know. It would have been fine if I had waited until Kaito-san got up. But perhaps, I wanted to see your face as soon as possible. Dot did something happen? Something happened, and something may have not. It may have already happened, or it may not have happened yet. What does that mean? Fufu, I don't understand it either. However, seeing Kaito-san's face, those feelings seemed to go away. The tense feeling I had felt from Shiro-san earlier disappeared with the corner of her lips raising a bit as she said this. I get the feeling that she was somewhat enjoying our conversation. If Shiro-san doesn't understand, I wouldn't understand it either. I'm glad to see you're feeling better than earlier. Dot Kaito-san, are you worried about me? A. R. Yes, it certainly may seem a little strange to worry about the near-omnipotent god Shiro-san. But I would worry about someone I'm worried about. Dot. Era. What is this? The atmosphere around here seems to have changed more blatantly than before. Although the expression on her face shouldn't have changed, it somehow feels as if Shiro-san is sad. Dot Kaito-san. Why? Are you a um dot no? My apologies. It's nothing. Dot is that so? Shiro-san was about to say something, but stopped mid-sentence. I could somehow sense that she didn't want me to go into it any further though, so I couldn't say anything else. After a few while, within an indescribable silence, eating fruit sticks and drinking tea, Shiro-san quietly spoke. Emotions. Heart. They're all very complicated things, aren't they? Shiro-san. I have never felt so bitter that I am not omniscient than I am today. My own heart. Is something I couldn't understand. Dot I don't think Shiro-san is the only one who feels that way though. A. Eh? Hearing the words I quietly muttered. Shiro-san looked unusually astonished. Even I don't know myself the best either. Before I knew it, 
I would sometimes find myself doing the opposite of what I was thinking. There are many times I find myself wondering what I wanted to do. It seems that was also the case for Kaito Sanha. Yes, however, I think that those uncertainties were also part of what makes up my heart. It's difficult to express my heart and feelings, but I still want to convey them to someone. I try to do a lot of things to achieve that, but whether I will fail or succeed, things might not go exactly as I want but it was still pleasurable. Things might not go exactly as I want, but it was still pleasurable. I think Shiro-san is confused about a lot of things, not because you don't understand how you feel, but because you're starting to understand. In that case, I'm sure there's no need to be in a hurry. That confusion is also part of who Shiro-san is now, right? When Shiro-san heard my words, she closed her eyes and fell silent. And after opening her eyes, she looked at the sky and spoke. Kaito-san, is it wrong to seek something I couldn't obtain? Is it wrong to choose any means to achieve it? That's difficult to answer. That might be wrong, but that could also be right. However, I trust Shiro-san, so if you were to try to acquire something by any means necessary, I think you have a good reason for that. Would you despise me for that? No, I wouldn't. I may not agree with some of the details to whatever you want to do. But that isn't a reason for me to deny what Shiro-san desires. I don't know what the meaning of this exchange was. I don't even know what the almost omnipotent Shiro-san wants to acquire. However, I think this conversation is necessary for Shiro-san. Thank you, Kaito-san. It seems like I was a little distressed. I'm glad if I could help you solve your problems, but was I able to help you in some way? Yes, as expected, I just can't seem to give up. That's why. I have decided to struggle. You un- Er, uh, are you talking about that thing you wanted to acquire? When I asked that to Shiro-san, who spoke of such a thing in a voice unlike usual, sounding somewhat refreshed, Shiro-san gave me a slightly mischievous, yet incredibly dazzling smile. That is, still a secret. Asterisk 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 the ninth day of the wind month, in the late afternoon of the day, when I was thinking that the wind month was in its midpoint, me, Aoi Chan, and Hina Chan were on our way to the reception room where Lilia San called us in. I wonder what's going on? Telling us to quickly come there. Normally, that would mean that there's a guest but, a guest who wants to see us three? I don't think I can think of anyone like that. The fact that I was called into the reception room, I could assume that we have a guest. If I, alone, or either of the two of them was called, it would have been understandable, but if it was a common guest of us three, it would be very limited. Hina Chan was tilting her head in curiosity, while Aoi Chan had a puzzled look on her face, as if she also doesn't have any idea who that guest could be. In fact, I'm feeling a little anxious about what's going to happen. Reaching the reception room quickly, we knocked on the door before we entered the room. Inside were Lilia San who called us out as well as Luna Maria San and Siak San. Other than them, there was also a cat-eared woman in the reception room. Who could it be? I don't recognize her at all. Everyone, I apologize for suddenly calling you out. N no, Lilia San. Did someone come to visit us? No, to be exact. Along with me, Luna and Siak, she has come to visit for the six of us. A. Eh? Hearing what Lilia San said, the three of us tilted our heads again. Still not understanding the situation. Lilia San, Luna Maria San, Siak San, Aoi Chan, Hina Chan, and me. What do all of us have in common? Thereupon, as if to answer our question, the cat eared woman spoke. I could understand why everyone is confused. Let me explain it to you in order. Ah, before that, I'm Caraway. I'm a Viscount level, high ranking demon. I have come this day as an envoy for the Six Kings. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Ah. Yes, er, uh, I'm Mama Kaito. I'm Kyuzen Okiaoi. I'm Yuzuki Hina. After the cat-eared woman, Karaway san briefly introduced herself. She sat down at the seat Luna Maria-san had prepared for her. Well then, let me tell you first the business as to why I have been sent. I have been entrusted by the six kings this day, to give everyone their invitations. Dot invitations? Hearing Karaway san's words, telling us that she has brought an invitation from the six kings, Lilia San asked on our behalf. Yes. Within a duration of seven days, from the 24th to the 30th day of the fire month, a festival jointly held by the six kings in the demon realm, 
The Six Kings Festival will be held. A collaboration of the Six Kings. That's unheard of. Lilia San was astonished by Caraway San's words, and Luna Maria San also muttered in surprise. Of course, that's the same for us too, as we're speechless, startled by the information that the top of the demon realm is collaborating to do something. Caraway San explained to us in detail. This would be the first year that the Six Kings Festival has been held, and thus, the number of participants is restricted. And she said that it's limited to only those who have an invitation sent by the Six Kings. The festival will be held for seven days, with each of the Six Kings organizing the festival for six days one by one, and as for the seventh day, it will be the day of the festival where all the Six Kings will participate. The venue is a large island in the Demon Realm, and it seems that you can be picked up and dropped off, free of charge by the flying dragon services prepared by Magnor El San. Does anyone have any questions so far? N no, we're fine. Well then, everyone, here. When Caraway San confirmed that we had somewhat understood what the Six Kings festival was, she took out neatly decorated envelopes and handed it to us in turn. In that envelope, you will find your invitation sent by the Six Kings. Though each invitation has a rank. Rank? Yes, there are six types of ranks, iron. Bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and the highest rank, black. The criteria for the rank is simple, it depends on the number of six kings who sent you their invitations. The higher the rank, the more privileges you get and the more luxurious, the memorabilia you will receive. M memorabilia? Yes, to celebrate the first time that the Six Kings Festival has been held, the guests will receive a memorabilia from the six kings who invited them. Please check your invitations for that information as they should be listed on it. W well then, I will start. At Caraway San's urging, the homeowner, Lilia San, opened her envelope first. Thereupon, from inside Lilia San's envelope, a slightly large card with a shiny platinum color came out. Dot wonderful. Lilia Sama has received a platinum ranked invitation huh? It looks like you've received an invitation from five of the six kings. Ah uh, really? Yes. Please open the invitation. Inside are the names of the six kings who invited you and the names of the memorabilia you will receive. Why yes. A. Eh? As urged by Caraway San, Lilia San opens her invitation, and she completely stiffened. After a little while, she began to sweat profusely. Curious about her reaction, we all walked behind Lilia San and quietly peeked at the invitation. Lilia San's platinum colored invitation had the six kings who invited Lilia San and their memorabilia. Just like Caraway San said but the contents were Death King, Isis Remnant, Memorabilia, a mountain that could be mined in the northern area of the Demon Realm, World King, Lilywood Drizzle, Memorabilia, Fruit of the World Tree, War King, Mejdo Agit Spawns, Memorabilia, A Cask of Devil's Wine, Phantasmal King, No Face, Memorabilia, One Holy Sword, Excalibur, Underworld King, Cura Muina, Memorabilia, a state-of-the-art teleportation magic tools filled up with outrageous stuff. W what is? T this. This is Kayu Tilda. My lady? All of them look like they're dangerous memorabilia. No, they're items that aren't on the level of mere memorabilia anymore, as they have greatly exceeded Lilia San's tolerance level and made Lilia San faint. While looking at Lilia San with pity. The next person to open her envelope was Siag San. Siag San's invitation was bronze and she seems to have received invitations from two of the six kings. War King, Mejdo Agit Spawns, Memorabilia, Premium Alcohol Set, Phantasmal King, No Face, Memorabilia, Wyvern Leather Wallet, is what was written there. Perhaps, Mejdo San was praising Siag San because of what happened before, and Alice might have invited her because they had once fought together. Luna Maria San. Oi-chan, and Hina-chan seem to have been invited by Kuro, and Luna Maria-san seemed to be especially happy about it. And a little while later, Lilia-san regained her consciousness and gathered with everyone, staring at me. No, at the envelope in my hand. I am afraid of Kaito-san's invitation. Lilia-san's memorabilia were quite tremendous, but thinking that Kaito-san's would be more than that. K Kaito-senpai, please open it. You un- Pushed by everyone's appeal. I opened the envelope I was holding, and from inside comes an overflowingly high class, jet black invitation. I am surprised, for it to be a black rank, that means you've received an invitation from all the six kings. I had been informed that this time, 
the six kings have only prepared one black rank invitation among all the invitations that were sent to the human realm. Yeah, why do I kinda feel like something outrageous just happened? How strange. I mean, this should just be something like receiving an invitation, right? No, I certainly know all the six kings but, and thus, not only Lilia-san and the others, but also Caraway-san came around behind me. Before their gazes, I timidly opened the invitation. Death King. Isis Remnant, Memorabilia, Ten Books of Long, Ancient Grimo Eyes About Forbidden Arts. Wait a moment there, Isis San. Why the heck is there something outrageously dangerous written here? What the heck am I supposed to do with that? World King, Lilywood Drizzle. Memorabilia, Seedling of the World Tree. A seedling? No, no, wait a freaking wait. Are you telling me to raise this? The World Tree? War King, Mejdo Agit Spawns. Memorabilia. Sacred wine. The heck is that? Just the combination of those words frightens me, you know? This is alcohol, right? Dragon King, Magnor Albascus Lado Kurtzveld. Memorabilia, Dragon King's fangs, Dragon King's claws. Stop right there. Magnor Alsan's fangs and claws? No, no, just one of them would be about the size of a building, you know? What the heck do you want me to do with that? Phantasmal King, no face. Memorabilia. Holy Sword Levitine and Demonic Sword Calamity. What's the point of giving me those things that sound like legendary swords, idiot? You want me to save the world? Nansan had already saved it before. Underworld King, Cura Muina. Memorabilia, a state-of-the-art autopilot-powered magic ship, storage magic box included more than a freaking ship. That isn't something you use as memorabilia, you know? Which world do you use ships as a measure of memorabilia? This world? The heck is that? That's scary. I mean, a magic box that can hold a whole ship is absurdly expensive in itself. GG's, it isn't just on the level of outrageous anymore. H how the heck did this happen? I received an invitation to the Six Kings Festival, the first festival that will be held jointly by the Six Kings in the Demon Realm. What was written on it was, several, memorabilia that made me doubt my eyes. The invitation to the Six Kings Festival brought by Caraway San, the Six Kings Envoy. Completely astonished by the astonishing memorabilia listed there. I can understand why you're surprised. I was actually surprised as well but. My apologies, but may we proceed with the explanations? Ah, yes. Excuse us. Apparently, the explanations are still going on, and Caraway San calmly called out to us, to which Lilia San flustredly nodded. Thereupon. Caraway San straightened her posture and spoke with a serious expression on her face. Now then, on to the privileges. One would be granted privileges according to the rank of your invitation. Dot privileges? Yes. Those who have been invited can bring an escort. Or you could say, a companion along if they were to request for their tickets in advance. I see. There certainly would be lots of nobles invited, so this is a necessary measure. As for those who have received an invitation. It seems that they are allowed to have uninvited people accompany them as their escorts. However, the range of action and number of companions will vary depending on their rank. Bronze and iron ranks are limited to one person, and their range of action is quite limited. Silver and gold ranks are allowed to invite up to three people, and they are allowed to enter all areas of the venue except the central tower. I see. So what about my lady's platinum and mama's armor's black? Platinum ranks are allowed to invite up to five companions, and they are allowed to enter all areas of the venue except the central tower. In addition, the guests with platinum ranked invitations may buy any merchandise in any stall for half the price. I, I can have a discount? Apparently, the platinum rank is the one that sets you apart from the rest and it even comes with a discount from stalls. It seems that this is only applicable to those who hold the invitation and not to those that are accompanying them, but still, that's quite tremendous. Dot and as for the black rank, you don't have any limit to the number of people who can accompany you or the areas you can enter. It means that you can even bring as many as hundreds of people with you. Dot a plus, if you present your black ranked invitation, all establishments and merchandise will be free of charge. But this would only apply for you. Free? Apparently, the black rank is even more prestigious. I could get anything for free and take as many people with me as I want. No, well, fortunately, I don't know hundreds of people like that. In response to me, being really stunned by her words, Caraway San continued to speak with a gentle smile on her face. Next, 
Those with invitations of gold rank and higher are also eligible to participate in the party hosted by the six kings at the central tower on the seventh day. That also sounds kind of awesome. Yes, as the six kings will be attending, it shows how prestigious it is. It is said that less than a hundred people are eligible to participate, dot that means, the only people who can participate in that are Lilia San and I. Being able to participate in a party hosted by the six kings would probably be a big status for the nobles. That's why it seems that the restrictions on participation are much stricter than others. And lastly, Mama Sama. Why yes, I'm told that the six kings will arrange accommodations for the black ranks for the duration of the event. Is there anything written on your invitation? A. Eh? Uh, after hearing Caraway San's words, I looked at the envelope that contained the invitation. And found a card that was slightly smaller than the invitation. Central Tower, Top Floor, Special Suite Room. Dot I'm feeling dizzy. Reading its name, it's probably a tower that is erected in the middle of the venue but. Is that also some kind of public shame play? No, would the others know about it? Well, however. Thinking about that sweet room, is it just my imagination? I have a very bad feeling about it. To be specific, I'm feeling afraid that the room prepared would be far more luxurious and gaudy than I imagined. I suppose it means that the black rank Mama Sama is one of the biggest and the most important guests for the six kings. That's splendid. Ah, is that so? Yes, it's a great honor. Looking at Caraway San who looked a bit excited while grasping her hands together. I could only give her a vague reply. Something tells me this is going to be very tiring again, and as I was thinking like that, I watched Caraway San in a daze as she explained some finer details. After the explanation was over, Caraway San decided to leave the mansion to head to the next location. Though it may not be all of us, Lilia San and I saw Caraway San off at the door, but right at that moment when we were about to say goodbyes, Caraway San turned to me and gave me a serious look. Mama Sama. I want to talk to you about something personal, but do you mind? A. R. Yes. I'm sorry, dot A. Yes. I was wondering what she personally wanted to talk about, not as an envoy for the six kings but, for some reason, Caraway San deeply bowed her head to me and apologized. A. What is this? What's going on? Why am I being apologized by someone I just met today? Dot when Mama Sama came to this world. I was the one who casted recognition inhibition magic on you. Dot A. I was blinded by greed and was very rude to you. It isn't something I can apologize and be forgiven for. But I just wanted to say these few words. Please, feel free to laugh at me for being self-satisfied for this. Dot. Looking at Caraway San, who desperately had her head low and was telling me that it was for her own satisfaction, after a brief moment of silence. I wryly smiled. Dot please raise your head. I don't care about that matter at all. Dot H. However, look, it's not like anything happened to me anyway. If we're talking about if the recognition inhibition magic did any real harm to me at that time, then the worst that happened was that I got lost. That's the reason why I met Kira though, so I'm rather grateful to her instead. Telling her that I don't care about that matter while thinking about that, with her head still bowed down. Caraway San stiffened, perhaps, she didn't expect my reaction and didn't know what to do, dot then, how about we do it like this, I've certainly received Caraway San's apology, and I forgave you for that, so, Caraway San, please don't worry about it either, dot Mama Sama, thank you so much for your courteous explanation today, if we ever meet again, I would be happy if you treat me as an acquaintance you can be carefree with. Dot yes. Hearing my suggestion to let bygones be bygones already, Caraway San slowly looks up. Then, she turned to me and gave me a soft smile that made her cat ears pretty. Thank you, Mama Sama. I'm sure we'll see each other again at the Six Kings Festival, but in that case, please let me know if I could be of assistance. Uh, I want to thank you for your generosity. I would be happy to help in any way I can. Dot yes. Well then, if there's an opportunity like that, I will be in your care. When I nodded, Caraway San got down on one knee and after giving me a knight-like bow, she stood up. Dot well then, everyone, I'll see you all at the Six Kings Festival. Yes. Good luck with your work, Caraway San. Thank you. Excuse me then, with that. Caraway San Light bowed her head again and left with a smile on her face. After she was out of sight, Lilia San and I were about to return to the mansion, when I suddenly heard a small mutter. Dot you're as kind as usual. Aren't you? Dot a. While saying such praise that doesn't sound like she's being sarcastic at all, 
Lilia San returned to the mansion a step ahead of me, a festival held by the pinnacle of the demon realm, the Six Kings. Information about the Six Kings festival, along with the invitations, quickly spread around the world, especially among the nobles and wealthy merchants. An invitation from the Six Kings. It could already be described as a kind of status, especially for those who held a high ranking invitation, as they could even improve the status of the recipient. Hence, Many nobles and wealthy merchants were very busy these days, and the royalty was no exception for this. In a room in the royal palace of the Symphonia Kingdom, Rise, the current king of Symphonia, held an envelope in his hand with a very tense expression on his face. Grasping a paper knife as if he was praying to someone, his shaking hands cut the seal off the envelope. Although Rise had reconciled with Kaito, he still didn't know how the six kings currently evaluated him. Hence. He was still somewhat holding inferior thoughts while within his own royal palace, and this invitation was a chance for him to restore his honor, but at the same time, this invitation could also be a one-way ticket to hell. If he didn't receive at least an invitation from the Underworld King and the World King, his position within the royal castle would become increasingly difficult. Praying that he would somehow be ranked bronze or higher, Rise took out the invitation and let out a sigh of relief so loud that everyone around him could have heard him. The invitation that Rise received is glimmering with a beautiful golden hue. That means that he has a gold rank, and that means that his honor as a king is safe. No, on the contrary, having this gold rank allows him to join the party on the final day, which was more than enough to restore his honor. When Rise opened the invitation, it listed the names of the Underworld King, Death King, World King and the phantasmal king, and noted that he had received an invitation from four of the six kings. Rise is relieved to have received an invitation from the underworld king, which was one of his biggest concerns, but soon afterwards, he found that there's something else in the envelope. A message card. This is. The message only had the words I heard you gave Kaito some advice. Thank you. Written in it in clean handwriting, and at the bottom of the note, it was signed with the name of the death king. Isis Remnant. In fact, although Rise himself didn't know it, his advice to Kaito was known among the Six Kings, as Kaito himself had told Kuram Uena and Isis that he was grateful to Rise, and for the girls, it was a fine play on his part that even warrants a standing ovation, and thus, his reputation had explosively rose. He's currently already on the level where if he sends out an invitation to Kuram Uena for an evening party and other events, Kura Muina will also participate. Granted, Rise only seriously advised Kaito because he thought Kaito was consulting about his sister, Lilia, and achieving this result wasn't his intention at all but. No, you could say that it was exactly because he thought that it was for his sister, and that must be why he was able to give advice that isn't for his own interest at all. At any rate, King Rise of Symphonia was able to successfully recover his evaluation from the eyes of the six kings. Asterisk 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 asterisk. In the royal castle of the Archlesia Empire, Emperor Chris, who had received her invitation just like Rise, opened the envelope with a serious expression on her face. Oi ah, gold rank ah. I thought I would have a silver rank. Seeing that the rank of her invitation wasn't quite what she expected, Chris tilted her head, but receiving a rank higher than she expected is of no inconvenience and actually something that she should be grateful about, so she just opened her invitation. Thereupon, she saw the names of the Underworld King, Dragon King, War King and the Phantasmal King written there and Chris tilted her head again. Dot Phantasmal King Sama? I think I've barely spoken to Phantasmal King Sama though. As for the other members of the six kings that had sent her invitation, Chris had somewhat expected them. Chris is one of Kura Muina's baby birds so she expected Kura Muina's invitation. The Archlesia Empire has a close relationship with the Dragon King, Magnor L. So she also expected his invitation. Chris also had a certain amount of familiarity with one of the five generals, so she also expected an invitation from Mejdo. So far, the invitation came from the people Chris was supposed to have interacted with. However, she didn't understand why the name of the Phantasmal King, No Face, was also written there. Of course, she has seen her at the Festival of Heroes and some other events but she rarely had a direct conversation with that mysterious being. That's also the same case for the World King, 
Lilywood.un There's something more? A message card. On the message card in the envelope. Written on it was dinner was delicious. From Kaito-san's pretty guard. And seeing that, Chris's expression stiffened. Mama Sama's guard. See could it be, Alice Sama? Is the phantasmal king? That's when she realized that the masked girl who was with Kaito when he visited the castle. Alice was the phantasmal king, no face. After that thought surfaced within her mind, she looked shaken, which is very unusual for her, and a great amount of sweat poured out of her face. Dot Alice Sama is the phantasmal king Sama. That means, even that time when I received information that Mama Sama was sighted in the monster racetrack that day. Chris received information that Kaito had come to the Archlesia Empire and that's why she invited Kaito to the royal castle. But thinking about it again, to receive such information was too convenient for her. A subordinate who had attended the Sacred Tree Festival had informed her that she had seen Kaito, whose face was barely known to the public at that point, at the monster racetrack, and that was a really convenient coincidence. Could it be that the information was sent by the Phantasmal King for those powerful nobles? who were vehemently opposed to inviting Mama Sama as a state guest, to not make any particular movements after that. And even those people who just want to watch over Mama Sama. Chris shuddered. It was because she was thinking about how Alice had figured out and controlled all of her thoughts once she acquired such information about Kaito, and what method she would use if she was opposed by the nobles. And no, I may have been thinking too much. Even if she does that, the benefit to Phantasmal King Sam is just. Could it be? There's something hidden within it? If she has read through my actions and thoughts, did she deliberately do it to search for the powerful nobles who would try opposing Mama Sama? When Chris tries to welcome him as a state guest, and if any nobles speak in opposition, and from those antagonistic nobles, search for the nobles on their side and monitor their every movement. Thinking about that, that explains the deliberately aggravating statements she said to Chris at that time. In other words, she was also testing me. While acting as if she was cooperating with my plan, she repeatedly said and did things that were provoking me. That means that her interactions with me. If I had made a mistake in judgment and turned against Mama Sama, perhaps, I would have been. Chris predictions were undoubtedly correct. That's why cold sweat ran down her back. Chris only tried to proceed in the direction of not antagonizing Kaito at that time. But if she had given priority to the opinions of the powerful nobles, if the situation had resulted in any harm to Kaito. Well, I'll be damned. Should I say that this is as to be expected from Phantasmal King Sama? How frightening. I'm completely running around the palm of her hand. As I thought, that person really is the most frightening in the world for me. Moreover, the people that Phantasmal King Sama had in control are all irreplaceable for me. There's nothing I can do to stop her. Chris doesn't know if the great nobles and her subordinates are under the Phantasmal King's command or if they were just requested to do so. No, even if they were under the Phantasmal King's command and the great nobles carelessly made their move and started a civil war, even if she were to dismiss her subordinates, Phantasmal King's other subordinates would undoubtedly be in the castle. If that's the case, for Chris, pursuing this matter would only result in the loss of excellent personnel, and there's even a chance that making this move might incite the Phantasmal King's displeasure. Well. I guess I can think of this as me being lucky to have a bit of recognition from Phantasmal King Sama. Ha! <laughs> I really couldn't match up to Mama Sama. After muttering that with a smile, Chris kept the invitation letter away before turning her gaze to the letter sent by Kaito. Even with the way Kaito acts, he still faithfully sends back a letter back to her, making their exchange in letters last for a reasonable amount of time. Dot speaking of which. Mama Sama would obviously be at the Six Kings Festival. Fume. I'm not really fond of wearing clothes like that, but I guess I'll wear feminine clothes once in a while. Asterisk 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 asterisk. At a corner of the capital of the Symphonia Kingdom, there exists a church, infirmary near the residential area beyond the main streets. In the resting area at the back of the examination room there, a woman with black hair and black colored eyes, a rarity in this world, was sitting on a chair, talking with Via, the head of the infirmary. Dot I think we've exchanged a lot of sentences by now, and I think we're getting to know each other better, so I think it's time for me to move on to the next stage. What do you think? Un, I've said it a million times already, but I'll say it again. Hikari. 
This is an infirmary. This isn't a place where you ask for relationship advice. Okay, could you go somewhere else for that? No way. Other than Veer, I have no one else to turn to anymore. Don't know. I think you have made a terrible mistake in selecting the person to ask here. Seriously, looking at her with an astounded expression on her face, Hikari, Nun, who had her helmet off, looked at her with a relying expression on her face. They had been best friends for a long time, and Nun visited Vera a fair amount of times, and she has come to discuss with Vera about her latest troubles, her love life. It's a nice nuisance for Vera though. In the first place, although she is much older than Nun, Veer has no experience in love, and there's not much advice she can give to her. Still, Nun was looking at Veer as if she was really relying on her closest friend, with a gaze that seems to ask her for help. When she did that, the good-natured Veer couldn't refuse her anymore, and letting out a loud sigh, she spoke. So, talking about this next level, what exactly do you want to do with him? L. Let's see. I kinda want us to go see the opera. Daughter, I'm pretty sure I've heard that before. You said opera, didn't you? That doesn't exist in this world, right? Or perhaps, see one of those films. That also doesn't exist here, you know? W. What about no plays? No, I don't even know what that is. You you Any of the things none had spoken about were things from Earth, that were popular in the time she lived in, and Veer a resident of this world, had no idea about it. Still, she could understand most of what she was trying to say. Dot that means, you want that, right? In short, what you're saying is that you want to go on a date. DDD date? No, you don't have to be that surprised. However, isn't it fine? Why don't you try inviting him out? Dot won't Veer invite him for me instead? Why? Apparently, Nun's problem is that she wants to get closer to her current pen pal. Kaito. Since Veer understood that they frequently exchanged letters, she agreed that it was a good idea to go out together, but she was startled by her pathetic response. And then, Nun, the person in question, turned her face down in embarrassment while her index fingers were poking at each other. You're exchanging letters with him right? Then, why don't you ask him out with that? Dot be but. I, I'm embarrassed. Dot. Hearing the words Nun quietly muttered, Veer was speechless looking at her with a dumbfounded look on her face. No matter how much I was mentally troubled at that time, I wonder how I could have lost to someone like this. Like this? Yes, someone like this. Seriously, how can the former hero be this pathetic? You you are. That's mean, Veer. I'm not being mean. The one who's really mean here is the person who just barges in just when I thought I've already finished treating anyone and can have my really precious break and forcibly asks me for relationship advice. With her eyes looking in the distance, as if she was thinking of her past self, Veer turns her glare towards the shameless first hero in front of her. Well, stop fidgeting and worrying about it, and go invite him already. If it's Mama Kun, he wouldn't turn you down, and end it all with something like a stroll with your shoulders and elbows touching each other. Why yes, I'll do my best. Un. Good. The only role that Veer has in this relationship counselling, so to say, is just pushing her back, and when she heard her cheer for her, Nun nodded, a little relieved. Seeing Nun responding like that, Veer also smiled and brought the tea that was at hand to her mouth. Just when the relationship advice is settled and the conversation begins to shift to idle chatter, Nun's expression turns serious and she asked, Dot Veer, on the Six Kings festival, what are you going to do? Dot. Hearing the words quietly, yet clearly announced, Veer moved her gaze to the table. To the invitation that Nun had brought to her today. After remaining silent for a little while, Veer lowered her head and let out a feeble voice, unlike the voice she had before. Dot I'm not going. I can't go. Dot Kuromusama wanted to meet Veer. Even Veer is. I miss her. Of course I want to see her. However, for all these times I haven't met her. I don't even know. What kind of face I should have when I face her now. Dot. Nun quietly listens without saying a word as Veer tells her, in a voice that sounds like she's about to cry. Veer is an important family member to Kura Muina, and Veer also adores Kura Muina very much. However, she hadn't seen Kura Muina for over a thousand years now. Kura Musama picked me up and raised me when I had nothing. She's like a mother to me, the most important person in the world. However, even though Kura Muina Sama was the most important person to me, I betrayed her. You're mistaken, Yudi. I'm not mistaken. Dash.
Just as Nan wanted to make a follow-up, Via interrupted her with a grieving expression on her face. It's because I, I was an idiot. I made Kiromusama cry, even though I never wanted her to look like that. But because of me, I don't have the face to meet her anymore. Dot but still, if it's Kiromusama, I know that. I know. I'm sure that Kiromusama will greet me with a smile. She will forgive me. However, I, to myself, dot sorry, that was imprudent of me, number, I'm the one who should apologize, I'm sorry that I became emotional, anyhow, I won't be attending the Six Kings Festival, you should have fun there, Hikari, dot yes, they were once enemies who had crossed blades against each other, and now, they were best friends who speak of their troubles, none understands the pain that Veer had suffered over the years, so much that it also hurts none. That's why she didn't know what to say. She didn't even know if it's all right to say anything. Then, as if to regain her composure, Via moved the conversation to an unrelated topic, while Nun, not saying anything about this matter anymore, just continued with their idle chatting. After talking for a while, Nun left and Via, who remained alone in the room, stared at the invitation that was given to her. Focusing on the words under World King, Kuramuina written on it. Dot, I'm sorry, Kuramusama, I'm sorry, an apology that no one can hear. As she spoke those words that she had been repeating for over a thousand years over and over again, some words surfaced within Veer's mind. Even if I knew about Dr. Veer's past sins, I wouldn't lose my respect for the current you. It was only a short time since she got to know him. The words of that slightly unusual otherworlder, he wasn't blaming her for her sins nor did he intend to pry into her past, just very kind and warm words of respect for the person she currently is. Dot honestly, I was happy when I heard those words. Ah ha ha, what kind of stupidity am I talking about? That's not supposed to happen. Muttering quietly, Via slowly looks up and shifts her gaze to the view outside the window. Dot a large amount of time has already passed, for a boy I just met. Just like he did to many others that he might also change me, that's too selfish for me to hope for. Besides, I don't deserve to see Kiromusama anymore. The tenth day of the wind month, on that day, I was in despair. I had expected that this day might come, but it seems that today really is the day. Yes, it happened while I was eating dinner at Lilia San's mansion. Putting the fork down on the plate I was about to eat, I quietly shook my head. Kaito Senpai. What's the matter? Egg. No. It's just that I don't have any appetite. Are you alright, Kaito-san? You look kind of pale. Ah, no, I'm fine. Hina-chan and Aoi-chan, who were sitting near me, called out to me with concern, but I couldn't hide the discomfort that was crawling through my body as I tried my best to reply with a smile. It seems that she has felt my discomfort, as Lilia-san hurriedly rushed over to me. This was my biggest miscalculation though. Kaito-san, are you alright? Are you not feeling well? Ah. No, I was being careless. No matter how much the blessings keep us from getting sick, your body could still weaken from something like fatigue. Luna, get a doctor right away. Eh? Ah, you're mistaken? Eh? This is bad. I felt like the situation had turned serious. No, no, you're worrying too much, Lilia-san. Isn't it a bit too much even though I just said that I don't have any appetite? Or rather, W what should I do? This flow of conversation. How the heck did this happen? My lady, unfortunately, finding one at this time of day is difficult, and I don't think Mama Sama's situation is that serious so. Why don't we just let him take a night's rest for the time being and look at his situation again tomorrow? T that's right. I, I think that's a good idea too. Just for this day, I want to give Luna Marius and my thumbs up. That's a great follow up. With this. Lilia-san would also. That's no good. If we do that, what will you do if Kaito-san dies? I'm not going to die, you know? Eh? Do I really look that bad? It seems that it wasn't effective to the worry what Lilia-san, as she wasn't easily convinced, and for some unknown reason, me, the person who Lilia-san is supposed to be worried about, is soothing her along with Luna Maria-san. Thereupon, somehow, we somehow managed to convince Lilia-san that I will be getting one good night's rest and if I didn't feel better, it was decided that we would call for a doctor tomorrow. Laid down on the bed in my room with a wet towel on my forehead, I began thinking, how did I get into this mess? I, I can't say it, I can't tell them now that I'm not really sick or anything like that. No, in the first place, did I ever tell them that I was feeling sick? Just because I said that I don't have any appetite, 
You're treating me like a sick person? Seriously, how the heck did this happen? As I was thinking about this, the door to the room that had been quiet was vigorously opened. Kaito-kun, are you alright? I heard you were sick, so I rushed over. Dot where did you even hear that from? From Shuti. Ugh. Ah. That's right. I brought you some fruits. Can you eat? A. T. Van. Dash wait. That's a lot. What's with that amount? Kuro bursts into the room, looking very flustered, and reaching into her black coat. She pulls out a large amount of fruit, enough to fill half the room. Then, turning her back to the pile of fruits, Kuro comes closer to me, who is lying on the bed, with a look of concern on her face. Are you alright? Does it hurt anywhere? Should I change your towel? Ugh. No. I'm really okay. Ah uh, really? That's good. Hearing me say that I'm fine, Kuro patted her chest in relief. She then prepared a small chair and sat down beside the bed. However, for you to suddenly get sick, I guess you are really accumulating quite the fatigue huh? You need to get some rest. Dot ah, uh, no, you see. K Kuro. Un, a actually. I'm not really sick. Dot a, I was already at the limits of my conscience. The fact that the other party is Kuro may have had an influence in it as I couldn't hide it any longer and slowly began to explain the real situation. E uh, to sum everything up, Kaito-kun doesn't want to eat a food you disliked, so you said that you don't have any appetite, and because of that, everyone misunderstood? Dot yes, that's right. I'm so embarrassed right now that I want to disappear. Yes, in the end, the cause for all this ruckus is just because of this. In fact, I think it's pathetic since I feel like a young child. But I hate bell peppers, un, I'm just really weak with them. Maybe it's because I have strong memories of hating it as a child, but I can't help but reject that. I was originally apprehensive about it. In this world, there are ingredients with different names than the ones in my world, such as ripple fruit. So, I had been on the lookout, wondering if there might be bell peppers in this world somewhere, but I hadn't encountered them even after quite a few days of living in this world, so I somehow let down my guard. Then, Unbeknownst to me, there was a bell pepper in today's dinner that I brought in my mouth. And recognize them by the taste I hated spreading in my mouth. Thinking about it now, I could have just honestly told them that I really hated that food, but in front of my two junior girls and my own girlfriend, I was too embarrassed to mention that I didn't like bell peppers, and my patty pride got in the way. Dot my bad, the oi chan. Hina Chan. I was looking pale simply because I hated the taste of bell peppers. Dot I'm sorry, Lilia San. I said that I didn't have any appetite, but I actually just didn't want to eat bell peppers. H. Lilia Chan being hasty and making decisions may be a problem, but Kaito Kun, you also need to apologize for worrying about her. Dot un. Well, I'm really glad you're okay, Kaito Kun. Dot Kuro. Kuro looked dumbfounded when she heard me but it quickly changed to a gentle smile. Immediately after that, Kuro's coat tripled and transformed into something like a cooking table, and she also had an apron over her clothing. If you hadn't eaten dinner properly, you must be hungry, right? Hold on a second. I can't make anything too fancy, but I'll make you something. You 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 you, thanks, Kuro. Foo foo, I'm Kaito Kun's lover after all. After saying that and giving me a big smile, Kuro took out some meat and eggs, and started cooking. I didn't see any point in lying down on the bed anymore either, so I got up and decided to watch Kuro cook. The way Kuro cooks seems like she's accustomed to it. She at least looks more deftly than I did, and soon, the room begins to be engulfed in a fragrant, delicious scent. MMMM. But I'm sure it's partly because she's wearing an apron, but she looks really homely. Seeing Kuro like this is somehow good too. After a while, it looks like the meal is complete and Kuro places an omelette with small dice of meat in front of me. The half-boiled omelette is accented by the savory grilled meat and looks very tasty. Now, eat up. Thank you for the meal. I was quite hungry, having barely touched my dinner, so I quickly put my hands together and brought the omelette to my mouth. The soft egg envelops the meat exquisitely, and every time I bite into it, the juicy, overflowing meat spreads a happy savoriness in my mouth tasty. Really? That's great Tilda. The eggs enhance the flavor of the meat, while acting in harmony with the eggs. The meat enhances its gentle flavors. This is really good. I especially like meat. I wonder what meat this is? The chewiness feels like beef, but it was completely different from it. Anyway, there was some deepness in it, and yet, 
It has a mild and clean aftertaste. Stimulated by the captivating taste of this meat, I asked Kuro. Kuro, this really delicious meat, what kind of meat is this? Un, uh, that's the meat of a giant mantis. Pfuyuyuh, Kaito kun, eh? Wait a moment. What did she just say? Giant mantis? When she mentioned mantis, did she mean that insect with two scythes? The moment I grasped the meaning of Kuro's words. A great amount of sweat began to flow down my body. N no. More, I don't want the meat of this world anymore. I thought I've become accustomed to this world, but I think it will take some time for me to become used to this world's food culture. Did you eat too vigorously? You have to eat slowly, okay. You un. W what should I do? The moment I realized it was the meat of a mantis, it felt like the tablewares became incredibly heavy. H however. Kuro went out of her way to cook this for me. I I can't leave anything behind. I I guess I have no choice but to eat it huh? DM in it. If this was going to happen, I should have finished the whole thing first before I asked. As I was thinking about that and trying to prepare myself, Kuro suddenly clapped her hands, as if she had an idea. That's right. I forgot. I heard from Shatir about a way of eating that Kaito Kun would like. Dot A W L. It's a bit embarrassing but information from Alice? The heck is that? I somehow feel like this has happened before. That's right. It was when I was with Isis San. Eh? Does that mean she would do that? She would feed me, saying and with the spoon held in her hand. Well, if it's just that. Anticipating what's about to happen, I handed Kuro the plate. And for some reason, Kuro cut off a bit of the omelet, and put it into her mouth. Eh? Why? Thereupon, she quickly approached me who stiffened at her unexpected actions, and briskly reached out her hands, and brought my face close, HLNN, MGNNHH, Kuro's lips met mine, and immediately afterwards, along with the sensation of my mouth being pushed open, I felt the omelette pushed into my mouth along with Kuro's tongue, CCC could this be M mouth to mouth feeding, T this is no good, I feel like my mind is melting. I feel like the meat within my mouth tastes very sweet. Dot e -er. What do you think? Is it delicious? Eh? Eh? You un. I should apologize to Kuro. The taste didn't come into my mind at all. Or rather, Alice, of all the methods there are, why the heck did she tell her about this? That's great Tilda there's still lots over here. My mouth is a bit small, so it might take us a while. But I'll properly feed you all of it. Dot. Kuro looked a bit embarrassed as she said that with a bright smile on her cute cheeks, but the words she said felt like a death sentence in my ears. Heaven and hell have come together at the same time? W what the heck should I do here? I can't do anything at all. The door is blocked by that pile of fruits, and Kuro is ready to feed me all the rest of the omelette into my mouth. Ugh, this is no good. I can't escape. Asterisk 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 The next day, the eleventh day of the wind month, as soon as I woke up in the morning, I honestly told Lilia San and the others what happened yesterday and apologized. Of course, I was very embarrassed, but when I told her that I didn't like bell peppers, how should I say this? She was looking at me with warm eyes. Making me feel like burying my head into a hole. Moreover, I can't stop people from talking about it, and it quickly spreads throughout the house. By mid-afternoon, it was already a known fact in the mansion that I hated bell peppers. The head chef was looking at me like a parent to her child and asked I know what food you don't like, but do you have a food you like? I've learned that badly faking something can lead to bad things, so I honestly answered that I like burger steaks. After hearing that, the head chef chuckled for a moment and then said, We were going to have burger steaks for dinner tonight, which made me even more embarrassed. I don't know if it's because of our age difference or if the head chef thinks of me like a son, but I feel like she was thinking about an enjoyable memory. I mean, by saying that my favorite food is burger steaks and how I dislike bell peppers, does that mean I have a child's sense of taste? It's kind of sad that I can't deny it. Incidentally, the ones who reacted kindly were Siak San and Lilia San. Neither of them brought up my tastes, and just smiled at me, saying that they were glad that I wasn't sick. However, there obviously are others who are amused. Un, it goes without saying. It's that useless maid. Dot oi ah, if it isn't the bell pepper hating Mama Sama. Dot. Luna Maria San looked really cheerful, as if she was a fish swimming in the waters, and she was like this when we just happened to pass each other in the hallway. 
The expression on her face as she looked at me with a grin feels as if she holds the power of gods in her hands, looking outrageously annoying. But I know that she would have more fun when she sees that I'm annoyed. So, I decided to try a slightly different approach as a way to fight back. Speaking of which, I just overheard this from somewhere. But I heard something about Lunamaria San not being good with bugs. Why are you? What I heard in the course of a conversation I had with Lilia San over tea before. It seemed to be working better than I expected, as Lunamaria San pulled away the smile on her lips and looked shaken. No. It's not like I have anything I'm trying to say anything by mentioning that but. M. Mama Sama, see can we talk about something unrelated to that, eh? Yes. No, you see, I think it's natural that we all have things we dislike and things we're not good at. I think that's an inevitable part of our personality and I don't think it's something that we should be ashamed of. I see, I guess you're right. I was tempted to tell her to remember the expression she just had and the words she spoke just now. But I held back and waited for what Luna Maria San would say next, probably because I thought it would be more beneficial for me. Therefore, it would be unbecoming of a human being to show it off as a shortcoming. S. So, how about the both of us put it that way? Don't you really hate bugs that much, huh? So much that I hope those creatures perish from this world. Don't I, I see. In other words, Luna Maria San was suggesting that, from now on, Luna Maria San will not make fun of my dislike of bell peppers. In return, she's suggesting that I also not make fun of Luna Maria San's dislike of bugs. Just like some kind of truce agreement. It seems that she hates bugs more than I thought. Perhaps, Luna Maria San was afraid that I'll get angry and catch some bugs. I understand what you're saying. We wouldn't interfere with each other about these matters. How about it? I have no objection to it. Anyway. I'm also feeling embarrassed about being teased for my childish tastes, so I'll take Luna Maria San's suggestion. And thus, this is how a strange sense of solidarity is created between me and Luna Maria San. Other than Luna Maria San, it seems that there was also someone else who seemed to enjoy hearing about my dislike of bell peppers. Fufu, Kaito Senpai also had quite the childish side of you ha. Huh? It's kind of cute. Yug, H. Hina Chan. That's not a compliment. You know, Hina-chan happily said that while we're in the middle of our run, something we do sometimes, and she seems to be having fun since this morning. However, I don't feel like she's teasing me like Luna Maria San, but rather, she's genuinely having fun, knowing an unexpected side of me. But please remember this, telling a man that he's cute isn't a compliment. No, it may be a compliment to some guys out there, but it's not a compliment to me. Ahaha, ha, sorry. However. When a guy who seems like he can do everything, seeing how they can't do something or was weak against something, it's great since they make him look more approachable. H. I. Is that so? Ugh, but I feel like there are more things that Kaito Senpai can't do though. You're sometimes unreliable. Gaff Huya. H. Hina chan. That's quite harsh of you. Hina chan's words, which she happily told me, did super effective damage to my tiny pride. I feel like it even dealt a critical hit on me. Maybe this is proof that we've grown closer to each other, but I feel like my two kuhais have been quite unlenient of me lately. It seems that it was impossible for me to have the position of being the reliable senpai. As I was thinking that, Hina-chan shook her hands, looking slightly flustered, and continued speaking. R, it's not like I'm making fun of senpai or anything like that, okay? Rather. It's just because I'm rather familiar with Senpai and I, um, like you quite a bit. A. It's true that there are a lot of things that Kaito Senpai can't do, but just as much. Number. You have much, Mew you are much, more good things about you. You're gentle and warm, and it was really fun being with you. Plus, when it matters, you look really cool. That's why I think that you're a wonderful person. T thanks. Hina Chan's cheeks were as red as apples when she told me that and the bashful smile on her lips was very bright. I am sorry. I, I ended up saying something strange. Come on, let's get pumped up and run. A R, wait. Too fast? Hey, come on, Kaito Senpai Tilda you'll be left behind, you know Tilda. W8. As expected, running that fast is. Seeing Hina-chan happily speeding up, I hurriedly followed her, astonished at her speed which is probably even faster than my full sprint. You un- She's that fast even without body enhancing magic. I guess I really can't become a reliable senpai. Well, 
You could say that it's just like me, I guess. Asterisk 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 asterisk. One day later, while I was having tea with my two kuhais, a topic was suddenly brought up. The event that started it all was a question posed by Hina Chan, as when she saw Luna Maria San bringing her additional tea cakes, it seemed as if something had come up in her mind. Speaking of which, Luna San. How did you get acquainted with Leah san and Seag san? Oi ah, is Yuzuki sama curious about my past? Yes. Somehow, there was this mysterious feel around Luna san. Hearing the words Hina chan said, Luna Maria san doesn't seem to be dissatisfied. Mysterious? Well, leaving that aside, if I remember correctly, wasn't she invited by Lilia san? I remember hearing something like that. I'm more interested in how she met Kuramo sama. When Oi chan and I entered the conversation, Interested in the topic of Luna Maria San's past, I don't know if it's just my imagination, but Luna Maria San somehow had this proud smug look on her face. Ha ha ha, if you all insist that much, I guess it can't be helped. I will tell you a little about my fascinating past. I'm looking forward to it. It feels as if I'm hearing about the ecology of a dragon. Who the heck are you saying is a monster? Lately, I feel like Mama Sama is rather relentless towards me, even though you are kind to others. Don't you think there's discrimination at play here? Please take a moment to reflect on your past conduct first. Indeed, I certainly may have become a little less reserved towards Luna Maria San. I think it's partly because of Luna Maria San's personality, but more than that, I feel that she's somewhat similar to a certain person, so I sometimes end up responding to her with a cold attitude. Well, in a way, I guess you could say that we are getting to know each other better, having this in mind. I listened to Luna Maria San's stories about her past. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Her father had died before Luna Maria was old enough to be aware of things, and her mother, Nwa, had raised her single-handedly. Luna Maria had always loved her mother, who had been kind and warm to her while working as a top-ranking adventurer. She wanted to help her mother, but having demon blood flowing in half of her veins. Luna Maria's growth was slow and her body began to grow only when she finally reached the age of 40. It was inevitable that she would become an adventurer. Under Moa's tutelage, Luna Maria developed her skills and became an adventurer, and in just a few short years, she had risen to the top of the adventurer world. After watching her daughter grow up, Nwa retired from adventuring at Luna Maria's suggestion, and began to receive treatment for her chronic anemia while visiting her doctor, Via. However, an incident occurred. It was about five years after Luna Maria had become an adventurer. Luna Maria was indeed an excellent adventurer, but by no means was she perfect. It wasn't Luna Maria's fault. She didn't get too self-conceited, she was well prepared, and she was in tip-top shape. However, she had overlooked a really small sign, so small that even a veteran adventurer might overlook it, of a mass stampede of monsters. By the time Luna Maria noticed it, she was already surrounded by a large number of monsters. Luna Maria is strong, she is one of the top adventurers in the world. However, she was gradually cornered by the sheer number of monsters generated by the stampede. And when she was ready to die, it was her mother, Nwa, who saved her. Mum, I'm glad I made it in time. I'll handle this, so please run away, Lu Chan. Nwa is a veteran adventurer who has completed many quests over the years. That's why. When she saw the duplicate copy of the quest form that Luna Maria left in her room, from the description written on the quest form, she had detected the signs of a stampede and thus, headed to Luna Maria's rescue as fast as she could. Not bothering to call for assistance and directly rushing to Luna Maria paid off, as she was able to save Luna Maria just in the nick of time. Dot be but, don't worry, mom is strong. Okay? Exclamation mark. Hearing the words Moa said with a smile while facing so many monsters that it was ridiculous to even count them, Luna Maria read the thought held within her words and turning her back on Noir, she started running as she frantically ran through the secluded forest. Large drops of tears dripped down Luna Maria's eyes, she knew it, that if she stayed behind, she would only be a liability, she knew it, that the only thing she can do is to call for help, she knew it, that despite her dislike for it, Nwa drank a lot of animal blood when she was working as an adventurer, she knew it, that now that she has retired and doesn't have to force herself to drink animal blood, 
Nwa no longer has the power she had in her prime. She knew it, that if the situation stayed like this, her beloved mother, the most important person in the world for her, would die. Luna Maria ran frantically, falling down several times along the way, forcibly moving her body screaming in pain. Still, it was a long way before she reached a human habitat. And she would never make it in time. Just as this thought crossed her mind, Luna Maria's foot was caught in the root of a trip, and she had spectacularly fallen. You, 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 someone. Help me. It was a voice so soft that it sounded like she's squeezing it out of her mouth. However, it did indeed change her fate. Un, is someone there? Wait, you're badly injured. I'll be using recovery magic, okay? Luna Maria knew the being in front of her. She's one of the pinnacles of the demon realm that she remembered seeing at the Festival of Heroes. Underworld King Sama Un, the moment she realized that the being in front of her was the Underworld King Kuramuina, Luna Maria jumped up and lowered her head so low that it was rubbing on the ground, she desperately shouted, I'm begging you, please help me. If this goes on, mom will. Please, I'll do anything so please. She understood that her actions aren't just on the level of being disrespectful anymore. She knew that it wasn't acceptable to beg for something from the six kings. But still, Luna Maria wanted to cling upon the possibility that she might grant her plea. Thereupon, as Luna Maria's head was lowered, tears incessantly flowing down her eyes, her hand was gently placed on her shoulder. Un, it's all right. I'm going to help you. So can you tell me what was going on? Ah, uh, you you are, a, monster, Stampede. Mom is facing them alone. I can't do anything, Stampede. I see, so that's why those monsters were afraid. After hearing Luna Maria's story, Kura Muina looked like she was thinking about something before she gave her a dazzling smile. Don't worry, I will absolutely save your mother. Dot yes. The smile on her face, illuminated by the moonlight made her look like the messiah in Luna Maria's eyes. From then on, Kura Muina's actions were swift. She immediately rushed to the place Luna Maria told her, eradicated a huge number of monsters in an instant, and healed the severely injured Noir with recovery magic. And carrying the unconscious Noir, she returned to where she left Luna Maria. Mum, don't worry, she's just unconscious. She's alive and her injuries are healed. Ick. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I don't know how to thank you. Don't worry about it. I only helped you because I wanted to. Rather than that, it was quite the disaster. Wasn't it? You did a great job. It's all right now. Come on, I'll take you home. Dot yes. Luna Maria was relieved from the bottom of her heart to the fact that her beloved mother was still alive. Thereupon, Kura Muina brought Luna Maria and Nwa back to their home. After laying the unconscious Nwa on the bed, Kura Muina was about to leave, but Luna Maria stopped her. You um, Underworld King Sama, un, I'm Luna Maria. I will not forget this debt, I'll never forget it. You don't really have to worry that much about it. I'm Kura Muina. If fate permits, I'll see you again. Yes, as Kura Muina left with a smile on her face, waving her hand at her, Luna Maria saw her off bowing her head several times until she was out of sight. From this moment on, Kura Muina became her benefactor and the one she respected above anyone else. Asterisk 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 asterisk. And well, that's how I met Kura Musama. Hey, I see. I can see why you have such deep faith in Kura Musama. After Luna Maria finished talking about her encounter with Kuro, the Oi-chan spoke looking somewhat moved. Indeed, I think I could understand a bit of Luna Maria Sand's fanaticism about Kuro, the most important person who saved her in a pinch and who was her greatest benefactor. But indeed, it could be said that Underworld King Sama, at that time, was truly like someone sent by the heavens. Her hair shines brighter than the starry skies. Her beautiful eyes that make the jewels seem to be nothing but roadside stones. Her loving and compassionate appearance was both divine and warm as if, uh, Tilda Luna Maria San. You're going to take too long blabbering all that. Can I ask you to go on to the next story? Dot ahem, I suppose. Well then, next would be how me and Lily, my lady had met. If I'm not mistaken, it happened around the end of the year. When I called out to Luna Maria San, who was about to go out of control, Luna Maria San got a hold of herself and started talking again. Asterisk 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 asterisk. 
Luna Maria was leisurely walking through the bustling royal capital as the end of the year approached. She had already reached her limits in physical growth, and was now tall enough to be considered an adult. She has already become a bit of a celebrity in the kingdom as a top-ranked adventurer. And that top-ranked adventurer is currently somewhat bored. Mom's at Big Sister Fear's place. While there aren't any good quests at the moment, I don't have anything to do her. She didn't have any particular plans other than picking up Noir in the evening. As she was walking along the street, wondering what to do, Luna Maria suddenly spotted a signboard. Symphonia Kingdom Martial Arts Tournament. A Hilda speaking of which, it was that time of the year, wasn't it? I guess this would be a good way to pass the time. The martial arts tournament that Luna Maria saw on the signboard was held by their Kingdom Knights at the end of every year, and it was a tournament that one can participate in even if you belong to the Knight Order. It's a very popular event that attracts the best of the best from all over the kingdom. Looking at the sign and thinking for a moment, Luna Maria approached the stall selling admission tickets and spoke. I'll buy one ticket. I don't mind having a standing seat. Yes, oi ah. You look familiar. Aren't you black clearly Luna Maria? Ah Hilda I did have that nickname, didn't I? Is it alright to just watch and not join in? If it's you. I think you'd do well even against knights. Black Lily is Luna Maria's nickname as a top-ranking adventurer, just as Noir is known as the Bloody Princess. She professes her respect to the underworld King Kurimuina, and perhaps, in imitation of her, she always wears a long black coat when working as an adventurer, which earned her that nickname. Although she wasn't wearing a long coat, and was instead wearing casual clothes. Luna Maria was still relatively famous. The elderly woman at the reception desk noticed that she was a top-ranking adventurer. What is the prize for winning this time? It's a dagger that apparently blows out wind. A Hilda a dagger imbued with air cutter magic ha. Huh? It's indeed rare and valuable, but I can already cast air cutter by myself, and having to fight on my day off sounds like a pain. Is that so? That's a shame. If you had participated. This tournament would have been a gathering of Symphonia's three flowers. Hearing the words that the woman said filled with disappointment, Luna Maria's eyebrows twitched. Hey, that means the white rose and red camellia are joining her. Yeah, it's the first time that both of them are participating. My, oh my, I've always wanted to see them, so this is the perfect timing. They're both very strong. Here, a standing seat. That will be three R. Thank you. In the Symphonia Kingdom. There are three people bearing the nickname related to flowers, called the Three Flowers. The White Rose Valkyrie, Lilian Leah Symphonia, the Red Camellia Knight, Sieglind, and Black Lily Adventurer, Luna Maria. Delighted to be able to see the battle of those who were unexpectedly named alongside her, Luna Maria received her admission ticket and entered the arena. The audience is now in a frenzy. This is because Lilian, who has been called a rare genius smashed her opponent's sword with her bare hands and won. While watching that scene, Luna Maria drank the juice she bought at a store. Dot. Her eyes were sharp as she glared at Lillian, who is currently waving her hand in response to the cheers. Luna Maria was enjoying herself to a certain extent in the beginning, but now, she seems very bored. She had a look on her face as if she had been waiting for something to appear. It was a disappointment. That's what Luna Maria thought. Those words weren't talking about the competency of the participants. I see, she's one of those who smiles even when she has that bored look on her face huh? As if she's just a well-made doll. Just seeing her makes me furious. The words she muttered were drowned out by the cheers, not reaching anyone's ears. After becoming the runner-up in the martial arts competition, Lillian was walking down the aisle of the arena after responding to the praise she was receiving. It was supposed to be a corridor for participants and anyone who wasn't a participant of the tournament wasn't supposed to be there. However, in front of the path Lillian walked. She saw a woman with hair as blue as the skies standing in front of her. Dot you are? How did you get here? I have lots of tricks. Well, putting that aside. Can I ask you something, royal princess? Dot what is it? Was it fun? Eh? Hearing Luna Maria's words, Lillian tilted her head as if she didn't understand what she meant. Did the surrounding voices place so much pressure on your shoulders that you forgot how to relax? And responded with a pasted on smile. You must not be that popular huh, royal princess. Wah, wow. what are you suddenly? I hate it. Little brats like you who's trying to do something beyond your ability. If you don't know how to relax, you'll break sooner or later, you know? Dot. 
at Luna Maria's somewhat belligerent words, Lillian also looked at her somewhat sharply. Their gazes crossed in silence, as if they were probing each other. A few moments later, Luna Maria let out a sigh. Dot well, no matter what me right now says, I'm sure it won't enter your ears. Though I guess, that's for now. I don't understand what you are trying to say. My name is Luna Maria. Please remember it, because next time, I will definitely be there to help you. Dot I never asked you to help me, nor do I see any reason for you to help me. Yes, you didn't ask me to help you. I want to help you, so I'll do what I want. That's all there is to it. Well then, see you soon, royal princess. After saying this, Luna Maria turned her back on Lillian and walked off, with her hand lightly waving goodbye. Dot my name is Lillian. I see no reason to call you by your name right now. Boring royal princess! Exclamation mark. Staring at Luna Maria's back as she disappeared without looking back, Lillian felt an inexplicable annoyance. And thus, this was the beginning of a new relationship between two people who would later become the best of friends. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Our first contact went something like that. Luna Maria San, it seems like you also had the disease I once had. Disease? What are you talking about, Mama Sama? Eh no, I'm talking about your words when you first met Lilia San. I once had the disease that many boys and girls had contracted during their adolescence, creating that dreaded ghost relic known as the documents of the jet black knees. For Luna Maria San to actually have contracted the same disease, I'm starting to feel some kind of kinship with her. As I was having such a thought in mind, for some reason, Luna Maria San proudly puffed out her chest. Even if it's me saying this, I think I had made a cool decision at that time. I think I could have pushed the mysteriousness a bit more though. Dot it seems like you're still afflicted with that disease huh? Why did you ignore it until it became this bad? You un- Why are you looking at me with such pity, Mama Sama? Eh uh, I'll continue with the story. Yes, if the time comes when it hurts, you can always talk with me. Okay, what the heck is this? Even though it sounds like you're worried about me, why am I strangely feeling angry? Asterisk 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 asterisk. Luna Maria suddenly appeared in front of Princess Lillian and left words that seemed to suggest something. But for the next year, Luna Maria never appeared in front of Lillian, and Lillian somehow forgot about her. And exactly a year later, at the yearly martial arts tournament, Luna Maria showed up. An incident occurred. Division commander. What's the matter? Seeing the female knight, her subordinate, suddenly barge into the waiting room, Lillian curiously asked, D Deputy Sieglind has lost. Wow, Sieg did? That's impossible. Who in the world? Lillian and Sieglind have a fighting strength that is unmatched not only within the knight order, but even within the whole nation. Lillian was well aware of this, and thus, she thought that she would be fighting Sieglind in the finals again this year. However, her expectations were overruled, making Lillian wonder who her opponent was. The only person she could think of that could defeat Sieglind was the Knight Order's commander herself. However, the Knight Commander has already been inducted into the Hall of Fame after winning the tournament for ten consecutive years in the past, and wasn't supposed to be participating in this year's martial arts tournament. It's the Black Lily. The Black Lily adventurer Luna Maria. Luna. Maria. When he heard the name spoken by her subordinate, the blue-haired woman she had met came to her mind, making her grip on her sword spontaneously tighten. Just as she was about to ask for more information, Sieglind returned to the waiting room, assigned to the second night order. I have returned. I'm sorry, Lillian. I lost. Yes. I heard about it just now. Is she really that strong that she defeated you? That black lily? Rather than strong, I think it would be more accurate to say that she was incredibly skillful. I had been completely suppressed. Unlike knights, adventurers often work in small groups, and I've heard that the better the adventurer, the more versatile they are. And she was exactly the epitome of versatility. I don't know if she had seen through my combat habits but the fight never swung in my favor at all. Dot she's that powerful huh? Lillian was well aware of Sieglind's strength. That's why she couldn't believe that Sieglind had been suppressed. However, as she continued to listen to her, she understood that Lunimeria was incredibly strong. Sieglind's trump card is endowment magic. She had heard how Lunimeria had seen through when she would activate her trump card, if the situation called for it, 
she would dare abandon her weapon and switch to another one, and how she performed a brilliant feat of interrupting Sieglin's spell casting the moment when she activated it. Be careful, Lillian. You may be far more powerful when it comes to pure physical ability, but you're facing a frighteningly versatile opponent. It's better to go into this match thinking that you're outmatched in technique. I understand. After nodding earnestly to Sieglin's words, Lillian picked up her greatsword and headed for her own match, the finals of the martial arts tournament. Standing in front of Lillian, who had smoothly won her way up to the finals, was the person she had expected after she defeated Sieglind, Lunamaria. Behind Lunamaria, who held a short spear in one hand and a shield in the other, is a large number of weapons such as swords and axes propped up on the ground. In martial arts tournaments, the use of magic boxes is prohibited during matches. Therefore, people like Lunamaria, who switch between multiple weapons depending on the situation, have to take them out of the magic box beforehand and leave them on the ground. Seeing Lunamaria like that, Lillian understood. Recognizing that it was as Sieglin said, that she would be a troublesome opponent, she quickly readied her great sword. A year ago, Lunamaria had a lot of things to say, but standing in front of Lillian, she just sharpened up and didn't say a word. However, the moment the referee announced the start of the match, Luna Maria spoke. It's been a year, hasn't it? Royal Princess. Dot didn't I tell you my name back then? Uh, Hilda yes. Yes, I remember that. It was Garian or something like that, right? What great parents you have, giving an appropriate name to a crazy muslerid. Dot. Lillian doesn't have high tolerance to being agitated. This is because she is a princess. Someone who usually shouldn't be spoken ill right before her. Therefore, at Luna Maria's words, a vein popped out of Lillian's forehead. Are you ready? Don't wanna hear your gibbers, so let's just finish this already. Ro, dash Al, dash Bryn, says. You, seeing Luna Maria's irritating smile, Lillian kicked the ground with her whole body gushing with lightning like magic power, and burst forth towards Luna Maria, approaching with a speed that could be described as tremendous. Lillian appeared in front of Luna Maria, and fell into the pit that Luna Maria was secretly digging with her magic power while she was taunting her. Pfft, cute kaku. Ahahaha, you beautifully fell into it. This is just great. Hey, how do you feel now? Acting cool while blabbing things like, Are you ready? Only to fall into a pit like a brainless fool. This certainly is a story you'd like to hear. Hearing Luna Maria's agitating words, as if she's telling her that she acted just like she thought. Inside the pit hole, Lillian's body shook in anger. And then, in a fit of rage, she jumped out and tried to get out of the hole. And smashed her head on a wall of air that seemed to act as a lid on that hole. Tilda. I don't know if I should say you're simple-minded or just a straightforward fool. But you're trapped just as I want you to be. T this is unforgivable. This cowardliness is absolutely unforgivable, with a look of rage on her face, Lillian's sword flashed, shattering the wall of air and leapt out of the hole, sword at the ready, the intent of not letting down her guard anymore dwells within her eyes, dot what a naive fool, you are, seriously, you are quite naive, didn't you realize it, the reason why I made you fall into a pit, what are you, too late, look behind you, I've already finished preparing my special technique, what did you say, hearing Luna Maria's words, Lillian hurriedly looked behind her, only to find no special technique happening behind her, I lied, where, thereupon, Luna Maria's drop physic explosively struck Lillian's defenseless back, blowing her away, dot why you coward, I'd like it if you call it strategy, the means doesn't really matter as long as it ends up in a win after all, Lillian is now so angry that the vein on her forehead looked like it was about to pop, but still, calmly holding the great sword in hand, she fired some magic bullets, and confirming that there are no pitfalls on the ground, she kicked off the ground again, but her feet was quickly pulled down by grass that had wrapped around her feet before she knew it, huh? A, eh? surprised that she was trapped again, Lillian tripped on the ground. When she noticed it, Luna Maria was standing right before her, greatly brandishing her hand, and for some reason, she was holding a pie covered with white cream. Nice angle, I'll gratefully accept it. Why is a peep for you? With the pie neatly smashed on Lillian's face. Her face turned completely white, while an indescribable silence flowed through the arena. Lillian wiped her face with her sleeve and loudly shouted, What are you laughing at? There's no way I'll forgive you for this. Foo-foo-foo, 
Let's see you do that. The expression on Lillian's face was something that the audience, including Sieglind, have never seen before. In both good and bad ways, Lillian has always been quite mature. She never made an emotional outburst like this before. But what about now? Irritated, Lillian angrily shot towards Luna Maria. She's supposed to be angry. But she looked like she was having fun. You're pretty good, aren't you? I guess I don't have any choice but to show you the greatness of my tunfa techniques. A kick. Hey, you're not even using that tunfa. I'm using it. For you to not understand it, you really are a little brat. I'm not a little brat. As she taunted Lillian, Luna Maria fought her by changing one weapon after another. While Lillian struck her sword head on, as if to strike her words away, they looked as if they were close friends fighting over something trivial. After exchanging blows for some time, seeing Luna Maria switch her weapon to a spear, Lillian slightly smiled. Using the spear thrust towards her as a foothold, she leapt and held her great sword high above her with an innocent smile on her face, as if her prank had succeeded when she saw the surprised Luna Maria. Seeing Lillian like that. Luna Maria smiled. That's right. That's the face I want to see. Seeing the two of them smiling even when they're fighting, Sieglind looked somewhat envious. Got you. Naive. Wow. As Lillian's great sword swung down towards her, Luna Maria threw her weapon away, and caught Lillian's sword with her fists. That sword catching using her fists was something Lillian has shown in the tournament a year ago. Even though she copied her move. Luna Maria doesn't have the physical strength to break the sword. She herself knew this, that's why Luna Maria wrenched Lillian's sword to the side to break her stance. If Lillian had been on the ground when she made such a strike, it would have been impossible to break Lillian's stance due to the difference in strength. But being in midair, Lillian couldn't fight back. With no sword to block strikes, a kick was slammed into Lillian's body, blowing her away. However, it didn't seem like she received that great of a damage. As she quickly stood up with a smile, dot I'll get you next time, foo foo. Now isn't that a good smile on your face, Lily? L Lily? Your name is Lillian, so Lily. It's a nickname. It's a trend in the city to call each other by nicknames. Well, I guess a clueless princess wouldn't know about it. I know what nicknames are. I know it, okay. I'm telling the truth. I am even calling Siag Siag. Lillian, who was pissed off at Luna Maria's taunts somehow looked childish. It was as if the true nature that she was suppressing as a princess had come out. Well, I lied about it being a trend. T this freaking woman. I'm going to beat you up. Get your face ready, Luna. Luna. Luna ha. Huh? Not bad. All right, come at me, Lily. Here I go, Luna. With her great sword at the ready again, Lillian was definitely smiling as she headed towards Luna Maria. Forgetting about how she should act as a princess forgetting all the eyes around her. She looked as if she was enjoying the first fight of her life. Asterisk 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 Dot that was cowardly. Don't you think, Luna-san? Listen here, Yuzuki-sama. In battles, the winner is justice and the loser is evil. Everything is good if it's for victory, no matter what means you used to achieve it. Hearing Hina-chan's words in response to the details of her battle against Lilia-san, Luna Maria-san responded with a smug look on her face. Come to think of it, Luna Maria-san, a quarter of your blood was that of a vampire, right? Yes, that's right. Can't you use some kind of vampire-like abilities? That was a question that happened to occur in my mind, but Luna Maria-san looked a little troubled. If you're asking if I can use it, I can. I can drink blood and for a short period of time. I can perform physical feats far beyond normal, and even if it's just a bit, I can even manipulate blood. However, just like my mother, I don't really like drinking blood either. Being a quarter vampire, drinking blood isn't necessary for me. And I don't really want to do that. I do carry some in case of emergencies though. After saying that, Luna Marius-Ann pulled out her magic box, took out a vial with its contents not visible, and showed it to us. From the way she was talking. I guess there was blood inside. Well, that's why I don't really use it that much. Speaking of which, Luna-san mentioned how you're a quarter human, a quarter elf, and a quarter vampire. But what's the final quarter in your blood? Hearing a Oi-chan's question, Luna Maria-san looked away with a slightly reluctant look on her face. Dot can I just not say it? N no, you don't have to force yourself if that's unreasonable. Dot werewolf, Luna Maria-san, who seemed reluctant to say it told me that the final quarter in her blood, 
was werewolf, er, uh, werewolf, those that transform on nights with a full moon, yes, however, it's not actually at full moons, but during a certain day when their magic power is overflowing, do you also turn into a werewolf at those times, Luna Maria San, no, um, no comment, the only thing I'll say is that I'm a quarter, so I won't turn into a complete wolf form, the way she said it, it sounds like a part of her body would turn into a wolf form. I guess what she meant is that during a certain day when her magic power was overflowing, a part of Luna Maria San's body would become that of a wolf. I guess she doesn't want people to know that too much. I am sorry for asking such a strange question. I'm also sorry for delving too much into it. No, don't worry about it, Kuzanoki Sama, Mama Sama. I'm sure you'll eventually find out about it. Now, let's continue with the story, saying that. Luna Maria San lightly clapped her hands as if to change the topic, and she continued talking about the story from her past. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Both Luna Maria and Lillian, who had exchanged so many strikes with each other that it could be called an even match, looked exhausted as they faced each other with their weapons at the ready. It won't be long before the battle is settled. The moment Lillian, who is a participant of this battle, as well as the audience, thought of this, Luna Maria smiled, dot I guess that's enough, what is, it means I've already achieved my goal, I forfeit, wow, nonchalantly raising her hand and declaring that she gives up, Luna Maria started collecting her weapons lying around the stage and put them into her magic box, after a few moments, Lillian came to her senses and picking up a nearby axe, she held it out to Luna Maria and spoke, dot seriously, what in the world are you thinking about? Ah, uh, thanks. It is as I said. I've already achieved my goal. Rather, I would have finished it quickly if I had fought Lily in the first round. But since we were in different blocks, I have no choice but to go through to the finals. I'm not really that interested in winning this tournament. Dot you really are. Hearing Luna Maria say such a thing with a bright smile on her face, Lillian was about to say something but Luna Maria spoke, as if to interrupt her. Lily. Was it fun? Dot yes, I was quite irritated at first, but after that irritation disappeared, I felt refreshed. Then I'm glad. It seems like you've also relaxed. Dot a, eh? you must have thought you were quite admirable huh? As a princess, you have to carry the expectations of those around you and behave in a manner appropriate to your position. I'm sure you thought that such actions were right. But you see, people aren't designed to live by straining themselves all the time. If you're too tense, you're bound to be ripped apart somewhere. I believe that sometimes, one needs to forget about what others think and let your stupidity move your actions. Dot Luna. Those were words Luna Maria understood from experience. When Luna Maria first became an adventurer, she was in a hurry. She wanted to become a full-fledged adventurer as soon as possible so that she could make things easier for her mother. And thus, she completed her requests at a fairly high pace, and was even willing to tackle difficult quests. However, her impatience narrowed her vision, and ignoring the unease whose identity she would have realized if she just asked a veteran. Which resulted in her, exposing her mother in danger. It's alright, you can bring out your own personality more. Be the Lillian you want to be, instead of the Princess Lillian the people wanted you to be. I don't mean to say that you shouldn't care about others anymore, but I think it's important to be yourself. If you do that, there will naturally be people who want to follow you regardless of your position as a princess. Dot is that so? But if I do that, of course, it will be alright. One's position is nothing but an external position. At least, to me, the innocently smiling Lily while fighting just now was more desirable than the royal princess I saw a year ago. After telling her such in a gentle voice, Luna Maria finished putting away her weapons, stood up, and with a light wave of her hand, she turned her back on Lillian and walked away. Dot Luna. What is it? Thank you. For helping me. For helping Lillian to get out of the cage called being the princess. It's just like I told you. I want to help you, so I'll do what I want. Dot will we meet again? I guess so. Well, when that happens, let's have some tea together. We're friends now. So even if I have to force you, I'll make sure that you can relax. Dot yes. Looking back once at Lillian, who looked happy at being called a friend. Without saying anything else, Luna Maria left, leaving definite warmth in the heart of the girl named Lillian. Asterisk 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 asterisk. And then, 
As Lilian welcomed the new year with a new mentality in mind, Luna Maria suddenly appeared in front of her, and with that, assigned to the second division of the Royal Knights, I'm Luna Maria. I look forward to working with you from now on, huh? A. L. Luna. W. Wise. An adventurer here? I quit being an adventurer. Well Tilda if Lily tells me a scouting line like will we meet again? I guess it can't be helped. As a top ranked adventurer, it sure is easy to get a special recommendation Tilda. Eeyah. No, I'm not planning to scout you back then, I just mean meeting in a normal way. Eeyah. They met again too soon. Lillian was simply astonished to see Luna Mary quit her job as adventurer, something she had done for so many years that she had even earned a nickname and started over as a knight. However, despite her astonishment, the joy on her face was something she couldn't hide. Asterisk 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 asterisk. While Luna Maria became a member of the Knight Order, becoming completely familiar with her new lifestyle, Sieglind, who was training her subordinates, stopped her hand and moved her gaze when she felt someone's presence. Luna, hi. I it's just light mischief. What light mischief? I will definitely not forgive you today. This scenario has already become a familiar scene for the members of the second division. Brandishing her sword, Lillian would chase after Luna Maria, who had been playing pranks on her ever since she joined their group. It is a scene that has become so familiar that the second division became known for this scene. Dot there it did again her huh? division commander and Luna Maria San. Yes. They really do get along well. Looking at the two chasing each other with a kind expression on her face, Sieglind responded to her subordinate's words. Luna Maria's presence had a very positive effect on Lillian. Whenever Luna Maria recognizes that the things Lillian carries on her shoulder were difficult for her, she would tease Lillian in a variety of ways so that she would relax. Thanks to this, Lillian isn't as stiff as she used to be becoming more friendly and popular with her subordinates. Lillian has become so popular these days that people are even saying that she should be made the king or the knight commander. Luna Maria's presence has also changed Sieglind's way of thinking. Until now, Sieglind had tried to be Lillian's friend, respecting each other's intentions while improving side by side. However, rather than a friend, she realized that she had instead been trying to become her rival instead. However, what Lillian needed wasn't a rival, but someone she could laugh with. After realizing this thanks to Luna Maria, Sieglind also began calling Lillian Lily, spending more time chatting with her rather than talking about stuff regarding work. Ugh, Sieg, just the girl I want to see. Please help me. Dot Luna, thank you. You have changed me in many ways. I really appreciate it. W what's with the sudden words of gratitude? No. I just thought that it would be nice to have a little fun every now and then. Hiding behind Sieglin's back to escape from Lillian. Sieglin spoke to Luna Maria, who she was now close enough to call her best friend, in a gentle manner. And quickly going towards Luna Maria's back, she bound her arms from behind. Now, Lily, I've caught her, do it now. Nice, Sieg. Eh, what a cruel betrayal this is. You're even ganging up on the helpless me. Couldn't you call this bullying already? Dot putting aside you stupid commentaries, are you ready, Luna? Dot Fuggy, dash Jaya Awah. Before they knew it, she, Luna Maria, has become an irreplaceable presence for both Lillian and Sieglind. She, who always tries to be an equal friend to the both of them, was quite dazzling. And a very warm person for the both of them. Asterisk 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 asterisk. In a room in the royal castle, Luna Maria was bowing to illness, a maid rumored to be the most skilled in the castle. Dot teaching you hu you you you. I don't really mayend, but are you going to be a maeu aid? Yes, I intend to. I was stripped of my knighthood after all. I heard that you took the blau aim so that my lady and Siegle and won't be stripped of their knighthood through you. What? I wonder what you're talking about? I just summarized the information objectively and reported the most obvious fact that I was the biggest factor for not noticing that incident. The way you said I it makes it easy for people to misunderstand and those two were being overwhelmed with lots of things already. So there's no need for them to carry unnecessary burdens like taking responsibility. It's not like I wanted to be a knight in the first place nor did I feel that proud being one. What they were talking about was the recent incident where the second division had set up camp at the site of a mass monster outbreak. The incident, in which the deputy division commander was seriously injured, 
was understood by those knowledgeable to have been a setup. But be that as it may, someone needed to formally take responsibility for causing an incident that could have annihilated an entire division with one wrong move. In response, Lunamaria directly spoke to the king, and fortunately, being that there were no deaths, and it was settled in the form of Lunamaria's withdrawal from the Knight Order. Of course, this was kept a secret from Lilian and Sieglind, but Rise had also encouraged Lilian to quit the Knight Order and become a Duchess instead. This publicly looked like a punishment for Lilian, but it was actually to protect her from the people who had set them up. However, since Lunamaria took the actual responsibility for this incident, the government provided various assistance to Lilian in setting up her duchy. Perhaps, Lilian may have realized that Luna Maria had taken responsibility because of the lightness of her punishment. However, she didn't have the time to think about it now. And so, becoming a maid, right, you do knew that my lady would also need people in charge of the mansion's security, right, dot Lily is very unstable right now. Sieg also feels quite responsible, but more than that. That girl blames herself. That's why she needs someone to stand by her side and support her. Why are you going that through? Well, that's because I want to. Dot I understood. And if you're fine with me, I will teach you what I can. Thank you very much. Hearing that she agreed to teach her the ropes of being a maid, Luna Maria deeply bowed to illness. She then went to Lilian's room deciding to discuss with her the details later. In the luxurious room that was typical of a princess, she saw Lilian with her head down, seemingly packing her things. Dot Lily, what are you doing? Your hands ain't moving, you know? Dot Luna, what am I supposed to do? All of it was my fault. If only I had been more firm with them, Siak wouldn't have. Hearing Lilian's words as she spoke with her head down, Luna Maria slightly smiled and resolutely slapped her on her cheek. Ouch, wait, even though you aren't using body strengthening magic, why the heck am I the one who got hurt? Dot Luna, ahem, how long are you going to dwell on the past, idiot Lily? Exclamation mark. All right, listen here, okay? Siag is not dead, she's alive. Stop thinking about what you should have done, just think about how to heal Siag's wounds. You can pretend to be the tragic heroine all you want. But that won't change anything. Hearing Luna Maria's yell, Lilian became astounded. And grasping Lilian's shoulders tightly, Luna Maria continued. There must be a way out there. A way to cure Siag. It's all right, I'll be there with you. With the two. No, with the three of us working together, we should be able to find it. Dot are you going to follow me? Luna should still be in the Night Order. And you also have your mother. I quit the Night Order. Not like I'm that obsessed with being in that group. As for, Mom, well, I'll be expecting a salary, okay, my lady? Dot. When Lillian saw Luna Maria's bold smile, Lilia relaxed and smiled as well. Foo. Foo foo. I guess that depends on your work, don't you think? Whoa, now you said it. Well, you better be ready. There will come a day where you will pull my leg and scream I can't do this without you, Luna. Ahaha. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it then. Luna. Yes. Now then, let's start packing. We don't have much time, do we? As if to change the subject, Luna Maria stood up and started setting up the luggage in the room. Looking at her back, Lillian quietly muttered, Dot I'm really glad that Luna is here. Though I guess it's too late to say it now huh? Especially at a time like this. I can't do this without you. Dot Un. Did you say something? No, I didn't say anything. Ugh, look here, Lily. It's one of those toys back then. How nostalgic. I used to have one of these, you know. Let's play a bit. Didn't you say we didn't have much time? Oops, completely forgot about that. Well Tilda what a blunder. Oi ah, uh, this is. When she saw Luna Maria stopping to talk to her when she found something interesting while cleaning up, Lillian smiled, looking truly happy, dot always pretending to be stupid like that. What a troublesome best friend I have. Asterus Casterus 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 When Luna Maria San finished telling her story, a small smile appeared on her lips as she spoke. Well, the rest is history. I see, it's a good story. Yes, it was just as a Oi Senpai said, I'm slightly moved. Dot. Luna Maria San's story certainly was a wonderful story of friendship. Just as a Oi Chan and Hina Chan praised it. I was also a little moved. However, I wonder why I have this strange feeling. As if a small bone was stuck in the back of my throat. 
as if an important part of the story was hidden. However, as I kept my silence as I didn't know what it was, Luna Marius Anne spoke. Dot now then, that should be enough for the stories of my past, as I think it's time for me to go back to work. Ah, uh, Mama Sama, I would like you to follow me for a moment, if you don't mind. Eh? You see, when you attended the party before, you said that the collar of your formal wear was a little tight, remember? So, we have made some alterations and would like you to try it on. Dot Ek, that's right. All right. I don't remember saying that. In other words, this was something she said for her to lead me out of this place. A message telling me that if I have something I want to ask, we should go to a different place. Nodding my head in understanding, I notified Aoi Chan and Hina Chan before leaving the room with Luna Maria San. I followed Luna Maria San down the corridor. The corridor of the mansion, which I should be used to walking, now seems unusually quiet. Dot so, Mama Sama, is there something you want to ask me? Dot I suppose, even now. I just can't sort out the reason why in my head but, Luna Maria San, why did you help Lilia San? Oi ah, uh, haven't I mentioned it before? I helped her because I want to help her. That's all there is to it. Is that really all there is to it? Dot have you felt something out of place? Without looking back at me, Luna Maria San asked me a question that seemed to be probing things, and just as I gradually sorted out the discomfort I'm feeling in mind, I continued. In that story you told us earlier. You talked about Lilia San in great detail, but I don't think you've said much about what you yourself was thinking at that time, Luna Maria San. That's why, I feel as if something was out of place. I see. Just that huh? It appears that it wasn't enough for Luna Maria San to stop walking, and just as I was feeling strangely nervous, I continued speaking of my thoughts. No, there's one more thing. I somehow feel that Luna Maria San resembles Alice. Oi ah, oi ah. It's an honor to be told I resemble Phantasmal King Sama. But why is that? Dot it's just a guess. But Luna Maria San. You're actually very smart, aren't you? Dot what an amusing story, that is. Thereupon, Luna Maria San finally stopped walking and turned towards me. Her expression was somewhat joyful, as if she was looking at something she found pleasant. Luna Maria San, you're smart and quick-witted. But you're purposely acting so that it doesn't appear that way. In Alice's words, I think you're playing the role of the clown. Aren't you just overthinking it? I guess so. However, when Luna Maria San teases someone, there certainly are times when you just like to tease them. But I think that most of the time, you have a reason for doing that. Dot please go on. Perhaps, I'm being tested right now. If whether or not I'm the right person she could speak her mind. Just yesterday, we made a pact about my dislike of bell peppers, didn't we? Yes, we did. Dot I'm sure you already knew that I had information about your dislike for bugs, didn't you? Knowing that, you dared to tease me and had me bring that up. Oh my? Even if that were the case, for what reason would I do that? Dot I had been thinking a lot about that time. Feeling embarrassed that I had inconvenienced everyone that I was being childish. I had such thoughts in my mind. At that moment, Luna Maria San appeared, and we made that agreement. As if to put an end to what had been troubling me. Yes, thanks to that incident with Luna Maria San, I was able to put off such thoughts out of my mind to some extent. If it weren't for that, I might have been self-loathing when I was alone in my room. That's a very favorable interpretation, isn't it? Not only that, as even though Luna Maria San often teases Lilia San, the most teasing I've seen you do was when we were still new to this world. Dot. My mind was too filled up with my worries at that time to realize it. But wasn't Lilia San quite nervous at that time? The first irregularity in a thousand years occurred while she was handling the hero summoning, so she must have been feeling tense. Dot that's why, I was teasing my lady. To relieve her from her tension huh? Hearing my story, a teasing grin appeared on Luna Maria San's face. Well. I guess I'll give you an extra 40 points for that. In the first place, don't you think you're thinking too much? I think you're very smart too, Mama Sama, but thinking too much about this and that is a bad habit, you know? You'd end up putting reason on something that doesn't even have a reason on it. I suppose so. Yes, besides, what good would it do me to play the clown? That is, no good. I don't have any cards to present here anymore. Something still feels out of place, but still. As long as Luna Maria San puts it that way. The story ends here. However, if, hypothetically speaking, dot a, if playing the clown would make the one I want to laugh laugh, then perhaps, 
playing the clown may be a happy thing. After telling me that, Luna Maria San turned around and walked away. As I was walking along, somewhat following her, I suddenly heard a gentle voice. Dot that was quite an interesting discussion. I'm not saying this is thanks to that, but for just a bit, how about I tell you another story? Asterisk 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 A year has passed since Lilian changed her name to Lilia and established the Albert Duchy. After overcoming illness guidance and receiving a passing grade, Luna Maria became Lilia's personal maid. The biggest task for such a Luna Maria though. My lady, I think it's time you take a break. I'll brew you some tea. Dot why are you right? I can't be too routed in my work. Is to make the extremely serious Lilia take a break when it's time. Sighing at her best friend and master, who would work forever if left alone, Luna Maria prepared a cup of tea and placed it in front of Lilia. Dot I understand how you feel but there's no point in being impatient. Dot yes. Lilia, who had been distanced from social intercourse after becoming a member of the Night Order, was currently struggling with a number of issues. Although the Albert Duchy owns some land in the royal capital, they don't run their own fiefdom. They earn no income from taxes, and the aid they receive from the country is limited. Therefore, Lilia has been acquiring new sources of income in the form of renting out the land she owns. She also owns several establishments but the largest would be her Flying Dragon Services. However, since Flying Dragon Services is a popular business in Symphonia Kingdom, she has many rivals. Mary, the manager, driver of the company, is also doing her best, but her income wasn't that large in comparison to the size of their business. It sure is difficult, isn't it? In order to attract the public's attention, you have to procure popular dragons, but popular dragons are expensive and difficult to raise. Things just won't always go our way. If the situation remains stable for a year, isn't that enough? No, that won't do. It's still not enough. We need more money to buy a fruit of the world tree. Dot. Lilia's best friend, Sieglind's wounds were quite deep, and although she had employed the services of several renowned recovery magic users, they all shook their heads and gave up. The only means they had left was the fruit of the world tree which is said to heal all wounds, but it was so expensive that even a duke like Lilia couldn't afford it. I see, I understand how you feel. In that case, Lily. Yes, I'll do my B, dash. Let's go on a journey, the two of us, hist. What? Lilia, who was firing herself up, tilted her head at the unexpected suggestion she heard. Well Tilda I actually got tickets for a sightseeing tour in the demon realm. This is just perfect for a breathe there. We can leave the mansion illness summer and Sieg to handle, so we can be rest assured and stretch out our wings. A, eh? N, no, um, why are you suddenly talking about that? It was Luna Maria's plan to give Lilia a break from her tense schedule. She actually wanted to invite Sieglind as well, but after that incident, Lilia and Sieglind were feeling guilty towards each other, and things between them were a little awkward. They would talk to each other in writing when they met, but it was fair to say that they were reserved with each other. Being unable to come up with a solution sure is frustrating. Luna Maria herself was trying to come up with a solution, but it still wasn't working out. In the end, she decided that the relationship between the two of them couldn't be restored until Sieglind's wounds were healed and she just decided to do her best to take care of both of their hearts. Her efforts were quite effective. During the trip, Lilia innocently enjoyed the scenery of the demon realm and even mentioned that she wanted to come back when they left. However, this still didn't solve the fundamental problem. Even as she's feeling a little chagrined, Luna Maria continued to do her best for the sake of her two best friends. Asterisk 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 asterisk. After speaking that much, Luna Maria San looked at me and lightly sighed. Well, that's how I've been struggling with things for four years. When Mama Sama came and easily solved them, Siok regained her voice and her relationship with Lili was restored. My lady's flying dragon services which had many rivals, now even has a high ancient dragon, making it the best in the royal capital both in name and in reality, doubling the income of the duchy, and there's also this and that. This unworthy Luna Maria can't hide how shuddering I am at how out of the ordinary Mama Samo is. Ah ah ah. No, all that happened were just coincidences. Thereupon, Luna Maria stopped walking again, deeply sighing. Dot ha. If it was others who had said it, 
I would have just ignored it, un, I'll say this now, I'm not as smart as Mama Sama thinks. I just wanted to see it. After saying a phrase that doesn't really point out anything, Luna Marius Anne muttered in a small voice. Dot I just wanted to see her smile. On the princess lips who had a smile pasted on her face. I wanted to see a truly happy smile on it. That's all I really wanted. Dot. And even now, that hasn't changed. I just wanted the people important to me to smile. If it's to achieve that, I'll play the role of a clown as much as I can. After saying these words, Luna Marius Anne quietly walked away. As she was departing, she left me a few words in a quiet voice. Dot and those people I want to see smiling, you're also one of them. Kaito san. Luna Maria sans back as she left, speaking in a surprisingly gentle voice as she called me in a way that she doesn't usually do, somehow seemed very large. Asterisk 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 asterisk. I'm currently making a list of people I could invite to accompany me to the Six Kings Festival. I heard that at the Six Kings Festival, those who will accompany the invited guests would need to apply in advance and have a companion badge prepared for them. Since the badge would be the proof of identity for the invited people's companions, we had to decide who we were going to invite some time in advance. Well, there's still over a month to go until the festival, so you can take my time. Besides, if it comes down to it, I can quickly make them for you, so it will be alright even if you forgot to fill up some names. Un, that's very helpful. Speaking of which, how are the preparations for the venue coming along? Well, so-so, I guess. Why the question-like tone? As usual, Alice suddenly appeared and as we exchanged idle chatter, Alice suddenly took out what appeared to be a notepad and spoke. Speaking of which, Kaito-san. You're going to the venue the day before the actual festival? right? Yeah, that's my plan at the moment. The Six Kings Festival will be held for seven days, and it's said that all accommodations for the festival will be provided free of charge. However, the hotels that you can stay at are determined according to the rank of your invitation. Well, even the lowest rank will be able to stay at a regular ultra-luxury hotel. Of course, it's possible for guests to participate only on certain days, and in that case, free transportation will be provided. However, I'd be staying on the top floor of the central tower. I heard that this matter had already been settled, and Kuro and Isis-san had been quite enthusiastic about this matter. And it was making me very anxious. Dot well then, I'm going to have someone guide you around at that time. Kaito-san should also know some of our subordinates. Do you have someone you'd like to guide you? Uh Hilda I see. Our subordinates. From the way Alice spoke. I guess that includes Kuro's family. I certainly am acquainted with some of them. I know Fafna-san, Pandora-san and Lily-san. Even so, a guide. I guess that would be until we reach our inn. Fafna-san is too big. Pandora-san is kinda terrifying. Lily-san would have been perfect both in terms of personality and physique, but being Lily would San's head subordinate, wouldn't she be busy? Above all. I should be mindful about the fact that this would be the first time they would meet with Lilia San. In that case, that leaves Kuro's family. Hey, wait a moment. That's right. There's also that person. Dot how about Caraway San? Fume. Caraway San, the cat eared demon who brought the invitations and explained the Six Kings festival to us. She's already acquainted with Lilia San and the others, and her explanations of the Six Kings festival were detailed and easy to understand so I think she should be able to easily explain it to us. It seemed like she's the perfect person for the job, but for some reason, Alice had a complicated look on her face. Daughter, did I say something wrong? No, it's just that Caraway san She isn't a subordinate of any of the Six Kings, you see. Eh, hey, is that so? Yes, she isn't a subordinate of any of the Six Kings. She also wasn't invited to the Six Kings Festival so she isn't qualified to participate in the first place. It's not like I was thinking all demons would be a subordinate of any of the six kings but, since Caraway san was the one who brought me the invitation, I thought for sure that she was someone's subordinate. She is, well, as Kaito-san knows, the culprit who casted recognition inhibition magic on Kaito-san. Yu Un, she seemed to be very remorseful about the incident and she asked for a chance to somehow make amends. That's why I entrusted her with doing some small chores. However, it's only behind the scenes, and she isn't allowed to participate in the Six Kings Festival. Well, she might be tasked with cleaning or other rod jobs. Dot is. That's so. 
The reason I had her deliver the invitations to Kaito-san and the others was because she volunteered, asking me that she wants to directly apologize to you. It's just a guess but, could it be that Karaway-san's situation isn't good because she casted recognition inhibition magic on me? It can be said that she reaped what she sowed, but as the person concerned, I don't mind about that matter at all anymore because I received her sincere apology and there was no real harm done. As I was in a complicated mood, Alice looked at me for a while. Before she smiled, dot then, I'll send Caraway san to guide you around, okay? Dot is that alright? Rather than asking me that, shouldn't I be asking you, Kaito san, if that's alright? Even though she regrets it, she was someone who tried to kidnap you once you know? And you're someone who actually kidnapped me once. Ahaha. <laughs> Alice's wry smile looks so gentle, that I can see it even through her mask. It was like she already knew what I was going to say. She's already apologized to me, and I don't mind about the matter at all. I mean, it was because of that incident that I met Kuro. I'm rather grateful that she did that instead. Dot I see, Roger that. Well then, I'll go make the arrangements. Un, I'll be counting on you for that. Ugh. Also, if it's possible. Yes, yes. You're asking me to invite her to the Six Kings Festival as Kaito-san's companion, right? I'll make her a badge and give it later. Dot thanks, Alice. No, no, something like this is easy peasy. Well then, Alice seemed to know everything I was thinking, gave me the answer I wanted and disappeared. Un, well, seriously. Alice has been helping me a lot. I guess I'll take her out for a nice meal again soon. Beerage holding. Haranking demon. It's the term that refers to a very small percentage of beings in the demon realm, but unlike peerage holding nobles of the human realm, they don't particularly need to have territories or belong to a specific country. In fact, the term peerage holding, Haranking demon was created by the phantasmal king, No Face and it had spread out around the demon realm. In the demon realm back then, there were only two broad categories of demons. Ordinary demons and high-ranking demons who possessed a certain level of power. Thinking that such a system is inconvenient in managing the information of the demon realm, No Face created the peerages for those who have superior power among the high-ranking demons, and quickly spread it throughout the demon realm with their overwhelming intelligence department. Only No Face and a few of her confidants know the criteria for judging high-ranking demons, while they are appointed by the phantasmal king core. However, for No Face. This naming is just for administrative purposes and to make it easier for them to classify, so there is no appointment ceremony or any sort of award. For those who have been judged by No Face and her confidants to have power above the set standard, the Phantasmal King's subordinates would suddenly appear before them and simply verbally tell them that they have been judged to have this given peerage. However, their peerage rank has become a proof of great power in the craterocratic demon realm and has become a kind of status. It is even said that becoming a peerage holding demon will change your world. Even if you don't try to gather them, demons wanting to be your subordinate will gather around you, and wealth and fame will start coming your way. Therefore, every demon dreams to receive the title of becoming a peerage holding demon one day. However, the people that can obtain the title within the vast number of races that the demon realm, only a handful of them really exist. The Viscount rank demon, Caraway was also one of the chosen few. She was born in a race that wasn't naturally very powerful, but she was born with a talent that was unparalleled in the history of her species. As she grew older, her skills rapidly improved, and eventually, she became the first of her kind to receive a peerage. At that moment, her race extolled her as a hero, and gave her unreserved praise. For Caraway, being called the hero of her race was a source of pride and it became a guiding principle that inspired her to live up to that title. But at the same time, being a peerage holder brought her pleasures as sweet as honey. Many demons wanted to become her subordinates and wealth gathered in her hands. As she rose from the Baron to Viscount, the sweet nectar she received increased even more, and she relished in the peak of happiness. She was indeed a genius. But her natural talents could only get her that far. There is a barrier between Viscount and Count that only an even smaller number of monsters among geniuses can cross, and Caraway could not cross that barrier. Perhaps, she should have just given up there. If only she knew her place and been satisfied with where she was. She would never have lost sight of her initial resolution. However, once she tasted the supreme nectar, 
Her heart yearned for more. She began to think about how much happiness awaited her once she reached Count Trank. She wasn't thinking about standing at the top of the demon realm. She knew that even if she spent her whole life training her abilities to get stronger, she would never be able to reach even the tip of any of the Six King's strength. She just wanted to be as close to it as possible. Ascend to the highest place that she could. What was most ironic was that she was slightly out of reach from Count Trank which meant she could fight even with those who are low count rank. Even though she has that much ability, none of Phantasmal King's subordinates appeared before her, telling her that she has become a count rank. Even though she must have enough ability, she still wasn't certified as a count rank. On the other hand, if she can obtain the fact that will allow her to make the step forward, she would be able to reach it. That's why, she reached out her hand. To him who isn't from this world, the person who would help her make great strides. Filled with selfish desires, she reached out her hand. And she failed. However, she is glad that she failed. Because she failed, she is still able to keep her life. If she had succeeded in kidnapping Kaito, she would have been immediately beheaded by no face for causing chaos in the world. Her vision was so narrowed at that time that she couldn't even notice such things. Dot building things up is difficult, but losing it could only take an instant. Caraway lost everything in that one incident. She was warned by the Six Kings and her reputation within the Six Kings was severely diminished. In a way, it feels as if her sentence is just suspended for later. And the loyalty of her subordinates wasn't high enough for them to want to follow her. She doesn't blame them for that. If the situation were reversed, she would have done the same. That's how absolute of an existence the Six Kings are. All of her subordinates left her and even her own race began to look at her negatively. From the hero of her race, she became the disgrace of her race. The speed at which everything rolled down was so fast that she couldn't help but laugh. At that moment, when she was finally free of her burning desires, she wept profusely and regretted her actions. Where was the hero of her own people, the one who had worked so hard to not shame that title? When did she become such an unsightly fool? However, Regret would not erase the mistakes of the past. She had fallen so far that there was no hope of a second chance, and Caraway herself accepted it. Since the Six Kings had pardoned her, albeit with a warning, no one was criticizing her on the surface, but the sneers and scornful looks never disappeared. It's agonizing. Painful. Unlike the demon Lord Veer, she didn't have the strength to carry all her sins and still keep walking through life. Over and over again. She shed tears of regret for her past and for what she had lost. It was so painful that she wanted to run away, but she couldn't forgive herself for not doing anything to make amends. At least not until she says a few words of apologies. Even if the victim, Kaito, doesn't forgive her. She heard the rumor about the Six Kings Festival, and was allowed to help with it on the condition that she wouldn't be allowed to participate in the main festival. After pleading with them, she was also given the opportunity to apologize to Kaito and with the invitation in hand, she came to visit where he lives. Asterisk 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 After handing over the invitations for the Six Kings Festival, Caraway was cleaning up the grounds where the event would take place. Not being a subordinate of the Six Kings, she was not given any important work to do, only random chores but she continued to do them without a single complaint. She is a celebrity in the demon realm, but what she has is mostly infamy, and she can't help but notice the strange gazes that fall on her. Some of them used to be her subordinates, but now that they've followed another demon, the way they look at her is very cold. As she continues to work in this suffocating atmosphere, a shadow suddenly appears in front of her eyes. Dot stop for a moment. Phantasmal King Sama has a message for you. P Pandora Sama? A message from Phantasmal King Sama. Why yes. W what is it? The one who appeared before her is the Phantasmal King's right hand, Pandora, who is known as the strongest among the Count Ranks. A messenger from the Six Kings came to visit her. It doesn't seem like she's going to talk about something simple. Could it be that she has done something wrong again? The other demons seemed to think so as well, and they looked at Caraway with gazes mixed with contempt. However, the words that came out of Pandora's mouth were something that no one in that area expected. You are to guide Mama Sama at the time of his visit. You can stop cleaning now. From now on, 
Until the day of the festival, you are to memorize information about the festival and the stalls that will be opened. Take your utmost care not to be disrespectful to Mama Sama. Huh? A. Eh? What she said was something really unlikely. It is a known fact to many demons that Kaito is someone important for the Six Kings. As for guiding him, putting aside if it was left to one of the Six Kings' subordinates, it's hard to believe that this task is entrusted to Caraway, someone treated as a sinner. P. Please wait. W. Why is this? Being entrusted to me. You are nominated by Mama Sama himself. You don't have the right to refuse, so just respectfully accept it. A. M. Mama Sama. Appointed. Me. Why? It's true that Kaito told her that he forgave Karaway when she apologized at Lilia's mansion before. However, this was only because Kaito was kind, and that doesn't mean that all grudges disappear. For Karaway, being personally appointed by Kaito was like a bolt out of the blue. However, the shocking development continues. Ah, uh, you are also to receive this. Wow, T this is. The companion badge? W.Y. Mama Sama appointed you as his companion. Make sure you thank him. Dot Y. Caraway couldn't understand Kaito's actions at all. Why is it that he has no resentment towards her? Dot I will now convey Mama Sama's message. Dot Y. Yes. I'm sorry for suddenly asking you to guide us. Also, I'm sorry for making you my companion without asking you first and only telling you after you had already become one. I know it may be brazen of me, but as a friend, I would be happy if Caraway san could enjoy the Six Kings festival as well. If it's not too much trouble, please accept it. End of message. Uh, well then, I will notify you later for the detailed date of his arrival. Make sure you're not late. Why yes. After Pandora told her just what she needed to know before leaving her alone, Caraway's shoulders shook. With tears shedding from her eyes, she carefully wrapped the badge within her hands. Dot calling this foolish me. Your friend. Ah, uh, why did I? Do that to such a noble person. It couldn't be helped if I even get embarrassed of myself. Thank you very much. Mama Sama. Thank you. With a large drop of tears in her eyes, Caraway expresses her gratitude to Kaito who isn't here. At that moment, she hadn't realized it yet. That Kaito's message that day was the salvation that would change her current situation. Yes, as long as Kaito called Caraway his friend, she would be recognized as such. If anyone were to speak ill of her. Of Kaito's friend. That would be an act equivalent to suicide. Kaito's single word became the shield that protected her from the unpleasant gazes. However, it goes without saying. Kaito himself hadn't thought about it, and he just asked Pandora to give her that message in a very normal way. After she realized the influence of Kaito's words, Karaway misunderstood that Kaito did this to protect her. She was so moved that she shed tears to the point that she can't cry anymore secretly pledging her loyalty to Kaito in her heart. But that's a story for another time. The 15th day of the wind month. I thought it would be nice to relax in my room once in a while, so I was currently busy reading in my room. Incidentally, the book I'm currently reading is Eating Tour in its entirety guide, Symphonia Kingdom Tilda Volume, Food Stalls Tilda, written by Kuro. There were apparently several different types of eating tour guides just for Symphonia Kingdom alone, and I'm now reading them in order. Naturally, there are many of these restaurants I don't know about, but it's interesting to read Kuro's subjective impressions and evaluations of them. I also marked the restaurants I wanted to try, thinking of going there to eat next time. While I was thinking about this, a knock resounded at the door of my room. Yes, it's open. Excuse my intrusion. Lunamaria San. When I replied it was okay to come in, the door opened and Lunamaria San came in, pushing a cart with a pot of tea on it. Is she bringing me tea? How rare. My lady got some good tea leaves and is giving them to everyone. Should I brew it for you? Ugh, is that so? Thank you. Then, please. Understood. Lunamaria San, bringing me a cup of tea skillfully brewed tea when I asked her to. Luna Maria San looks like a woman who can do things when she's working. The troubling part is when she becomes mischievous, she will instantly become a useless maid. Well, even if that's so, I can rely on her in times of need, and she's serious when it comes to work, so she doesn't only have bad qualities. Here you go. Thank you. Un it's delicious. I'm glad to hear that you liked it. It seems like Mama Sama is in the middle of ready. Eh? Un. After smiling when I told her how I felt about the tea, Luna Maria San opened her mouth to leisurely chat with me. 
but she stiffened when she saw the book on the table. Mimiya Mama Sama? CCC could that be? Underworld King Sama's eating tour in its entirety guide? Eh? Yes, it is. You knew about it? Of course I knew about it. You were. Luna Marius Anne vigorously approached. Etel to come to think of it. Luna Marius Anne was Kuro's fanatic. T this is the first time I've seen the real thing. S so this is the legendary. Dot H Hugh. As a seven digit member of the prestigious Underworld King Adoration Society, I wanted to see it at least once too. T there are that many people in the Underworld King Adoration Society huh? Underworld King Adoration Society. What's that? Some kind of fan club. Luna Marius Anne said that she's a seven digit member. So does that mean there are at least a million members? Seriously? I mean, Luna Marius Anne's eyes are bloodshot and she's kinda scaring me. Dot um, would you like to read it? Would it be alright? Hi uh, why yes, which volume do you want? Which volume? M. Mama Sama, by any chance, you possess several books of the eating tour in its entirety guide? R. Yes. I have all the volumes. All volumes? When Cura gave me these books, she said that it was the complete set so I think it probably is the entire set. When I told Luna Maria San about it, her eyes widened. Dot I, I never expected that you would have all the volumes. As expected of Mama Sama. Rumor has it that only the president has all the volumes, and even though I heard of its existence during the final interview. Final interview? Eh? Does that mean you need some kind of exam to join that Underworld King Adoration Association? Yes, there are three exams, written exam, suitability inspection, and the practical exam, and after these tests are three sets of interviews. What the heck is that? That's scary. What kind of organization is this Underworld King Adoration Association? Written exam? Practical exam? What the heck is that for? Dot incidentally, just for reference. What things are in that exam? The written exam consists of 500 questions randomly chosen from several categories, including general education and magic. However, there would be 100 of these questions about me ideology every year. Dot H ha, huh, I see. What the heck are those questions? Feels like something only a certain perfect maid would be able to answer. No, let's not think too deeply about this. They're probably in a world that I don't need to know about. W well, putting that aside. M Mama Sama? W would it really be alright for me to read it? Yes. Kuro said I'm free to do what I want to do with them. Should I lend you some of the volumes? Dot Mama Sama, you were my messiah all along. I'm not. Luna Maria San's tension was starting to get strange, so I handed her one volume of the eating tour in its entirety guide to shut her up. Thereupon, Luna Maria San immediately pounced on it. Her eyes are scary. Those aren't the eyes of someone reading the book. They're definitely the eyes of someone who was about to head towards a decisive battle. Dot Eich. How wonderful. How sublime. Dot. Each of her reactions are too exaggerated. Well, I guess that's how valuable the book is to Luna Maria San. In fact, I might look at it as some kind of restaurant report book. But for fanatics, it might as well be the Bible huh? Already forgetting her original purpose for coming here, Luna Maria San sat down on the sofa, reading the book. Um. Aren't you working right now? No, let's not voice out Atsukami here. It kinda feels scary. Looking at Luna Maria San, I let out a small sigh before taking out cookies from my magic box. Dot I have cookies as tea cakes. Luna Maria San, would you like to have some? Thank you, Kaito San. I'm really glad. Dot un uh somehow, I think something strange just now. Luna Maria San's voice just now, it wasn't her usual cool voice as her voice sounded innocent like a child. It isn't as if she did it on purpose either. It's as if she had accidentally let her true nature come out. Dot. Dot. Luna Maria San's face then began to turn pale as she looked at me, sweat dripping down her forehead. A very awkward silence passed between us while I stayed silent, unable to say anything. After a while, Luna Maria San quickly stands up still holding the book. Her face also seemed to be dyed red. Dot M Mama Sama, P please excuse my impudence, but may I borrow this book? R, yes, you can borrow it. T thank you, I'll be excusing myself then. A, ah, as soon as I nodded, Luna Maria San walked out of the room at great speed. Er, uh, what just happened? Could it be that Luna Maria San was feeling shy. I somehow feel like I've seen something very unusual. A few hours after Luna Maria San left the room, I spent my time leisurely reading. But Luna Maria San, who should have ran away, 
came back. Er, Luna Maria San. Mama Sama, here. What is this? When Luna Maria San came back, she handed me something wrapped in a palm sized wrapper. It's slightly warm and faintly smells sweet. Are these sweets? As I tilted my head to the side, not knowing why she handed it to me, Luna Maria San averted her gaze towards the right, speaking with an air of calmness. Dot please think of it as some kind of hush money. Hush money? Please don't tell anyone what happened earlier. Dot all right. Thank you. Now then, I'll be excusing myself. I plan to calmly talk with Luna Maria San, but seeing the firm look on her eyes, a lot of things were conveyed. Even so, this package, pink paper and tied with a frilly ribbon. It feels like Luna Maria San has quite the cute taste. I felt as if I've seen a side of Luna Maria San, which I don't usually see making a small smile naturally appear in my lips. Opening the package I received, I found a variety of colorful marshmallows inside. Dot as I thought, it was really something cute. That's one side of her that I didn't expect. I was given homemade looking marshmallows. But whether it's the wrapping paper or the ribbon Luna Maria San is quite feminine. Asterisk 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 it was late at night at Duchess Albert's mansion. Illness was walking with a regular stride through the corridor of the mansion, which boasts of a considerable size. She usually has more than ten times the workload of other maids, but that's still too few of a job. For the extremely excellent illness, she is trusted not only by Lilia, the head of the household, but also by Kaito, who entrusted her with the care of Belfried and Lindworm when he's away. Being a demon, she doesn't require sleep. So she also goes around the mansion at nights like today, making her rounds. Walking through the corridors of the mansion, Illness was thinking of starting preparations for breakfast. When she stopped walking, after a few moments of silence, she opened the door to a nearby empty room, went inside, locked it securely and spoke. Am I to receive a new monsieur? Just after Illness announced this, the view at a part of the room distorted and her boss, Alice, appeared. No, it's not about a mission. I just want to consult something with you for a bit. Consult you alt, is I it? Hearing Alice's words, Illness curiously tilted her head. Having such a reaction is normal though, as this would be the first time she had received a consultation from Alice. Needless to say, Alice is abnormally smart. So smart that while Illness was in the middle of trying to read a person's next step, Alice could already foresee a hundred or two possibilities. She couldn't think of anything that such an Alice would consult with her. It's not yet a certainty that this will be the case. Currently, I'd say that there would be a 20% chance that such a future would happen. Connective materials have been starting to come together, but such an event won't occur unless the spark appears. Dot my apology is, but I don't think there's anything I could help with that. If it was an order or a mission, I will follow it. But I don't think I'll be able to help in a consultation. Thinking that she probably wouldn't be able to help Alice, Alness took a deep bow, turned away and was about to leave the room. Even if I say this is related to Kaito-san. However, her feet came to a complete stop at Alice's words. Pulling away her hand that was about to touch the doorknob, she slowly turned towards Alice. Would it be I'll react if I ask for the details? Yes, of course, for illness. There's only one thing in this world that takes precedence over everything else. Hearing that this matter concerns Kaito, whom she loved dearly, the option of not listening to Alice disappeared in illness mind. As I said before, it was still not definite. But the possibility has been created. The possibility that Kaito-san would get involved with this world's biggest taboo. Dot that matter that the six kings and the supreme gods won't intervene at all? That's right. Just suddenly hearing that. That sounds unbelievable e, -e, 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 -e. I don't think it's possible e, -e, -e for Kaito-sama alone to reach that triuluth. The contents of Alice's statement made illness look a little quizzical. Yes, it normally would have been impossible. However, Kaito-san had this tendency to attract trouble. I mean, he's already met the subject in question. Dot. Though I say that, as I mentioned before, the probability of such an event happening is about 20%. Conversely speaking though. Kaito-san has a 1 in 5 chance of reaching it. The great incident that became the turning point of this world. And the truth hidden behind it. Hearing the words Alice quietly spoke, 
illness closed her eyes and thought. After a short pause, she slowly opened her eyes. It will definitely become a battle e e e. That's highly possible. I can't see a possibility where Kaito-san would know that truth and not act on it. However, this is just troublesome. Finding an ally on Kaito-san's side in this matter, that is, indeed, that matter is a little complicated. Shlta Samoa, you also couldn't carelessly make a move in this matter, right? Well, if it really comes to that point that it can't be helped anymore, I will take Kaito-san's side. Me moving might be some kind of defeat for Kaito-san though. Alice and Illness both had a common understanding that they would take action if Kaito knew the hidden truth of that matter. They will try to somehow solve it. After all, that matter is something greatly related to Kuramuina. Why are you telling me Thais? Suppose that when this prediction becomes reality, Kaito-san would need to challenge it with the best members he could assemble. In that case, however, a huge wall would stand in front of Kaito-san's group. The wall called the Portcullis Giant. Soldier, Funf. Frankly speaking, an average opponent wouldn't be able to win against Funf-san. She is, without a doubt, one of the most powerful among the count ranks. I see. E -e, that's why you called for me. E -e. Yes, fortunately, most of my executives, the ten demons, other than Pandora, had their names unknown to the public. Even if you were to show up to save Kaito-san, no one will probably realize that you are Pandemonium. Unlike the other members of the Six Kings subordinates, Alice's subordinates often infiltrate different places. That's why, even though it's known to the public that she had a large amount of subordinates, detailed information about them is unknown. The same is true for the Ten Demons, as even though their names were very well known, but few people have seen them. That's why illness can be involved in this taboo without anyone connecting her with the six kings. I understood and I will fact. Can you win? I intend to weigh in. It's still only a possibility. And at this point, it's more likely that it won't happen. However, the pieces were definitely coming together, so they should be prepared. You certainly are one of the strongest count ranks in the world, I have no doubt about that. However, you are born with a low amount of magic power. Even if you had trained your body until you acquired the strength of a peak count rank, that doesn't change the fact that your magic power is inferior to that of mid count ranks. In a high dimensional battle, the difference in the amount of magic power is directly related to the difference in physical ability. You are the type who compensates that with your techniques. No, I know I shouldn't ask this since I'm the one who brought this up to you. But can you break her reaches? I intend to use Essia. Hey, you're going to bring out your trump card, huh? That secret technique that has never been used for more than 15,000 years since its creation. Ye -e 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 I think I probably meet the requirements new. No. Alice looked a little surprised when Illness brought up the word Ezra. The Ezra is the most powerful secret technique that Illness possesses, a technique that she, who has a handicap in terms of magic power, has developed in order to smash through the superior status of others. Incidentally, how many years worth are you going to use? I suppose 5000 years would be my limit. Any more than that and my body will break to 5000 years huh? Don't you think it would be a waste? If you use that power three times, the next time you can use that will be 5000 years from now, right? In response to Alice's words of confirmation, Alness softly smiled. It will never be a waste. My body, my heart, my su my everything is devoted to Kaito Sama. If it's to secure the future and you at Kaito Sama were a ants, I will gladly offer him my 5000 yees. Fire you, you tilde Kaito San sure is loved, huh? In that case, can I leave this to you? Yes, Eza, my yees, I will use them if it's necessary. My, oh my, I guess that would be the first time, even for me, to see you fighting seriously. Well then. As soon as that possibility becomes certain, I'll call on you again. Understood. Alice disappeared, leaving only illness in the dimly lit room. After illness stared at her palm for a bit, she lightly flicked her fingers. Thereupon, ten knives appeared around her and after flying around the room by themselves at a tremendous speed, all of the knives simultaneously attacked her. After illness made one turn to the side, all the flying knives were in her hand. Dot off by about three millimeters. Huuuuu. It's been peaceful lately, so my battle CEEINS may have been a bit duuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuu
illness quietly spoke in the empty room. Using Ezra at a time like this makes me a little nervous. I guess I'll contact Osma Samo and get myself some training. As she muttered this, illness turned her attention back to the knives in her hand and smiled, reminiscing about the past and about how the beginnings of her and her master also started with knives. Asterisk 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 It was about 19,000 years ago. It was a time when order was beginning to be established in the demon realm through Alice's efforts. Illness was on a leisurely journey around the various regions of the demon realm. There was no particular reason why she decided to do so. If really she had to say one, it was for self-improvement. Illness is a unique species of demon, having no parents or siblings. She has no purpose, no dreams of becoming something. She was born with the power to manipulate diseases, but she had no idea for what purpose she was to use it. Feeling empty, she just vaguely tried to master the martial arts she had created. It wasn't as if she felt the need to do that though. While traveling and helping people in various places, she continued to do what she thought was generally right. In a sense, she was stoic even to herself, and although she was born with little magic power, it was at least conspicuously growing, and before long, even in the vast demon realm, she had become a strong person who could be counted among the top. One day, as she continued her journey, a turning point arrived. While she was walking through the most enormous forest in the demon realm, she suddenly felt a presence nearby. This I is. I think it's safe to say OA that they're intentionally showing their pre -C -E 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 A presence that is always emitted from a certain direction and with a certain intensity. They're trying to beckon me towards the e -E -E She didn't look in the direction of the presence she felt and continued walking as if she didn't notice them, but there was a bead of sweat trickling down her forehead. They got me e -E -E. I can feel the direction of that pre -C -E 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 but I can't detect the suuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuu
This is that so-called being scouted. I still need more people to perfect the order in the demon realm. You have such splendid strength. I promise I'll welcome you as an executive, you know. Dot who are you? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Illness had no idea who Shlatia was. Although she was talking about something large scale like the Order of the Demon Realm, she was concerned that such a powerful person wasn't well known in the Demon Realm and unknown to Illness. Dot in response to Illness' question, with a smile still on her face, Shlatia spoke. For those who don't know me, I am known as the Phantasmal King. No face! Exclamation mark You're one of those six Kiayings I've heard so much about these days. Hugh, I see. E -e -e. Just from the fact you call yourselves Kiayings, I can tell you're tremendous Kiayings. So, uh, what does King Samoa want me to do? Uh, uh, uh. Well, you'd definitely be curious about that, huh? Let's see. Well then, let me explain to you what the job is and how your reception will be. After saying this, Shlatia began giving her a detailed explanation and after she finished listening, Illness thought for a moment before speaking. Dot I understand the gist of things. I also have no objections with the conditions, so I will be your subordinate. A prompt decision, huh? I see, I see. Seems like it's another distorted one, huh? Ye -e 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 no, it's nothing. Well then, from today on, you will be working under me as an executive. When acting as my subordinate, you are to call yourself with a code name. Information is a useful weapon and deception is an essential tool. You are, let's see. You are to call yourself pandemonium. Understood, Shaltir Samoa. Very well, you are free to do as you please until further notice. Well then, I look forward to working with you in the future, pandemonium. In response to Shaltir's words, who called her by her code name, Illness responded with a deep bow. Just like that, pandemonium, which was later known as the Doomsday Invoking Plague has become Shaltir's subordinate. Asterisk 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 Since becoming Shaltir's subordinate, illness, pandemonium has been obedient to her master. She does her job perfectly and reports regularly. Having no purpose or goal, it was very easy for her to follow someone else's orders. She was the only decent among the Phantasmal King's executives, the ten demons filled with people with strong peculiarities. Yes, on the surface, that is. Dot how should I say this? You have some really interesting distortion, don't you? What do you mean Ian? You also said something like that when we first met, right? Hearing the words Shaltir said at once point, illness tilted her head in sincere curiosity. Lacking greed. Those words certainly sound nice to the ears, but when it's reaching your level, you could say empty would be a more apartment description. Empty. Ye, you desire for nothing. You want nothing from anyone. Your way of being, your everything, all of it was completely on your own. Therefore, you act based on the standard of what is right that exists in you. The principle of your actions exists only in yourself. I mean, even towards me, you don't hold any respect or any other feelings either. Right? You only do what you do because you think it's right to obey your master's orders. Dot. Yes, Pandemonium only sees herself. She judges her surroundings through her own measure. In a sense, it's the ultimate self-centeredness of thought. That was how distorted of a person Pandemonium is. She basically treats everyone kindly. Because she thinks treating others kindly is right. She doesn't hesitate to deal with her most closest people as long as Shaltir orders her to do so because she thinks that was what it means to be a master and subordinate. She doesn't have any purpose or goal, because she doesn't think of them as necessary. She doesn't understand the feeling of happiness, because happiness is something you have to seek to acquire. You desire nothing from no one. You only give to others, through your own basis, your own sense of value, acting as if it's the most obvious thing in the world, you give to others. That devotion is definitely your true nature. But devotion without an object of devotion is just a distortion. Her true nature is devotion that asks nothing in return. However, the target of her devotion does not exist. She has nothing. As Shaltir had said, she really was empty. Illness herself understood that. However, she doesn't see the need to change. I see. E -e -e. That's very interesting. And even now, you don't think what I'm telling you is necessary. The act of others giving you anything in itself is something you don't desire. It's something you can't comprehend. Dot. Dot I hope you find them someday. Someone you could offer your devotion. I suppose. If that happy e -e ends, I might be able to understand what it is that you're saying. Although she gave Shaltir such an answer for the time being, 
Pandemonium had concluded through her own basis that such a day would never come true. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Nearly 20,000 years had passed since she encountered Shantia, but Pandemonium remained empty. Even though she remained unchanged, the world and the current state of things changed. Order has been created in the demon realm, and the terms Six Kings and Peerage rankings became common knowledge and the Treaty of Friendship was signed between the three realms. Pandemonium's station had changed, as she became the chief information manager of the Symphonia Kingdom, and she began working as a maid at the royal castle under her real name, Illness, which she had never used since the day she met Shiltia. However, her heart has not changed. She continues to live a life devoted that asks nothing in return. Illness, listen to me. I won second place in the martial arts competition. Well. I lost to Sayag in the finals. But I will definitely win the next one. When the princess, Lillian, who she has taken care of since she was a child, told her so, she responded with an answer that follows through her standard. Praising a person who did her best with a smile is right. Giving such a response doesn't satisfy illness, but it does satisfy Lillian. In that case, such a response is right. Please, illness. I know how to behave as a duchess to a certain extent. But I have no idea how to teach servants or anything like that. Most of the people who said they'd follow me are former knights, and there's no one else who understands what it's like being a maid. Seeing Lillian asking this to her while rubbing her head against the ground, Illness thought that if she was asking so desperately, considering her request would be right. And thus, she confirmed this with her master, Shiltia. She thinks that making a decision on her own wasn't right. Whether Shaltir accepts having relocated or not doesn't matter to her. She would just continue to walk the path indicated by others, going according to her standards. It was four years later that a turning point came to such an empty, desireless illness. Asterisk 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 asterisk. Gathering all the servants, the head of the mansion, Lillian. Now Lilia. Strongly declared, the first male guest in the mansion is a valued guest for Lilia, and she does not allow any harm to come his way. However, her words didn't reach illnesses. She just kept her gaze at the male guest. The other worlder named Marmakito. Her eyes, which were always unfocused, focused on him, staring at him as if she were devouring his being. Seeing a being she felt was beautiful for the first time in her life. Kaito. A certain emotion welled up in her heart. I want to see it. Not that anxious expression on his fuiris, but a smile. I want to see him smile. I want to see him with a happy expression on his fuiris. After having devoted herself to others for a long time, it was the first time she had desired something. She wanted him to be happy, she didn't want him to have such a sad expression on his face. She desired for Kaito's happiness. It brought about a dramatic change to illness. Wanting to serve Kaito, she took it upon herself to be his personal maid. She worked behind the scenes to help him adjust to the mansion as quickly as possible. And, pandemonium, here is your new assignment. Gather as much information as possible about the other world residing in the mansion, Mama Kaito, and report to me with as much detail as possible. I refuse your use. Dot what did you say? As I recall, Shaltir Sama had told me this back the eeen. That I have there, freedom to disobey you. If that's the case. I will use such freedom right he, 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 he. If she were to be honest, Shaltir was a little surprised by those words. After all, Illness, who had never once complained or even looked displeased since she became her subordinate, clearly refused the mission given to her. She was too obedient of a person. But now, she could clearly feel her strong intent to reject her command. Dot do you mind if I ask the reason why? I don't have any particular reason. It's just that I am now putting priority on Kaito Sama over Shaltir Sama. Disrespectful it may be. From now on, my actions will now prioritize Kaito Sama. Dot I see, you found him. The one you dedicate your devotion to. Yeeees. Seeing illness decisively answering her, a small smile appeared on Shaltir's lips. Dot I see. It can't be helped then. I will just prepare other means. What will be my punish me e e e e not There's none of that. You were justly exercising the rights I gave you, so I have no reason to condemn you. I will only tell you one thing. Congratulations. After saying that she wouldn't punish illness for disobeying her instructions and congratulating her, Shaltir lightly waved her hand and disappeared. As she watched Shaltir left, 
Ilna simply gave her a deep bow. Asterisk 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 asterisk. After feeling nostalgic for a few moments, she left the room and started walking down the moonlit corridor again. In the silence, Ilnas continued to walk, feeling as if she is the only one in the mansion at the moment. When she arrived in front of one of the rooms, she stopped and taking the master key of the mansion out of her pocket, she unlocked the room. Opening the door quietly so as not to make any noise, she then went inside. She was in the room given to Kaito, and on the bed, Kaito was sleeping with a regular breathing. Approaching the bed where Kaito was sleeping, Alnus gently fixed the slightly disheveled covers on his body. She then just lovingly looked at Kaito's sleeping face. My apology is for coming so late at night. I just suddenly wanted to see your full heiress. This is troubling. Before I knew it, I have become greedy. After gently and tenderly stroking Kaito's hair, Illness held her hair in one hand and slowly brought her face close to Kaito's. Thereupon, she gave him a kiss, just a slight touch of her lips on his cheek before she softly murmured, I dearly love you ooh, ooh, ooh. even now in the future ooh, yeah, always and for ever. Ee, 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 ee. Pulling her face away, Illness patted Kaito's head once more, and went to the door to leave the room. As she put her hand on the doorknob, she turned around and softly spoke, I ooh, 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 that the future you tread up ooh, 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 will always be filled with happiness. Leaving behind her wish for Kaito's happiness, Illness left Kaito's room and walked down the hallways three times. She looked at the moon shining outside the window and smiled. Kaito Samoa, you have changed my world. You filled up this empty me. -e 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 -e. That's why I, I want to devote myself to you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm really glad to have met you. Ooh, ooh. I will definitely open up the path for you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The path towards your happy future. Ooh, ooh. Thinking of what Alice had told her, Alnus quietly clenched her fists, vowing that she would definitely help Kaito. Who could have foreseen such a thing happening? even in their dreams. Making use of the hero summoning to summon other worlders has already become common knowledge in the world. It's because such a thing has become a matter of course, because everyone has become familiar with such a thing. That no one had questioned it. No, perhaps. They had been manipulated by someone so that they don't question it. The hero summoning is a tremendous technique that transcends the barriers between worlds, allowing the user to call people from another world. However, such a tremendous technique. Who is it that created it? The first summoning took place a thousand years ago in the human realm. However, were the humans of that time capable of creating such a technique? Even though a thousand years has passed and no one has been able to reproduce the same technique. That being the case, the only person who could have created the magic circle for hero summoning would have been the creator god, Shalavernal. However, why is it that this god created this magic circle? To save humanity. That's not possible. If that's what she had wanted, the events of that time could have been easily solved by Shallow Vernal wielding the faintest of her omnipotent magic power. That god is also the kind of being who cares about the rift between the demon realm and the human realm. No, rather than that. It may be that all premises were mistaken. Since when has the magic circle for the hero summoning existed in the human realm? Why did Shallow Vernal create the human realm, which did not exist 20,000 years ago, and why did she create the humans living there? Shallow Vernal sometimes referred to a certain being as singularity. Upon her investigation, Alice, the phantasmal king, considered that Mamakaito was summoned by Kuramuina's magic power because he had the qualities to fulfill Kuramuina's wishes. She definitely was not mistaken. With her exceptional intellect, she had seen through the definite truth. However, the truth isn't always one and the same. Was the being named Mamakaito really sought only by Kuramuina? Why was Mamakaito chosen? This matter could have been simply ended by the words it was but a coincidence. However, the truth is, if you look at the situation differently, you will find another answer. What if Mama Kaito wasn't accidentally summoned to this world because of Kuramuina's interference with the summoning magic circle? What if Mama Kaito isn't only the singularity for Kuramuina, but a singularity for someone else as well? Having this in mind, the colors of the truth start changing. Perhaps, he may be a being sought by someone who could see into the future. If that were the case, wouldn't the premises change? What if the future that the being sought? A future where she is together with her singularity, Mama Kaito, has been unintentionally changed by another being. What if, because of this being's special characteristic of being able to nullify Shallow Vernal's power, 
she had distorted the wheels that were set in motion and advanced the pointer to a future that wasn't meant to be. Wouldn't that be tantamount to stealing what she desired for this god? Why? How did this happen? The god is shaken. Dark emotions filled her heart, emotions that she still can't fully express. She thought of the future that will never come. The gears of time had started to move askew. The singularity has already appeared in this world. There may no longer be any point in discussing who really was the beginning. And yet, the god still wailed. Even as her expression and voice remained the same, she still cried out in her heart. Seeking what she had lost, the destruction god of the apocalypse, Shallow Vernal, unnoticed by anyone has now begun to move. Volume 8 End For picking up the 8th volume of I was caught up in a hero summoning, but that world is at peace, thank you very much. This volume raised a number of flags for later. Kaito, Illness, Funf. And the two people at the center of the biggest taboo in the world. Furthermore, the last boss, who had been showing signs of turbulence from time to time, finally made her move, bringing about a lot of foreshadowing. Well. To go into the details of the foreshadowing here would be a spoiler, so let's talk about the other parts of the story. I especially want to focus on the Six Kings Festival, which will play a major role in the future. It's a very big event. There's an inside story about it. Actually, the Six Kings Festival in the web novel is held during the Heaven Month. So, why is it held in the Fire Month in the Light Novel? It's solely due to me. The author's fault. In preparation for when it was to be turned into the light novel, I added a lot of things to the web novel, and as a result of revising this and that, and spending an extravagant number of days, there wasn't enough time to break down the rest of the events. If we had proceeded with the schedule according to the web novel, Kaito Khan would have to digest events on a really overcrowded schedule, so I went with the somewhat forceful choice and changed it to the fire month. Actually, not just in that festival, but one volume earlier. There's also the first Princess Emily's birthday party. In the web novel, at that point in time, Kaito and Seag had already become lovers, and that event was the start of Lilia's arc. The time where Lilia realized her love for Kaito. However, due to the number of days I could fill in the light novel, I couldn't finish Seag's arc in time, and I was quite torn between doing Lilia's arc first or having Seag's arc as scheduled. As a result, Picking the option that's easier for me, rather than saying that it would be better having it later, even though I myself know that I'll have a hard time when Lilia's arc begins in the next volume, I was actually just putting things for later. Regulating the number of days to your scheduled plans sure is difficult, isn't it? Also, I have nonchalantly mentioned it. But yes, the next volume will be Lilia's arc. In fact, Lilia is the first heroine that Kaito met in the series. If we include her appearance, personality and how she was like in the previous chapters, I feel that she has enough potential to be the main heroine. Also, she's the precious human heroine. At the time I am writing this afterward, the number of lovers Kaito Khan had in the web novel has increased to seven. If you think about it, Lilia is his only human lover. It's very strange that a human heroine is so rare, but I hope you will look forward to the continuation of the story. T slash N. The human described here is the species, not the overall race of all humanoids living in the human realm. Thank you very much for reading to the end. I'm looking forward to seeing you again in the next volume. Today, just as usual, in the waiting room. Or rather, in Sirius Senpai's room. Sirius Senpai was reading the eighth volume of I Was Caught Up in a Hero Summoning, but that world is at peace. Un well, there definitely is some flirting, but it seems like some serious scenes have finally begun appearing like the last boss starting to get serious. This was a pretty good read, volume 8, I mean. After placing the book she had finished reading on the table, Sirius Senpai smiled as she brought the cup of chalky milk to her lips. Question mark is also not here today, so the atmosphere in this place is great. Ugh, I could feel it. The current is coming. The serious big wave is. Hey you Matilda. Dot. As question mark was busy preparing her role in the next volume, Sirius Senpai was enjoying the peace and quiet that she hadn't had in a long time, but sadly, her peace did not last long. Dot what are you doing here? Main heroine, lol. Ah, you asking for a beating? I am sorry. What appeared was a girl with a nameplate with Under King written in front of her chest. A girl who often appears in the main story. Dot also, you're making a mistake here. The me right now is a being whose identity is unknown. Under King. If you want to hide your identity, 
Couldn't you try a little harder? Don't try basing your identity in a nameplate you're wearing. Moreover, isn't that nameplate you're wearing is totally exposing your identity? Well, well, putting that aside. I brought you some provisions Tilda. Serious Senpai, quickly unleashing her sharp Tsukumi slashes, was lightly brushed off by Under King as she took out a large paper bag. Un provisions. What did you bring? Baby Castellas. I've got more than enough. I've already got more than enough. Heck. The number of baby castellas in this room is increasing with each passing volume. What the heck is going on? It was a result that was, in a sense, quite predictable, but what Under King brought were baby castellas. Incidentally, there were still piles and piles of them in this room. Moreover, each and every one of them would either be too strange or have bizarre flavors. Seriously, why the heck? Ugh, those baby castellas. Aren't they my failed creations? How did they end up here? It's all you're doing? Eh no, I'm not the one bringing them here though. I properly asked Shaltia to get rid of them. They probably just tumbled around and ended up in this place. Like hell they just happened to tumble their way here. They're definitely brought by that beastard here. Unexpectedly finding out the culprit as to why more baby castellas were popping out in the room. Serious senpai shouted towards the absent question mark after gazing at such a serious senpai with a smile on her face, under king spoke. Dot speaking of which, I brought you some provisions from Kaito Kun to Tilda. Dot I have a bad feeling about that. Different assortments of instant coffee. And some kind of spicy snacks? Kaito sama. I'm sorry for being so cheeky here in the back covers. I should have known you're my only ally. Serious senpai hates sweet food and loves spicy food. When it comes to beverages, she loves black coffee the most. Thus, for serious senpai, these provisions were a blessing from heaven. As serious senpai, overcome with emotion, expressed her gratitude while seemingly praying towards Kaito. After a few moments, she looked as if she noticed something. Dot wait a freaking seconds. Don't tell me, that flag king. He's planning to reach his hands on me even when I'm here in the back covers. H how terrifying. However, frustrating it may be, I can feel my affection meters rising. Gyunanu, DMN it, Kaito. While looking at serious senpai, whose expression changes after a few moments, under king tilted her head and muttered to herself. Dot for the time being. I guess I can tell him that she's happy with it, right?